Won't be easy, given our man's personality. The observation came from Hardcastle. How so? Koltrov is a front-foot guy. Brash. Leads from the front. Likes to put himself about. Share the dangers with his men. Meet the troops, shake hands, tell the boys what a good job they're doing while mortars splash down in the background. You get the picture. His withering tone and the disapproving look on his face made it clear that Hardcastle took a dim view of senior officers swaggering about on the front line, probably felt they should be safely ensconced behind a desk at HQ, at risk of nothing worse than paper cuts and bad coffee. If he's putting himself at risk, why doesn't Keeve tell him to rein it in? They can't, Smallwood said. Voloshin has gone underground since the assassination attempt, he won't be doing any more media appearances or public speeches until they flush out the traitors, which means that Koltrov has got to pick up the slack. Politically, they need him out there, fronting it up. It would be a bad look for them if the two most important national figures vanished from public view at the same time. Hardcastle sneered. Koltrov would be out there regardless. The man's a bloody narcissist. Treats the war as one big ego trip trying to make a name for himself, get himself killed unless someone knocks some sense into his head. Smallwood said, You'll be operating as a deniable asset. That means you must remain invisible to the cameras whenever the general makes one of his visits to the front. For that reason, you'll be wearing the same uniforms and carrying the same weaponry as the Ukrainians. All of you will wear face masks whenever you're in public. Hardcastle said, we don't want to flag your involvement to the Russians. That would be very bad for us. For you. How long's the posting? Eighteen months, but it may be longer, depending on the threat to Koltrov and your assessment of his BG team in the field. Hardcastle leaned forward and said, Frankly, Geordie, the longer you're out of my camp, the better. You've been nothing but trouble for this regiment from the moment I got here. You're arsenic. Carter stared at him with gritted teeth. He stayed silent. Don't rise to the bit. What's the itinerary? he asked. Smallwood said. You'll leave first thing tomorrow, flying from Bristol. Wheels up at six o'clock in the morning, landing at Zhezhov in southeast Poland, a hundred kilometres from the border with Ukraine. That's as close as we can get you under the circumstances. Ukraine is currently under martial law. Airspace is closed to civilian traffic. Tickets and travel authorization have already been sorted. One of the Ukrainians from the diplomatic corps will meet you airside and escort you through immigration, so you shouldn't have any problems getting through. Couple of guys from the A-Squadron team will pick you up at the airport. Who? Scott Logan and Billy McVeigh. Billy is a recent transfer from B-Squadron. Who's the fourth guy? Patrick Webb. Carter rubbed his chin and thought. Logan? Webb? Good lads. Plenty of combat experience. Had their faults, but they were steady and honest pros. On the level. At least I won't have to worry about getting stabbed in the back. McVeigh, he knew less about. One of the new faces around camp. Past selection in the spring. Mancunian kid from a rough background. Decades ago, the veterans in each troop had been in the habit of intimidating the crows. The onus had been on the younger guys to prove themselves, but times had changed. The demands on the regiment had increased threefold. The new guys were getting badged and going straight into operations. They didn't take shit from the older lads. Not any more. How many Ukrainians? Carter asked, on the team. Six, Smallwood replied. Handpicked men from the SF units, so they should be capable. I should fucking hope so. After all, we trained them. Quite. Where's the general staying? At Novichanka Air Base, outside Kiev. Separate accommodation for you and the rest of the team. The other guys will brief you fully on the general's itinerary once you arrive in country. They'll introduce you to the man himself, too. Another thing, he added. You'll be travelling data black, which means you won't be travelling with any personal phones, tablets, laptops, anything that could potentially flag up your whereabouts to the Russians. Security protocols? Hardcastle wrinkled his nose, as if he'd detected an evil smell. All this business with the Russians, I'm afraid.
Carter stared at the two officers and waited for an explanation. Smallwood said, We believe Kremlin spooks are scanning arrivals at all the main airports in Poland, mining the data of everyone who passes through, then using it to track phone signatures in Ukraine, allows them to identify SAS operators. This is a serious issue, Hardcastle said. Good men have gotten themselves killed because they got sloppy. Carter said, If I'm travelling without any devices, it'll look suspicious. I'll stand out like a teetotaler at Oktoberfest. We've already thought of that, said Smallwood. We'll provide you with a clean phone and laptop for the first leg of your journey. Dispose of them once you're across the border. You'll be issued with a new phone with a local SIM card in Ukraine. What about hardware? Uniform? Same deal. That will all be sorted out when you reach the base at Novichanka. Hardcastle slapped his palms on the armrests and started to lever himself out of his chair. Now, I think that's covered the basics, unless you have any questions. Nor, boss, he replied quietly. Good. The CO raised himself to his feet. This should go without saying, but don't fuck this one up. Don't you bloody dare, because if you do, God help me, I'll ruin you. I'll make fucking sure of it. Chapter 12 Carter dumped his Volvo in the Credenhill Camp car park at two o'clock the next morning and transferred his holdall to the boot of a waiting Audi A3 saloon, driven by a potato-faced guy from the MOD police. The driver nodded a hello at Carter and ferried him south towards Bristol in total silence. The usual friendly MOD reception. Carter was beginning to wonder if muteness was an entry requirement for the police force. Two hours later, Potato Head dropped him outside the main terminal building. Carter grabbed his leather holdall and paced towards the check-in desk. The regiment had booked him an economy-class ticket to Zhezhov, with a carrier he'd never heard of. He passed through security, bought an overpriced coffee and a tepid full-English breakfast from a garishly lit restaurant, then joined the throng of passengers cattle-herded into the departure gate. The other travellers seemed to be mostly Polish families returning home for one reason or another, along with a handful of businessmen. No tourists, as far as Carter could tell. Southeastern Poland wasn't a big holiday destination. That much was clear. They boarded the Boeing 737 half an hour behind schedule. Carter crammed himself into his seat, his knees pressed against the back of the seat in front of him, closed his eyes, and reflected on the many joys of low-cost air travel. Going in by military aircraft would have been more pleasant, probably. They touched down at Zhezhov Yashonka Airport two and a half hours later. Ten o'clock in the morning, local time. The plane rumbled to a halt, the seatbelt lights pinged off, and there was the usual scramble of passengers in the aisles, jostling for space, bumping into one another, and hauling luggage out of the overhead compartments. Carter grabbed his holdall and followed the crowd shuffling out of the aircraft. A sharp wind tugged at his jacket as he descended the air stairs. He immediately spotted a lanky guy in an ill-fitting suit striding towards him from across the apron. The tall man thrust out a meaty paw. Mr. Carter, yes? That's right. The guy flashed his diplomatic ID. Edward Surarkov, he said in broken English. I'm from the Ukrainian consulate in Lublin. I was told to expect you this morning. Where are the others? Your friends are inside. This way, please. Surakov led him towards a side door, away from the long line of passengers snaking out of the main terminal entrance. They climbed a set of stairs, walked straight through arrivals, and strolled past the border guards. The fast-track treatment. No one stopped to challenge them. Guards nodded deferentially and waved them through. Everything had been cleared in advance, Carter assumed. The Ukrainians probably had a standing arrangement with their Polish allies. They had a sizable number of assets transiting through Poland before making their way across the border. Better to make the process as smooth as possible. A mutual interest thing. If Kiev fell, the Poles would be next in the Kremlin's crosshairs. A few minutes after landing, they swept into the arrivals hall. Surakov led him through the bustling crowd towards a familiar figure standing beside a news kiosk. Bloody hell, 
Scott Logan said as they approach. Geordie Fochen Carter, as I live and breathe. Thought you'd be signing on the dole by now, mate. Carter grinned. Isn't that your family tradition? Claiming benefits? Nah, lad, popular misconception, that. Nah. You're confusing us with them scum up the road in Manchester. They shook hands. Scott Logan looked like a boy band member on steroids. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed and lean, with a neat line in banter. The kind of guy who could charm the birds out of the trees. Liverpool born and bred, he had moved south to work for a brokerage firm in the city, before chucking it in to become a full-time soldier. He and Carter had done selection together. Logan's easy-going manner had helped lighten the mood during the grimmest days up on the Breckens. Logan had a reputation as a serial shagger. The others jokingly referred to him as Sex Machine. It was an open secret around the camp that he was having an affair with the wife of a young captain, but whereas other lads would worry about getting caught, Logan didn't seem phased. The guy thrived off living dangerously. Come on, he said. Car's outside. We'll fill you in on the ride. Surakov left them and disappeared through an unmarked door. Carter followed Logan outside, past the taxi rank, across the short-stay car park, towards a big, boxy Chevrolet Suburban at the far end. As they drew near, the driver's side door flung open, and a sinewy, bearded guy stepped out. Geordie, this is Billy McVeigh, said Logan. Billy? Geordie? Carter cast an eye over the young man. McVeigh had a lean, tightly coiled look about him. His hands looked like they had been cast from concrete. Cold blue eyes peered out from beneath a mop of ginger hair. His thick, unkempt beard was the colour of rust. His body language carried a hint of latent violence, as if he might explode into action in the blink of an eye. He looked aggressive, motivated, angry, ready to fight the world. Like Carter himself ten years earlier. He had heard about McVeigh, had seen him around the camp a few times, but the two had never properly met. By the time the latest batch of students had completed selection, Carter had already been sent on gardening leave. He knew only two things about McVeigh. He was hard as fuck, and he had quickly gained a reputation as a cocky operator, with a very high opinion of himself. An amused expression played out on McVeigh's face. I didn't know they were sending us another dinosaur. Geordie's a legend of the regiment, Logan said. One of the best in the business. Me and him have done plenty of ops together. Iraq, Afghanistan, all over. Isn't that right, Geordie? Something like that. McVeigh smirked and said, As long as you don't bore us to death on the drive back with your old war stories, I've had enough of that shite from Scott to last a lifetime. We're not that old, you little twat. McVeigh's eyes glinted a challenge. Could have fooled me. From where I'm standing, you look fucking prehistoric. Carter glared silently at him. He's just pulling the piss, Geordie, Logan said, slapping him on the back. You know how it is with the new lads nowadays. Think they're a bunch of comedians. Maybe so, Carter replied, addressing Logan, but keeping his gaze firmly on the younger soldier. But he won't be laughing when he's picking his teeth off the fucking floor. McVeigh scowled at him. Logan grinned and said, Get in, Geordie. We've got a long ride ahead of us. Carter popped the rear door, scooched himself into the middle row of seats, and dumped a holdall beside him. Logan smuggled into the front passenger seat while McVeigh took the wheel. The inside of the Suburban had the new car smell of fresh leather, car polish, and some kind of chemical cleaning agent. McVeigh fired up the engine. He punched in an address on the touchscreen mounted on the dash, turned out of the car park and followed the sat-nav directions, heading east, then south, on a half-empty dual carriageway. After several kilometres, they took the next slip road, and a few minutes later, they were bowling eastward, along the motorway towards the Ukrainian border. McVeigh kept the Suburban ticking along at 70 per, ten kilometres below the speed limit. Logan started to unwrap a chocolate bar and said, You hungry, mate? There's some food in the back. Protein bars, snacks, shit like that. Bottled water, too. No, mate, I'm fine. Carter had trained himself to survive on very little. In Afghanistan, 
During the long months he had spent as an embed, directing and fighting alongside SF forces, he had subsisted on a diet of tea, bread and fruit. Logan, on the other hand, had a monstrous appetite. The guy never stopped eating. On the escape and evasion phase of selection, he had been more worried about his stomach than getting caught. Where it all went, given his honed physique, remained one of the enduring mysteries of Hereford. Logan tore off a chunk of chocolate and said, It's a ten-hour drive to Novichanka from here. Ninety minutes to the border. We should reach the base by nine o'clock tonight, or thereabouts. He caught Carter's eye in the rearview mirror. How much did Smallwood tell you? The basics? Bare bones of the job? Said you'd brief us on the details. Yeah, well, I don't know what you were expecting, but you're in for a surprise. I've been a blade for a long time. Nothing surprises me anymore. Logan grunted. That's what I thought when we started the job, but it's turning into a nightmare. More like guarding a Hollywood celebrity than a general. Scott's right, McVeigh said in his Mancunian accent, eyes pinned to the road. Now Veloshin has gone underground, the general has an increased workload. Meet and greets all over the fucking shop, showing his mug on the front line. Pain in the arse. He's mobbed wherever he goes. Logan was speaking with a mouthful of chocolate. The troops love him, treat him like a superstar, but it makes our jobs ten times as hard. Does he follow your advice? McVeigh laughed. Does he fuck? We've told him he can't keep exposing himself like this, but he won't listen. Logan said. It's all that media attention he's been getting lately, posing for selfies with world leaders, doing interviews with the big newspapers, hearing soldiers cheering his name and urging him to run for president. Gone to his head, Geordie. Thinks he's invincible. Carter said. What's the routine? Depends, said Logan. Sometimes he sticks around in Kiev to attend meetings, TV interviews and such. On those days, it's a straight drive from the airbase to his office at the Ministry of Defence, back again in the evening. And the rest of the time? That's when it gets dicey. One day, he might decide to make a flying visit to one of the army encampments. The next day, he's off interrogating some suspected traitor in a police station in the back of beyond. Day after that, he might be sitting down to schnapps with the mayor of a liberated town. Guy barely stops. Got more energy than the national grid. The only time you can truly relax is when he's on base. Why? What's he doing then? Not what, mate. Who? Hookers, McVeigh explained. General Kolchov is a big fan. Logan said. The general gets them in his dorm most evenings. We're practically guaranteed to clock off at nine o'clock on the dot. You can catch your breath, have a brew and a doss, knowing the randy fucker will be occupied until the next morning. What about his family? Carter asked. Wife and two kids? Logan replied. Daughter aged seven, son is twelve. They're safe and sound in Prague. Well out of harm's way. Hence the hookers, McVeigh said. Logan glanced at him disapprovingly. You know I don't like that word. I don't like your face, McVeigh retorted, or your accent, but I don't have a go at you for it. Logan sighed and said, Anyway, yeah, the general gets his girls in. You know how it goes, Geordie, playing away from home. As long as you're in different countries, it's fair game. Oldest rule in the book, that. What book is that, then? McVeigh quipped. The old fart guide to dating. Sod off, Billy. Twat. Where are we dossing? asked Carter, changing the subject. Main accommodation block, Logan said. Basic like, but livable. One step up from a prison cell. That's where we'll be staying while we're on site. And the other BGs? The Ukrainians? Same location. They tend to keep to themselves. They're friendly enough. Capable? Logan paused to consider the question. I've seen worse, and I've seen better. But they're keen to learn and they work hard. Can't ask for much more than that. Where's the general now? At Novichenka. He's hunkered down for the day in his private quarters, running over the plan for tomorrow. Why? What's happening tomorrow? McVeigh said. There's an operation in Kiev. The general's planning an arrest. Who's the target? The current defence minister, 
Andre Butko, rising star of the government, they say. Logan let out a belch and said, The general's been running surveillance on him for weeks, intelligence gathering and what have you, but things were ramped up after the Chechens tried to take out Voloshin last week. That's when Koltrov knew for sure that the Russians had someone close to the president. Carter furrowed his brow. He thought about his brother again. Luke, the man who had saved the life of the Ukrainian president. He wondered where he was now, what he was doing. He said, Is the general sure this minister is working for the Russians? McVeigh said, Looks that way. There's a ton of evidence against him. Bank transfers, unexplained payments to secret accounts. They think he's been using a go-between to contact his Russian handlers. Some priest in the Orthodox Church, his spiritual advisor. Logan said, Bukko is a senior minister. He wouldn't risk making direct contact with the Russians. Where's the priest now? Russia, said McVeigh. A team was sent in to arrest him three days ago, but he'd already legged it across the border. Logan said, Bukko is our man, all right. He's been under the microscope for a while. The general believes he's been working for the Russians on the sly, feeding them in from cabinet briefings and details of Ukrainian troop deployments. We think he's the one who tipped off the Chechens about the president's movements. What's the plan? asked Carter. McVeigh said, The general is going to arrest Butko at his office at the Defence Ministry. We'll be accompanying him. Anyone else in the general's party? Anton Makarenko. That's the general's 2IC, rank of colonel, loyal as a basset hound, follows Koltrov around everywhere he goes, along with his press officer, Anna Zinchenko. Now there's a fine woman, Logan said wistfully. Got a figure on her that would put most models to shame, and she's tough to boot. Married, though. Crying shame, that. That hasn't stopped you before, Carter observed. Guilty as charged. Logan grinned sheepishly, looked round at McVeigh. Speaking of which, you could do with a bit of that in your life, Billy. Spend less time beasting yourself in the gym and enjoy a bit of female company instead. Might even remove that giant chip from your shoulder. Fuck off, Carter said. What happens once the arrest has been made? The minister will be whisked away to a secure location and subjected to hard interrogation. General Koltrov will question the minister personally. If he's guilty, then he'll disappear like the others. Others? Carter repeated. Logan nodded and said, Koltrov has been going after the traitors aggressively. He's a ruthless bastard, I'll give him that. He added with a hint of admiration. What happens to them? Put it this way, they're not being offered tea and biscuits, McVeigh said. Bullet in the back of the head, Logan said. Unmarked grave. Jesus, Logan said. The Ukrainians are fighting a war for survival, defending the motherland. Respecting the rights of fifth columnists isn't at the top of their list of priorities. Besides, it's nothing compared to what the Russians have been doing to the local populace. Rape, torture, mass graves, bombing the country into the Stone Age, fucking barbaric. So, yeah... I'm not going to lose any sleep about a few traitors getting the rough treatment. We've got more important things to worry about. Such as? Keeping the general alive. He'll need to stay fucking sharp, boy. Once the job starts, you'll see what I mean. Is it really that bad? Carter said doubtfully. No, mate. It's worse. Logan twisted in his seat and looked round at Carter, his tanned face stamped with concern. The guy's reckless, goes around acting like he's fucking bulletproof or something. It's like he doesn't really believe he's in danger of getting assassinated. He looked away with growing anxiety, the smooth brow wrinkled with frown lines. Why would he put his life on the line? Carter wondered. He must know it would be a PR disaster if he got taken out by the Russians. McVeigh snorted. He doesn't see it that way. He thinks he knows best. Logan said. Whenever we try to tell him to slow down, he just ignores us. It took months to get him to agree just to bolster his vehicles. Until a week ago, we were zipping around in soft-skinned vehicles, and these Chevys aren't even armoured. 
Carter shook his head. Then they won't be any good. Not if we run into an ambush. We need something more solid to stop a bullet. That's what we told him. What did he say? The guy didn't give a toss. Said he didn't want to give the impression to his soldiers that he was afraid of being taken out. Logan gazed out of the side window, face taut with tension. He's going to get himself killed one of these days, he added quietly. Unless we can get him to apply the handbrake, this job is going to go pear-shaped very fast. McVeigh grunted with frustration. Either that, he said bitterly, or one of us is going to die taking a bullet for him. Chapter 13 They hit the Ukrainian border shortly before midday. Carter was surprised to find the area was relatively quiet. He'd expected to see long lines of people fleeing the country on foot, weighed down with their worldly possessions, sprawling tented refugee camps, news crews, reception areas policed by swarms of heavily armed border guards. Instead, the checkpoint looked like any other. There was a long line of articulated lorries and vans waiting to cross into Ukraine, a separate queue of saloons and hatchbacks and motorbikes, the three-lane road flanked by harvested fields on one side and a trash-littered rest stop on the other. Truck drivers stretched their legs and smoked cigarettes, while a handful of guards and sniffer dogs searched their cargoes. A handful of people were crossing the border on foot, carrying rucksacks or shopping bags, some pushing along bicycles. Hard to believe there was a war going on to the east. But then he reminded himself that the conflict had been raging for seven months. That picture, refugee camps, desperate crowds of fleeing civilians, terror stamped on their faces, belonged to an earlier time, the first days of the invasion. Things had dramatically shifted since then. The scores of old Russia hands think-tank academics and Kremlin watchers who had predicted a swift and brutal victory for the Russian war machine had been wrong. The defenders had not folded. President Voloshin and his generals, men like Koltrov, had inspired their fellow citizens to resist the enemy at all costs. Slowly, the picture on the ground had changed. The Russian offensive had faltered, then reversed. The exodus from the cities had dwindled. People were choosing to stay and fight, or returning home to take up arms. McVeigh joined the tailback of civilian vehicles slowly crawling towards the checkpoint. After what felt like a long time, they reached the guard post on the Ukrainian side of the border. A couple of guards approached. McVeigh buzzed down the driver's side window and handed over their passports to a surly-looking guy in an olive-green thermal hat, along with their official Ukrainian Ministry of Defense ID cards issued to all four blades on Koltrov's BG team. The guard took a long hard look at their documents, while his scrawny mate stood close by, gripping his standard-issue AK-74 assault rifle and giving them his best screw face. The guard in the thermal hat disappeared into the guardhouse to make a phone call, and there was a short wait before he came back a minute later, dragging on a cigarette. He thrust the documents back at McVeigh and waved the Suburban through. The boom barriers raised, McVeigh started the engine. Two minutes later, they were motoring through western Ukraine. After five or six kilometres, they stopped again. McVeigh eased into a lay-by and kept the engine running, while Carter hopped out, removed the SIM card from his dummy phone, crushed it beneath the heel of his boot, then tossed the handset and laptop into a thicket of gauze and heather. He jumped back into the Suburban, while Logan sprang open the glove box and handed him a cheap handset. Here, he said. Clean phone, local SIM card, numbers for myself, Billy and Patrick are stored in the address book. Number for the General's 2IC Makarenko, too. Battery on these models is shite, but they're a charging point at the base and in the wagons, so you shouldn't run out of juice. Portable power station in the boot in case of an emergency. Is it encrypted? Is it fuck? There's better security in the door of my local. So, what's the point in us having them? Strictly for emergencies only, in case the comms goes down for whatever reason, which happens from time to time. You know what it's like with the kit. Carter put away the phone, remembered that Kiev was an hour ahead of Poland, 
two hours ahead of London, and adjusted the time on his G-Shock rangeman. They rejoined the motorway and carried on in silence. Some minutes later, Logan spoke again. Must be a new experience for you, Josie, following in your brother's footsteps. Carter laughed and said, We might be in the same country, doing the same job, but that's where the similarities end. How's that? Luke's an old head on young shoulders, gets on with the job, steers out of trouble. Me? I've been making enemies my whole fucking life. Are you close? Carter nodded. Luke's the only family I've got. You must be proud of him. Took some quick thinking to stop those Chechens from killing the president. Got some guts on him, your little brother. Like that incident with the mines in Afghan. Carter stared out of the window and said nothing. He knew the story. The guys at Hereford had talked about nothing else for a while. Seven years ago, during Luke's time as RSM with the Parachute Regiment, a team of guys had been out on patrol when they had stumbled into an IED ambush. One man had been killed instantly. Another soldier had been mortally wounded when he had been sent in to retrieve the metal detectors left behind by the first patrol. His mucker had lost an arm and a leg when he had tried to drag his maimed comrade to safety and stepped off the track, triggering another mine. All the equipment had eventually been recovered, but the grisly job of collecting the body parts remained to be done. The Taliban were known to collect soldiers' severed limbs and genitalia and display them outside their houses as trophies, which caused the maimed soldiers a great deal of distress. Instead of waiting for the clearance team to show up, Luke had calmly walked into the ambush area and gathered up the body parts, before handing them to the padre to dispose of correctly. Luke had earned universal respect for his actions, and rightly so. It was a fine example of the maroon machine mentality at its finest. Bravery, thinking of your brothers in arms, putting yourself on the line, not ordering your subordinates to do something you wouldn't be prepared to do yourself. What he did was admirable, Carter said after a long pause, but he shouldn't have done it. You think he was wrong? Logan asked eyes round with surprise. He was gambling with his life. Could have lost his legs if he'd stepped on a mine. The sensible thing to do would have been to hold off until the clearance team had arrived. Having said that, I know why Luke did it. Why? He didn't want to shirk the responsibility. Not his style. He's always been the kind of guy who puts himself forward. No one ever had to force him to do anything. He just went and did it. Never questioned the orders. That's the difference between us. What about you? McVeigh asked. What's your deal? I heard you were on long-term leave. Who told you that? It's hardly a big fucking secret, Geordie, Logan said, lifting his eyes from the road to the rear view. Everyone knows. McVeigh said. What did you do? Carter didn't reply. He cast his mind back eleven months ago. The covert mission to Afghanistan on the trail of his mentor. He'd discovered that a hero of the regiment had gone over to the dark side, opium smuggling, acquiring nukes on the black market, an operation that resulted in the death of an ex-SAS man and a CIA officer. He had no intention of telling McVeigh and Logan about the Afghan op or the goings-on in G-Squadron. The Liverpudlian had a reputation around the camp as a shameless gossip. If I fill him in... Everyone in Hereford will know about the story soon enough, even the camp slop jockeys. Ancient history, he replied tersely. I don't want to talk about it. McVeigh said. Fucking strange, though, the head shed sending you out here like this. Not really, Carter said tonelessly. Blame your man Longstaff. If that idiot had kept his dick in his pants, he wouldn't have been fragged in that rocket attack, and I wouldn't be here. But why you? Last I heard you were being transferred to G-Squadron. Now you're being cross-decked to our troop. They could have sent one of our lads out. There's no mystery, Carter said tonelessly, sticking to the story he'd agreed with the CO beforehand. I've made enemies. The head shed was looking for an opportunity to kick me out of Hereford. Then they had one. End of story. Logan glanced back at him in amazement. Fucking hell, son. Hartcastle must really hate you. Yeah, well, 
the feelings mutual. You don't know how to play the game, Geordie, that's your problem. Carter chuckled. You sound like my brother. Speaking of which, if you're hoping to catch up with Luke for a few beers in Kiev, you shit out of luck. Why's that? Logan clicked his tongue. He said, The president's off the grid. His BG team is hunkering down with him until this business with the fifth columnists is sorted. Even the general can't get hold of him. Sounds like Voloshin is worried. He should be. The Kremlin is desperate to put a bullet between his eyes. Carter said. Even if they did get him, killing Voloshin wouldn't change a thing on the ground. Not at this stage. If anything, it would turn him into a martyr. Motivate the Ukrainians to keep on resisting. Logan shook his head fiercely. The Russians aren't thinking strategically, Geordie. They're getting their asses kicked and thrashing about looking for a way to tip the scales in their favour. Everything's on the table, whether it helps them win or not. Maybe they're not looking that far ahead, McVeigh mused. How do you mean? asked Logan. McVeigh gave a shrug and said, if the Russians eliminate the president and his generals, people will start to think they've lost the plot. They'll wonder what else they're prepared to do. So? It might make NATO think twice about the wisdom of helping to fund the war effort. Might even persuade them to bring Ukraine to the negotiating table if they think the Russians are prepared to do something crazy. Whatever the reason, Logan said, your brother won't be going anywhere. Not while the president's staying out of sight. Shame Koltrov ain't taking the same approach, McVeigh muttered. Would make our lives a lot fucking easier if he stopped popping his head above the parapet every chance he gets. Wishful thinking, the guy's a shameless attention seeker. More chance of finding a one-ended stick. McVeigh grunted. I'll be glad when this mission is over. Get back to Hereford and finish my dissertation. Better than nursemaiding this flaming idiot. You're studying? Carter asked. Two-year course at uni. Security management, cyber, distance learning, paid for by the regiment. Waste of time, if you ask me, Logan grunted. You're supposed to be a soldier. Bloke like you should be practicing at the killing house, not writing essays. You won't be saying that in a few years, McVeigh said, when I'm running my own company on the circuit and you're begging us for a job. Work for you, Logan looked horrified. Fuck off. Rather take a cheese grater to my balls. He's right, though, Carter said. It's not like it was an hour, dear mate. You need qualifications now. Degrees and masters. The world's changed. Things have moved on. Have they? Look around you. Logan indicated the endless flat terrain rushing past. We're still fighting wars with bullets and tanks last time I checked. The Russians are still trying to knock seven shades of shit out of their neighbours. You spend a week here, then tell me the world's any different. No one said anything for several beats. Then Logan flashed a grin at McVeigh and said, On the bright side, at least I know what to get you for Christmas. Yeah, what's that? Nice shiny briefcase. Carry your papers around. McVeigh chortled. Everything's digital these days, Grandpa. You'd know that if you weren't stuck in the past. Carter fell silent and stared out of the window. The sky had darkened. A light rain was beginning to fall. He thought about his brother again, Luke Carter. Unquestionably a fine soldier, a leader of men. But Carter worried about how he would fare at Hereford in the long run. Regiment operators, or some of them, tended to be more snakish than the lads in the Green Army ranks. The unit attracted the gamblers and the renegades. The loners, who had no tolerance level for the yes sir, no sir bullshit of the parade ground. If Luke had a fault, it was his tendency to trust people, to take them at face value and assume they shared the same moral values. He didn't always see the big picture, didn't realise that the system was corrupt. In the cutthroat world of 2-2 SAS, Carter feared he might get chewed up by the big beasts. I just hope he doesn't make the same mistakes as me. They motored through a landscape of muted browns and greys. Low hills interrupted the level plains, crowned with thinning clumps of pine and birch. Further on, Carter saw battalions of rolled haystacks and coppiced woods and sprawling fields of rye and barley, their flowery spikes swaying in the afternoon wind. 
After ninety minutes, they hit the outskirts of Lviv. They skirted around the depressing fringes of the city, stopped at a petrol station and topped up the Suburban's twenty-eight gallon tank, then continued eastward. Carter scanned the streets but saw no signs of the recent conflict. No buildings reduced to rubble or flamed out tanks or rocket craters lining the streets. People were sitting in coffee shops or getting their hair cut or playing football or doing any of the multitude of things that constituted normal civilian life. When he pointed this out to Logan, the Liverpudlian made a pained expression. Place was a lot different a few months ago, he said. Back then, there was chaos, air raid sirens, rocket attacks, crowds of refugees piling in from the east, everyone in a big flap trying to get out of the country. Now it's calmed down. You can go out, grab a beer, find a bite to eat at a nice restaurant. What about Kiev? Same, basically. Everyone is trying to get on with their lives. Logan's face was a picture of concentration as he tried to find the right words. It's weird. The city is almost normal, apart from the sirens and the nightly curfew and the soldiers manning the checkpoints. Different story in the east, though. I can imagine. Logan shook his head slowly. No, mate, you really can't. Places out there have been wiped off the map by the Russians. Like those photographs of Berlin at the end of the Second World War. Nothing left except bombed-out buildings and rubble. The rebuild will cost a fucking fortune. Carter said. Do you think they'll lose? Who, the Russians? It's possible. They're definitely getting their asses kicked at the moment. Problem is, the more ground they lose, the more they're likely to lash out. But I'm sure of one thing. What's that? This war is pure fucking hell for the people living in the East. And it's gonna get worse. Once the winter sets in, those poor bastards will be freezing cold with no heating or electricity. God knows how many of them are going to die. The rain became heavier as the afternoon wore on. Needle-sized drops drenched the wheat fields and spattered the windscreen, tracing watery veins down the glass. Logan subjected Carter to a long and rambling commentary on the many charms of Ukrainian women. He was a big fan of them, apparently. Reckoned they knew some tricks that could put a smile on the face of a cleric. And they could drink too, he said. He'd seen local women knocking back enough vodka to put some of the regiment drinkers to shame. All in all, he was an enthusiastic convert. McVeigh said nothing. He fixed his angry gaze on the road, like he had a personal beef with it. At seven o'clock, they reached Zhutomir, and Carter figured they were no more than a couple of hours from the old Air Force base at Novichanka. In the gathering dusk, the gilded, onion-shaped domes of orthodox churches caught the last rays of the autumn light and flamed like torches. Carter saw occasional signs of the missile attacks that had rained down on the city recently. A playground reduced to a tangle of twisted metal and debris, a mountain of rubble from a destroyed housing block, the burned-out carcasses of cars. Ninety minutes later, they passed the small city of Fastiv, and cut northeast for maybe thirty kilometers before they hit a mid-sized town. Soviet-era apartment blocks pierced the gloomy skyline, foregrounded by pastel-colored civic buildings, medieval churches, and lampposts surmounted with stork's nests. Billboards carried messages of support for the troops on the front. The road funneled them north of the town on a two-lane stretch of tree-lined blacktop before they reached a military checkpoint. Half a dozen armed soldiers with AK-74 rifles stood guard in front of a wall of sandbags. Behind them, Carter identified a pair of Spartan-armoured personnel carriers equipped with 50 caliber machine guns and anti-tank missiles on the turrets. A Ukrainian flag hung from a steel pole next to a crude guard post. Concrete barriers had been positioned on alternating sides of the road a hundred metres downstream from the checkpoint, forcing drivers to lower their speed and approach in single file. There was a battered stop sign staked into the dirt at the side of the road, in case anyone failed to take the hint. McVeigh eased the Suburban down to twenty per and weaved through the precast barriers before drawing to a halt in front of the two guards manning the checkpoint.
The soldiers flashed their Ukrainian ID cards at the nearest guard. She gave each of them a close inspection before shouting an order at her colleagues to step aside and let them through. How many guys are living at the base? Carter asked as they chanted on past the checkpoint. Two hundred, all in, Logan said. Security? Dog teams on twenty-four hour patrol of the perimeter, soldiers on the inner and outer cordons, no illumination at night, so we're not visible to drones or satellites. Place is as secure as a Chinese city in a pandemic. Anti-aircraft weaponry? Starstreak missile emplacements, guarded by a detachment of soldiers from the 30th Mechanized Brigade. Blast-proof shelter beneath the main accommodation blocks. Logan grinned. We're as safe as houses here. What about the staff? All thoroughly vetted. No one is allowed in or out of the base without prior clearance. Not even the general's women. Not even. Who's in charge of vetting them? Makarenko, the general's two IC. He vets them personally. Is he searching them girls for devices? Far as I know, everyone is checked for electronic footprints before they're allowed on the base. They didn't check us. They didn't need to. We're known to the guards. They see our faces every day. Trust me, the girls are clean. Apart from the obvious. Logan grinned. McVeigh didn't join in the laughter. Fucking miracle. What's that, son? Your jokes, McVeigh said. They just get more and more shit. Carter said. Have there been any attacks on the base? Not since we moved in. Once in a blue moon, the Russians get frustrated and lob a few rockets at the nearby towns. In the spring, they wiped out the camp to the north, so the general had to shift his operations here. But they haven't laid a glove on the base, not since we've been here. Why not? Logan thought about this for a few beats. Maybe they don't know we're here. The base is out of commission, and has been since the days of the Cold War. No planes take off from here or anything like that. Like we're hiding in plain sight. They stuck to the same road for half a kilometre, along a smooth stretch of tarmac fringed with one-storey breeze-block shacks, discount supermarkets and half-finished high-rises. Stray dogs padded along the weed-infested pavement, sniffing at bags of rubbish. After several minutes, McVeigh took a sharp left and pulled up in front of the gate at the main entrance to Novichanka Air Base. Two more soldiers strutted out of the reinforced gatehouse, and there was another delay while they checked the blade's documents. Phone calls were made, orders given, the automated gate whirred open, and then they were arrowing through the grounds of the base. The access road took them past the main control tower and a row of administrative blocks and parking bays. Then McVeigh turned left again and followed the road as it ran parallel to a row of ugly concrete buildings. He pulled up in front of the nearest structure, next to a couple of identical suburbans and a muddle of other military vehicles concealed beneath camo nets. This is us, Logan said as McVeigh killed the engine. They climbed out of the Chevy. Carter lugged out his holdall and took in the view, which didn't amount to much. Beyond the road, several hundred metres to the north, the main runway ran on a northwest axis for a couple of kilometres. Bomb craters scarred the tarmac in places. There was a helipad close to the hangars, apparently still in use, with the landing spot presently occupied by a British seeking helicopter. But the rest of the base was in a state of neglect. Weeds poked through the concrete. The rusting hulk of an old Antonov transport aircraft rested in front of a dilapidated hangar next to an abandoned fire tender. Logan continued his one-man guided tour. Ukrainians are in the same building, but they don't bother us none. Canteen on the ground floor. Food is shite, though, unless you've got a passion for pork knuckles and borscht. Amazing the soldiers here aren't all as fat as fuck, McVeigh muttered. The shit they shove into their pie holes. Logan said, There's a restaurant in the town. We usually go there whenever we get the chance. Curfew is at eleven o'clock, but the place is dead by then anyway. Where's the general dossing? Separate part of the base, private dormitory block. We'll introduce you tomorrow. No point disturbing him tonight. He's probably stark bollock naked right now, having fun with one of his regulars. Lucky bugger, Logan said.
Who's guarding him now? asked Carter. Ukrainian soldiers, McVeigh said. He spat on the ground. We don't get involved on that front, not while the general is on site. Between them lot and the perimeter defences, he's well covered. 360 protection. We're only needed when the guy is on the move. Logan glanced at his watch. Let's get you sorted in your digs, then we'll grab some scoff before evening prayers. I'm starving. Carter looked at him in disbelief. You've been snacking non-stop since we hit the road, you greedy bastard. What can I say? I'm a man with a big appetite. In more ways than one, McVeigh said under his breath. Logan didn't appear to have heard the younger blade. Food first, he said. Then we'll go through the plan for the arrest tomorrow. Chapter 14 They stepped through the entrance, led Carter up a flight of stairs, and showed him to his room, which consisted of a metal-framed single bed with a lumpy mattress, a chair and desk, and an old cast-iron radiator, the cream paint flaking in places. There were damp patches on the bare walls, and a chill draught whispered through the gaps in the window frame. Strips of black masking tape formed a V across the pane to stop the glass from shattering in the event of a rocket attack, but which also reduced the amount of natural light in the room. A naked bulb dangled from the stained ceiling. Carter wasn't bothered. He had stayed in worse digs. He didn't care where he slept, as long as he had somewhere to get his head down. One of the many things that traditionally distinguished the regiment from their brother warriors in Delta and the Seals, in his experience. The Americans were used to getting all the best kit, first-class accommodation, decent food, all the creature comforts. But if they were deprived of them for whatever reason, they struggled to cope. The guys in the SAS had never suffered the same problem. They learned early on to make do and get on with the job. Ukrainian SF clobber. Logan said, pointing to a bulky kit bag on the floor. Everything you'll need to blend into the background. Uniform, boots, gloves, helmet. All in your sizes, unless you've been piling on the pound since your last stop. Carter chuckled. I'm not a food monster, mate. That's your party trick. Healthy sex life, Geordie. Best way of keeping off the pounds. Long as you don't have a problem contracting gonorrhea, McVeigh joked. Carter joined in with the laughter. Logan glared at them both with tight-lipped anger. Then he said, We wear the uniforms whenever we're off base, civvies when we're on site. Carter dumped his holdall on the mattress, then followed McVeigh and Logan back down to the ground floor canteen, whereupon Carter found the fourth member of the team waiting for them. Patrick Webb sat at the nearest table, four plates of steak and chips in front of him. He wasn't difficult to miss. Firstly, because at nine o'clock in the evening, he was the only person in the canteen, but also because of his bulk. Webb was the biggest guy in the regiment, hands like oar paddles, biceps the size of boulders. His legs were so huge, you needed climbing equipment to scale them. He looked like Kimbo Slice on a weight gain program. When he stood up to greet the others, Carter half expected the floor to quake beneath them. An M4 carbine rested on the table beside Webb. Obeying the first rule of the regiment. Always keep your primary weapon within arm's reach. Jordy, you remember Patrick? Logan began. Carter extended a hand and hoped it wouldn't be crushed in Webb's grip. All right, fella. How's tricks? Webb grunted a reply. Carter had worked with the Brummy on several training jobs in the past, but he still knew next to nothing about the guy. He said little offered up no personal details about himself, his background, his family. Webb had joined the regiment two years ago, after a stint with the Special Reconnaissance Regiment, one of the newer additions to the UK SF community. He had grown up in Birmingham, and had been caught up in some sort of gang trouble in his youth. But beyond that, the guy was a closed book. "'Got the chef to rustle us up some scoff,' Webb said, waving a hand at the plates. "'Thought you boys might be hungry.' God, yes, Logan said as he dropped into the seat. Starving. He reached for the salt shaker, emptied half the contents onto his food, and started hacking away at the rump steak with his knife and fork. 
Carter popped a chip into his mouth and looked round. Where's everyone else? Most of the Ukrainians head into town after tea, McVeigh said. They'd like to have a few beers, shoot a few rounds of pool in the local joints before hitting the sack. Some of the older guys just stay in their bunks. They're missing out, Logan said, jaws working furiously as he chewed on a hunk of meat. If that was me, I'd be out on the town every night, working the Logan charm on the talent. McVeigh said disapprovingly, Don't you ever think about anything other than shagging? I'm a born romantic. Can't help myself. Surprise you can get it up these days, bloke your age. Piss off, fella. I've had more women than you've had days on earth. McVeigh snorted derisively. I wouldn't brag about sleeping with a few camp groupies. They jump into bed for a packet of crisps and a bottle of cheap body. Logan tutted and said, See, that's your problem, Billy. No respect for the opposite sex. No, mate, I just don't let my dick room a noggin. You should let me take you for a night out on the tiles when we get back. Teach you a few tricks. You never know. Some woman might take pity on your sad ass. Carter said, Billy's got a point. We're on the job. Focus on that. Leave the other stuff for when we're back home. Tell this moody cunt to stop taking the mick then. Logan replied, keeping his gaze trained on McVeigh. I'm serious, Carter snapped. Don't make the same mistake as Longstaff. Keep your cock in your pants. Christ, Geordie, calm down. Logan held up his hands in mock surrender. I was just joking, like. As long as that's all it is. They finished up in the canteen, got a brew on, then made their way down the corridor towards a sturdy-looking door at the far end of the building. Logan plucked out a key from his trouser pocket, unlocked the door, and motioned for the others to enter. Carter followed them into a small, square-shaped room with metal bars on the windows, half a dozen chairs arranged around a scuffed table, and a heavy-duty safe secured to the floor next to a storage locker the size of a smeg fridge. Several detailed maps were spread out on the table, along with an array of laptops and tablets housed in military-grade protective cases and a chunky satellite phone. Webb gathered up their passports, plodded over to the safe, and worked a mechanical combination, massive hands twisting the metal dial left and right. The safe unlocked with a diplomatic click. The door yawned open, and Webb placed the passports on the top shelf, next to a thick wad of Ukrainian banknotes. There was a separate bundle of US dollars on the top shelf, and a band of euros. Regimental Slush Fund plus a load of SIM cards, a set of replacement phones, a stack of printed documents. Webb sealed the safe door again, then joined the other guys around the table sipping their brews. The coffee was bitter and strong, like getting kicked in the face by a mule. Logan began the slack briefing. The general's scheduled to leave here at 0900 tomorrow morning. It's a straight run from here to Kiev to make the arrest. Won't be any earlier than that because we're on a no move before 0900. Carter said. That late? Rupert's are usually up at the crack of dawn. Logan sniggered. <laughs> Our man Koltrov isn't an early riser. Spends his morning saying his goodbyes to his sweethearts. How far are we from Kiev? From here to the city centre, it's about 40 kilometres. 50 minute drive, depending on the route we're taking and the time of day. Carter lowered his gaze to the map familiarising himself with the details. How many established routes have we got? Six. We mix it up from day to day. Tomorrow we're on Route Bravo. McVeigh traced the route on the map with a stubby finger. It'll take us direct from Novichanka to Minister Bukko's office. That's where the general is planning to make the arrest. Which is where? Ministry of Defence headquarters. Heavily guarded, for obvious reasons. Guardhouse on the front, manned by Ukrainian SF personnel. Are we sure he's going to be there tomorrow? The general has got access to Bukko's calendar, Logan explained. He's due to host a meeting with the head of the SBU, that's the Ukrainian Security Service, at nine o'clock in the morning, lasting ninety minutes. What if the meeting ends early? It won't. The SBU chief has orders to keep him in place until we arrive. He? She? is in on it. She, yes, 
She's been informed of the investigation into Bukko, his dealings with the Russians. What if he's spooked and doesn't show? Officers from the SBU are running round the clock surveillance on the suspect. If he changes his plans for whatever reason, they'll sound the alarm and the mission will be aborted. The four of us will accompany the general into the building while he makes the arrest. Logan contorted his features into a scowl. We're supposed to have line of sight to him at all times while he's on foot, but it doesn't always work out that way. And the Ukrainians? They'll stay outside, parked in front of the ministry, guarding the vehicles, McVeigh said. Remember, we're under strict orders from the head shed not to get involved politically, Logan put in. They don't want us interfering with the arrest. Our job begins and ends with protecting the general. That's it. Carter said. What's the routine for everyone leaving the base? There's an RV point in front of Kolchov's digs. We'll collect him from there at 0900 Sharp. How many vehicles are we taking? Three. Kolchov will ride in the middle wagon with you and me, Makarenko and his press officer. Four Ukrainians in the first Suburban, two more Ukrainians in the rear Chevy with Patrick and Billy. Carter said, We'll need to check them before we set off. Engine oil, warning lights, fuel tanks. We don't want any problems en route to the arrest. Already sorted. Patrick will take care of that first thing tomorrow. Reminds me, Webb said. Someone needs to tidy the vehicles, clean up the mess the general left behind last time out, all of those crisp packets and sandwich wrappers. Logan said, Billy, that's your job. Get on it soon as we finished here, sunshine. Me? The Mancunian screwed up his face in disgust. Why do I always get the shite tasks? Because you're a gobby twat. Because you're the crow on the team. Because I fucking said so. McVeigh stared at the older man, his lips pressed tightly shut. Carter dropped his gaze to the map, his mind running through scenarios, choke points, areas of heightened threat. Are we expecting any resistance from the targets? He asked. No, Logan answered. Both targets are unarmed. No security details for either guy. It's just them. Far as we know, Webb interjected. Where are we taking the suspect? Here. Logan stabbed a finger at a point on the map, three kilometres from the Defence Ministry. Police station on Donetsk Street, he went on. It's a ten-minute drive from the target's office. Secure? McVeigh nodded. Cells have barred windows, security cameras covering all approaches, area is grungy but it serves a purpose, and it's well out of the way of the busiest areas. Logan said, It's a straightforward job, Geordie. Should be a piece of piss. Carter gave a dry chuckle. Since when has any op ever been that easy? They took a break for another brew and went through the rest of the plan. Logistics, timings, distances. They analysed likely traffic patterns, checked to see if any streets in the area had been hit in the recent spate of rocket attacks launched across the city. They plotted emergency exfiltration routes from the arrest location and police station, looked at the layout of the Ministry of Defence building, studied entry and exit points. Once they had memorised the details, Logan produced another key and unlocked the fridge-sized storage locker standing flush against the back wall. Inside was a ton of hardware. Carter was looking at more weaponry than a Texas gun shop. Not bad, eh? Logan grinned. Carter ran his eyes over the equipment. Four M4 assault rifles, the same number of Glock semi-automatic pistols, L2 hand grenades and smoke grenades, a dozen of each. Plus four sets of body armour with front and rear plate hangers, night scopes, pancake holsters for the Glocks, personal radio systems, field dressings and several boxes of ammunition, 5.56 by 45mm NATO rounds for the M4. 9 by 19 mm Parabellum for the Glock. Also inside, an L115A4 sniper rifle, chambered for the 7.62 by 51 mm NATO round, which was the latest addition to the UK SF sniper armoury. The British Army variant on the Accuracy International AX rifle system, the upgraded version of the company's Arctic Warfare Magnum series of weapons.
Fitted with a Schmidt and Bender scope, an integrated tactical suppressor. Effective range of at least 800 meters. Weapon of choice for the SAS, Delta, and pretty much any discerning SF operator. Logan, noticing the look on his face, said, Rifle was retrieved by the Ukrainians from a dead Russian soldier on an op in the summer. Got their hands on a shit ton of them. We managed to scrounge one. Scrounging runs in your family, don't it? said McVeigh. Logan stared at him with flat eyes. Twat. He handed Carter one of the M4s and said, Look on the bright side, Geordie. At least you won't have to spend time familiarising yourself with the kit on this gig. I thought we were supposed to be carrying the same kit as the Ukrainians. We are. Carter frowned. But this is all Western weaponry. This isn't what the Ukrainians have been working with. Situation has changed. We had the local stuff until recently, said Logan. All that shitty kit they had been packing before the war, AK-74s and such like. But we've been bumped up now, what with the supplies coming across the border. Carter remembered reading somewhere about the masses of equipment flowing into the country from abroad, much of it donated by the US, Britain and other NATO countries. Other stuff had been seized from captured Russian forces, spoils of war. The country had amassed sizable stockpiles of grenade launchers, heavy machine guns, sniper rifles, missiles, FIM-92 stingers, star streaks, howitzers, mortars, high mars, drones and thermobaric bombs. Enough kit to start the Third World War and end it. Let's hope this shit never gets turned against us, he muttered. Why would they? Logan asked. We're on the same side. These guys are our friends. So were the Taliban, once upon a time. This is totally different. Jesus, you can't compare this lot to the Afghans. Maybe not, but all I know is, every time we've donated loads of kit to some other country, it's come back to bite us on the arse. You'd realise that if you spent more time reading up on your history instead of trying to get your end away with the Hereford groupies. That's why I don't read books, see? Logan tapped the side of his head. Put too many grim thoughts in your head. Life's depressing enough as it is. Why make it worse? To educate yourself, mate. Fuck that. I had enough of that shite at school. Give me a pint and a nice woman over eating any day of the week. Carter set down his M4 and strapped the pancake holster around his waist. He thumbed the mag release catch on the side of the Glock, checked to make sure there was a full ten round clip of nine milli brass inside, slid the clip back into the mag feed on the underside of the moulded polymer grip, secured the semi-automatic in the holster. Radios are preset to the same frequency as the Ukrainians, said McVeigh. Secure channel, voice comms, got our own private channel too, so we can chat to one another without them lot listening in. Can they speak English? asked Carter. Logan said, The Colonel Makarenko, he's up to a good standard. General Kolchov too. And the others? Passable. Better than my Ukrainian, put it that way. Carter stared at him. You've been out here six months and you haven't picked up any of the lingo. Don't give me that look, Geordie. I ain't had the time. Been busy, man. Yeah, you have. McVeigh's expression relaxed into a dirty smile, failing to chat up the local women. The Mancunian's chest started to heave up and down in laughter. Webb and Carter joined in too, while Logan glared at them, his face shading white with anger. Get away with you, fucking idiots. Carter stopped smiling and said, How do we contact the head shed? Webb pointed with his eyes at the sat phone on the table. It was mounted on a docking station. A cable ran from the docker towards the ceiling. Use that. It's rigged up to an antenna on the roof, so you can use it indoors. Direct line to Hereford, fully encrypted. Carter nodded and said, I'll reach out to them once we're done here. Call in a sit rep. Let them know the planning for tomorrow. Tell them to send us some decent beers, Logan said, half jokingly. Give us a break from that watered down Polish shite they serve in all the bars in town. Carter grinned. I'll get them to fly in some tenant super. That's more up your street, isn't it? Prick. 
Carter picked up the sat phone and consulted his G-Shock. Eleven o'clock at night. He said, We'll RV back here in a few hours for morning prayers. Seven o'clock sharp. Should give us plenty of time to grab some breakfast, check the radios are working, make sure the Suburbans are ready to roll and load up on smokes and grenades. Meanwhile, get your heads down. Big day ahead of us. We'll need to stay sharp as fuck. The other guys trooped out of the room, taking their longs and pistols with them. Webb first, then McVeigh, then Logan. The latter handed over the door key to Carter and paused in the doorway. You really think the Russians might have a crack at the general tomorrow? He's going to be in the middle of Kiev in broad daylight, badly exposed, confronting a known Russian collaborator, less than a week after they tried to kill the president. Anything could happen. Logan looked doubtful. It's been quiet so far. Not a sniff of trouble in six months. That's what I'm worried about. Maybe the general's not high on their list. Logan scratched his jaw. Or they might just be biding their time. Either way, we'll have to be on top of our game. Especially if this guy is as reckless as you say he is. He is, Logan insisted. That's for sure. You'll see for yourself tomorrow, I guess. He sniffed and said, Looks like they've thrown you into the deep end here. Carter smiled feebly. Story of my life, mate. Story of me fucking life. Chapter 15 Carter rose at six o'clock the next morning. He took a brisk jog around the base perimeter, had a shower and a shave, changed into his Ukrainian army threads, and carried his M4 long down to the canteen. Scores of Ukrainians were seated at the tables, forking chunks of greasy sausage and potato into their mouths. They paid Carter no attention as he pulled up a pew at a separate table with Webb, Logan, and McVeigh. The four men ate in near silence, their plates stacked high with eggs, bacon, and slabs of coarse bread lathered in butter, washed down with mugs of fresh coffee. Like soldiers everywhere, they had learned to eat well, and eat fast. Could be our last meal for a while, Carter thought, if this thing goes south. They refilled their brews and detoured into the locked office. Webb wrestled open the locker and distributed the hand grenades to the others, three per man. Each guy was also issued with three smokes, four spare mags of 5.56 by 45mm rounds for the M4, two extra clips of 9mm parabellum for the Glock, an emergency field dressing, tourniquet, two morphine auto-injectors, a camo headlamp and a personal radio. Carter checked both his weapons again, slipped on his body armour, stashed the grenades, burner phone, ammo and kit in the large utility pouches on the front and sides of his webbing, and tested the preset channel on the radio. Sometime later, Logan left the room. He returned after a couple of minutes, followed by two soldiers from the Ukrainian BG team. Captain Yuri Popov was the officer in charge of the group. He was thick-necked and heavy-set like a boxer gone to seed, with slicked-back hair the colour of urine and lizard eyes. Popoff had managed to squeeze himself into an army uniform. Carter wasn't sure how. The guy standing next to Captain Popov could have been his twin. The similarity was frightening. He had the same build, the same haircut, same facial features. He was an inch shorter, a little thicker around the chest, maybe, but otherwise they were like clones. Logan introduced the lookalike as Staff Sergeant David Horbach, Popov's deputy. How are we looking, Captain? Carter asked them. My men are ready, Popov said in faintly accented English. Tell us the plan. Carter walked them through it in English. He had to repeat himself a few times to clarify details, or because Popov and Horbach couldn't understand his Newcastle twang. Once we arrive at the target location, he said, we'll accompany the general inside while he makes the arrest. You lot will wait outside and establish a cordon. Got it? Popoff and Horbach looked at one another. Horbach, eyes pinned to the map, stroked his chin and muttered something to the captain under his breath in his mother tongue. What did he say? Logan asked the captain. Popoff said, my sergeant thinks we should be the ones inside the building during the mission, 
The general is our responsibility. He says you should take the cordon. Carter said, That's not up for discussion. Why not? You've got the most important job. The likeliest point of attack is from the front of the building, which means you and your muckers will be the first line of defence between the enemy and the principal. Your guys will be in charge of sounding the alarm and holding any attackers off until we can get your man Koltrov out. Logan added helpfully, Corden is the most dangerous job. There won't be a threat from inside. It was bullshit, Carter knew. The Ministry of Defence was heavily guarded on all sides, like a fortress. The chances of a frontal assault were minimal. If there was an attempt on the general's life, Carter figured it would be more likely to happen en route to or from the arrest. But the Ukrainians seemed to buy it. We're protecting one of the most targeted individuals in the country, he reminded himself. No point creating bad blood between us and the Ukrainian bodyguards. Logan said, Routine is the same as always. Your men will ride in the front and rear vehicles in the convoy. Me and Geordie will be travelling with the boss, his 2IC and press officer. Patrick and Billy will accompany your guys in the rear wagon. Keep your eyes peeled, Carter warned the Ukrainians. If anything happens, the priority is to get away from the threat as quickly as possible and return to base. No problem, we understand. What's the deal with the ribbons today? Logan asked. Left arm, said Popov. Yellow and blue ribbon. Any issues with the route to Kiev? Any rocket attacks in the area overnight? Negative. We checked in this morning. Route is clear. They hadn't heard any air raid sirens during the dead hours, but Carter wanted to be doubly certain. An old regiment habit engraved deep into his bones. They inspected their radios and kit one last time. Logan contacted Hereford on the sat phone, letting them know they were about to leave the base, checking to see if there were any further intelligence updates on the situation in Kiev. Carter glanced again at his G-Shock, 0845 hours. He told Webb to get the Suburbans up and running, and instructed Popov and Horbach to assemble their men in front of the main block in ten minutes. Webb came back nine minutes later. Wagons are running, he said. Full tanks, everything's good to go. The four blades slipped on their tactical gloves, helmets and ski masks. They rigged up their tactical radios, tied the blue and yellow strips of cloth around their left biceps, identifying them to Ukrainians as friendly forces. Snatched up their M4s. It's time, Carter said. Let's get moving. They emerged from the barracks block to a crisp autumn morning, the clear sky the colour of a naked gas flame. A chill wind lashed across the base. The air was so cold you could almost snap it. Popov, Horbach and the rest of the Ukrainian bodyguard team stood waiting beside the three Suburbans, primary weapons hanging from their rifle slings, some smoking cigarettes or rubbing their hands in an effort to work some warmth into them. The SAS men greeted their Ukrainian colleagues with curt nods, but kept a discreet distance. Just as it should be, thought Carter. We're not here to be their mates. We've got a job to do. Popov stood close by, jabbering into his phone, too quickly for Carter to understand what he was saying. He hung up as Carter approached and said, Principal is almost ready. Two minutes. Tell your men to get into the wagons, said Carter. We'll swing round to the RV point at the front of the general's dorm block and wait for him there. Popov relayed the order to his men. They split into groups, two of them diving into the rear suburban with McVeigh and Webb, while Popov, Horbach and the remaining soldiers took the lead wagon. Carter and Logan made their way over to the middle vehicle, Logan tucking himself behind the wheel, Carter easing into the passenger seat. Doors thunked shut, engines revved, lights beamed. The front suburban steered away from the parking area, the other vehicles following close behind, cantering past the accommodation blocks. They hooked a right at the far end of the tarmac area and drove south for 200 metres, heading towards the control tower and the front of the airbase, until they pulled up in front of a two-storey, concrete-faced building set apart from the rest of the admin blocks. 
A pair of soldiers stood guard in front of the entrance. A short distance away, Carter spotted a dark grey Volkswagen Tuareg in one of the parking bays. Tinted windows, Ukrainian plates, engine running. Who's that? he asked. Logan squinted at the Tuareg and said, Staff car. One of the general's lackeys uses it to ferry the girls to and from the base, their own private taxi service. Are they local? The girls? Logan nodded. They're staying in a hotel outside the town. Long-term residency. The general pays for their keep. Carter lifted his eyebrows. Must be costing him a small fortune. How the fuck does he afford that? He's a three-star general. I imagine he's on a tidy income. Probably has a nice side hustle too. The Ruperts have had their noses in the trough for years in this country. So have ours, mate. They just do a better job of hiding it. Logan laughed cynically. Guess some things never change. No. As they looked on, two women strolled out of the building. A well-upholstered brunette, her shapely frame squeezed into a red plunge dress, and a slender blonde in a black leather mini-dress and a matching pair of platform heels. They stopped outside the entrance, cigarettes in hand, bummed a lighter from one of the guards, then sauntered over to the Tuareg, puffing on their smokes and giggling. Logan looked on greedily as they climbed into the back of the Volkswagen with some difficulty in their high heels. Sweet Jesus, the general might be a wanker, but he's got good taste in women, I'll give him that. The Tuareg reversed out of the parking bay and continued south towards the main entrance to the base. Carter and Logan sat in the middle suburban and waited. Ninety seconds later, General Viktor Koltrov stepped outside. The Lion of Ukraine looked shorter than he had appeared on TV, but he had the same stern-faced look Carter remembered from the medal ceremony, the same arrogant manner. He strode confidently towards the middle suburban, ramrod straight and square-jawed, wearing his distinctive leather eye patch, a man marching towards his destiny. Two more figures hastened out of the building after him, a tall, gangly guy with dark, greasy hair and ferret-like features, and an elfin, red-headed woman. Both wore body armour over their military uniform, both were armed with belt-holstered pistols. The woman stared at her phone as she walked, dainty fingers dancing over the screen. Carter swung out of the wagon, trotted round to the passenger side door, and popped it open. Koltrov halted in front of Carter, a small groove notching his forehead. His good eye, peering out from beneath its heavy lid, sized up the SAS man the way a wolf studies its prey. You're new. A statement, not a question. Yes, sir, Carter said. He had been told to address the general as sir an ego thing. The general was a stickler for formality, despite his man-of-the-people shtick. Whitehall mandarins, with one eye on the future, had been only too happy to agree. They were dealing with a potential future presidential candidate. They felt it was important to curry favour with the coming man, while staying close to the current power on the throne. The groove deepened. What happened to the other man, Longstaff? Returned home, sir. Injuries. They sent me out to replace him. Then you must be the Carter brother. Yes, sir. Koltrov's good eye lit up like a headlamp. This is truly a great honor. I know all about your brother. A fine man. A great soldier. Credit to his country. Thank you, sir. I, too, come from a family of great warriors, the general said in flawless English. Yes, sir. My grandfather was a hero of the Second World War. He fought against the Nazis at the Battle of the Dnieper. They made him hero of the Soviet Union for his part in the battle. Do you know how they rewarded him after the fighting, the cowards in Moscow? No, sir. They sentenced him to the Gulag. Twelve years of hell in the Arctic Circle. Now I find myself fighting against the sons and daughters of Stalin the Butcher. History has a sick sense of humor. I guess so, sir. Koltrov gestured towards the two uniformed figures at his side. My deputy, Colonel Makarenko, 
he said, indicating the ferret-faced man. Anna Zinchenko, the general added, nodding at the petite redhead. My press officer. Zinchenko stopped typing and glanced up from her screen at Carter. Intense, moss-green eyes scrutinized him. The bow-shaped lips spread into a business-like smile before she dropped her gaze back to her phone again. Carter stepped aside, giving the general and his staff space. The three Ukrainians ducked into the back of the Suburban. Carter closed the door, scurried round the front of the wagon, dropped back into the passenger seat, and reached out to Popov on the comms channel. We're all set, Captain. Ready when you are. Okay. The Suburban directly in front of Carter and Logan steered back onto the access road. Two minutes later, the convoy exited the airbase and turned north, joining the three-lane stretch of motorway leading towards Kiev. Carter settled back to enjoy the view, which didn't amount to much. Belts of woodland and scrub straddled the roadside, interspersed with gutted buildings and the rusted shells of destroyed vehicles. In the back, Koltrov said, You are carrying M4s. Yes, sir, Logan said. This is all new kit, just arrived. An excellent weapon, much better than the AK-74, in my opinion, more accurate. I have used it myself, you know. Is that so, sir? Carter asked, more out of politeness than any genuine interest in Koltrov's career. He thought, indulging the principle, one of the key jobs for any self-respecting bodyguard team. Oh, yes, said Koltrov. Many times, at Fort Bragg, when I was given a personal tour by Delta Force, at your camp, too. You've been to Hereford? The general nodded. I am afraid it was only a short visit. I was in the country to deliver a lecture on urban warfare, at your famous Sandhurst Academy. Carter said nothing. I am in big demand nowadays, Koltrov went on. Always I am giving interviews to the newspapers, the TV stations, especially the Americans. They are very keen to speak to me. They want to understand how I brought the Russian scum to their knees. I am loved as much in America, I think, as my own country. Yes, sir. My people, they worship me. You will see. I'm sure they do, sir. It is a special thing to be loved by your own people. They know, you see. They know only I can lead them to victory. Under my command, we shall break the Russian vermin. Your leaders, they thought we would lose in a matter of days. They thought they were so clever. They were ready to mourn the death of Ukraine before the first shot had been fired. But they did not understand the hatred we have for the invaders. Yes, sir. I give you an example, okay? Koltrov was warming to his theme now. Because of our shared history, many people here are fluent in Russian. Always you could hear Russian in the streets. But most people have vowed never to speak the language again. They would rather lose their tongues than let a Russian word pass their lips. Can't say I blame them, sir. We will crush the Russians, the general added, balling his right hand into a tight fist. His one good eye glinted like ice under the winter sun. In the spring we will drive the enemy back to their miserable land. Those who do not retreat or surrender we will shoot dead, like dogs. It will be a glorious victory, and the people, they will chant my name in the streets. Yes, sir. You in the spineless west. Koltrov leaned forward, pointing at Carter and Logan in turn. You in the West think we are only winning because you send us tanks and missiles, but that is an illusion, it is a lie, you tell each other, to make yourselves feel better. We do not have as many tanks as the enemy, we do not have as many planes or drones, we do not have nuclear bombs or submarines, but still we beat the enemy. And do you know why? No, sir. It is not tanks or rockets that will decide the outcome of this war. It is the heroic efforts of our men. And women, Koltrov said, nodding at Zinchenko. That will defeat the dictator. 
It is their blood being spilled, while your leaders sit in their comfortable offices, congratulating themselves on sending us another plain load of bullets. He wagged a finger at Carter, like a teacher berating a student, before he continued. This is why the soldiers love me. I understand the sacrifices they are making. And yet I must ask them to do it again and again. Do you know why? No, sir. Because it is necessary. Because it is the only way to win. He thumped his fist into the palm of his other hand. That is why I insist on sharing the risks of my men, you see? I think so, sir. It is important you know this now. I will tell you what I have told the others. Do not try to change my mind. I will not be forced to hide in a bunker like a coward, Koltrov said, scowling in disgust. I will visit my troops. I will stand among them. I will share their deprivations and congratulate them on their bravery and urge them to keep up their spirits because, without me, they are nothing. They are lost children. My itinerary is not up for debate. Clear? Yes, sir. Very good. Koltrov nodded and sat back, arms folded, satisfied that he had won the argument. How long have you been in the SAS? he asked, after a pause of silence. Nine years, sir. Good soldiers, dedicated, tough, almost as good as our own special forces. Yes, sir, Carter bullshitted. In the rearview mirror, he caught sight of Zinchenko busily typing out messages, her face lit up by the bluish glow of her phone screen. Makarenko stared out of the side window. No doubt the pair of them had learned to tune out whenever their general went on one of his long rants. It is a waste, Koltrov added miserably. Sorry, sir? Your politicians... They refuse to let you fight with us. You and your comrades, you should be in the East, helping us to eliminate the Russians. Instead, you must act as my chauffeur. Maybe they're worried about escalation, sir. Nuclear war and all that. Koltrov snorted out a laugh. <laughs> the Russians wouldn't dare go down that road. They might, if they're desperate. Never, the general retorted with feeling. Their president hasn't got the guts. He is a strong man, they say, but that is a lie. He is secretly afraid, like all bullies. Carter said, Even if he is bluffing, it doesn't matter. The only thing is whether people believe him, sir. The general wrinkled his nose in contempt. Your prime minister is not a fool. The leaders of Germany, France, America... These are not stupid people. They know Russia is not serious about using nuclear weapons. That is not the reason they do not allow you to fight. No. The true reason they do not let you take up arms alongside our soldiers is because your leaders do not wish to have their citizens' blood on their hands. That is why we are fighting alone against an enemy with an army ten times the size of ours. Because your politicians have no backbone. Carter nodded, but stayed quiet. He had wondered why the general had taken a keen interest in him. Senior officers didn't usually pay much attention to their BG details. But now he understood. Koltrov liked the sound of his own voice. He clearly enjoyed lecturing his men, offering his opinions, railing against his perceived enemies. He seemed more like a populist politician than a military commander. They celebrate our heroism, even as they buy Russian gas. They tell us to make peace with the invaders, even as they rape our women, torture our soldiers, and send our people to die in their camps. You let them steal our lands, commit genocide, and in return, you send us a few malfunctioning weapons and hang flags outside your houses. It is the sign of a civilization rotten to the core. It makes me sick. Koltrov carried on. Why should we die while your citizens enjoy their lives as normal, laughing and drinking with families and friends? Ukraine has suffered enough in its past. Why should we not just say to Russia, OK, Ukraine is yours, take it if you must, 
but only if you promise to drop your bombs on Munich and Paris and London. Then we make Russia your problem. Why not? Don't know, sir. You have no opinion on this? Carter shrugged. I try to stay out of politics. Not my bag, sir. Then you are a wise man. I wish I could do the same. I wish to be a simple soldier, like the old days. But now I am a general fighting to save my people from genocide. In my world, everything is politics. A thought prodded at the base of Carter's skull. What about that nuclear plant the Russians have attacked? Holovika? What about it? Why bother shelling it? What's the point unless they're serious about blowing it up? The general smiled weakly. It is another bluff. The Russians have no interest in destroying Holovika, no. When they shell the complex, they are careful not to damage any of the critical infrastructure. But there must be a reason why they're bombing it. Of course, the Russians want Holovika for the same reason they have captured the other plants. Not to blow them up, but to use them to store their weapons. Artillery, rockets, ammunition. They know that our planes would never bomb these places. The general leaned forward. He went on. Tell me this, a man who was willing to risk nuclear catastrophe. Would such a man use our plants as warehouses for his most prized weaponry? Guess not, sir. Exactly. Koltrov sat back and nodded. You see, the Russian president is not as crazy as he looks on the TV. Even he is not mad enough to start a nuclear war. Chapter 16 They ploughed on towards the city. After a short time, the traffic thickened, and long rows of concrete towers sprouted out of the horizon, like something out of a children's pop-up book. They were barrelling through the fringes of Kiev now. A place fighting for its existence, thought Carter, though it didn't much look like it. There were billboards carrying faded posters for Czech beer and South Korean SUVs, bustling cafes and shops, people out riding bicycles or walking their dogs or chatting on their phones. Two million citizens trying to get on with their lives as best they could. The convoy rolled on for five kilometres, came off the main carriageway, followed the slip road as it looped round, then rattled north for a spell through downtown Kiev. They passed rows of 19th century apartments, public parks, tired-looking shopping malls, chain coffee shops, lakes glinting like metal beneath the pallid sun. On the surface, the city seemed normal, but looked close enough and there were cracks in the facade. The heaps of sandbags stacked around the checkpoints, the monuments encased in wooden boxes to protect them from infrequent bombing, the chunks of concrete gouged out of the side of high-rise blocks. In front of one building, a gang of kids played atop an abandoned Russian tank with a white Z painted down the side. Close by, a mechanical digger was backfilling a damaged section of the road. In the back seats, Zinchenko and Koltrov were having a heated discussion, something to do with an urgent media request from an American newspaper. That was as much as Carter could understand, given his limited grasp of Ukrainian. They were arguing the pros and cons of accepting the interview, publicity versus the logistical complications. Zinchenko had her reservations, but the general was adamant he wanted to do it. Makarenko repeatedly checked his phone and made calls, coordinating with the surveillance team monitoring the suspect. Logan stayed close to the suburban in front, driving almost bumper to bumper as they hugged the outside lane. Behind them, the team in the rearmost wagon stuck to the middle lane, positioning themselves so they could accelerate forward in the event of an ambush and engage the enemy, instead of being trapped at the back of the logjam. Every time they hit a set of lights, they went through the same routine. Carter looked round at the surrounding streets, right hand gripping the M4 trigger mechanism, left hand primed on the door handle, ready to lever it open at the slightest sign of danger but the area remained mercifully clear of threats. Logan took another clockwise loop in the road, following the lead wagon as it shuttled south across a traffic-clogged flyover. 
Zinchenko and the general abruptly halted their conversation, and Carter knew they were no more than a minute out from the target location. They motored down a wide boulevard, decrepit Soviet blocks on the left, grand neoclassical residences on the right. The brake lights on the front wagon flared as it swiftly dropped its speed. The blinkers signalled a right turn, and then they eased to a halt in front of the heavily guarded entrance to the Ministry of Defence. Sandbags had been arranged in a horseshoe formation either side of the front gate. A group of soldiers were milling about next to a slate-roofed sentry post. Two of the Ukrainian soldiers cautiously approached the front suburban, while their mates hung back. Carter swept his eyes left and right, alert to the possibility of an ambush. Specifically, he was looking for anything out of the ordinary. A van or car parked where it shouldn't be. Someone on foot, taking an interest in the convoy. Anything at all. But the scene was quiet. Mid-morning traffic rumbled along the road. People were cycling, or waiting for buses, or carrying bags of shopping. An ordinary tableau of city life. Several moments later, the guards stepped back from the suburban. The gates groaned open, the boom barriers lifted, and the convoy followed the road as it sheared off to the right towards an immense four-storey building with a pastel blue façade and long wings projecting from either side of the central structure. Marbled colonnades, fondant white and tall as NASA rockets, ran along the length of the main section below an ornately decorated pediment like a temple in ancient Greece. On the rooftop, a Ukrainian flag flickered tongue-like in the stiffening breeze. Another group of soldiers stood guard in front of the building, next to some sort of war monument. Reckon we'll be safe enough here, said Logan, as he pulled up behind the first suburban. Looks like we've got half the army to protect us. We'll see. The men pulled up their face coverings over their nostrils and exited the Chevy. Carter swung round to the rear passenger door and levered it open. Zinchenko got out first, with Koltrov and Makarenko following close behind. One of the soldiers recognised the general and called out to his mates. Almost immediately, they crowded round Koltrov, excitedly shouting his name, some reaching out to shake his hand, while others took snaps on their phones. More soldiers appeared from inside the building, abandoning their posts to catch a glimpse of the great man himself. By now, McVeigh, Webb, Popov and the rest of the Ukrainian bodyguards had exited their respective vehicles. They swiftly rushed over and tried to form a protective cordon around the principal, but with the tight press of bodies, it was impossible to shove their way through. Carter bellowed at the mob, ordering them to get back but Koltrov shot him a scathing look. No, no, he said. It is fine. Let them say hello. These are my boys. A wave of anger swept through Carter. He clamped his jaw shut, suppressing an urge to argue with Koltrov as the soldiers swarmed round him, like fans greeting a celebrity at a film premiere. Koltrov seemed in no hurry to head inside. He shook the hand of each man, laughed at something one of them said, smiled patiently for photos. The guy was in his element. Koltrov wasn't kidding, he thought. The guy isn't just a famous general, he's a bloody rock star. This is a fucking nightmare, he muttered. At his side, Logan nodded wearily. Told you, mate, now do you believe me? Carter offered no reply. He was trying to get his head around the security risks. Just getting Koltrov from his vehicle to the front of the Ministry of Defence building had descended into chaos, which prompted a question. If this is what happens in a heavily defended government HQ, how the fuck are we supposed to protect him in the street? I don't know, Carter thought grimly. But if we can't persuade the guy to curb his behaviour, he won't last very long. At last, the general held up his hands and addressed the gathered soldiers, pointing to the main entrance to the defence ministry, as if to say, I must attend to business, my friends. The crowd reluctantly parted. Koltrov scraped a hand through his grey-tinged hair and turned to Carter. OK, he said. Now I am ready. Carter beckoned to Popov. We're moving inside with the principal, he said. Stay here with your men. 
You see or hear anything, anything at all, alert us over the radio. Popoff nodded and bellowed at his men. Carter and Logan climbed the steps leading to the porticoed entrance, moving alongside the general. Makarenko and Zinchenko fell into step a couple of paces behind, with McVeigh and Webb pulling up the rear. Two soldiers in ceremonial dress uniform stood washboard erect either side of a set of tall walnut double doors. Koltrov paused in the doorway and narrowed his eye at one of the guards. He said a few words to the man. The soldier blinked in astonishment, and it took him a moment to compose himself before he replied. The general said something else and smiled paternally, patting the guard on the arm. The latter grinned, beaming from ear to ear as Koltrov moved on. What was all that about? Carter asked. That man used to serve under me, seven years ago in the war in the Donbass, when I was a colonel, Private Alexei Lunin. He has a sister who teaches at the university. I was just telling him what a pleasure it is to see him here. And you remembered his name? Koltrov gave a faint smile. These men are my boys. They are prepared to lay down their lives for me, for us. The least I can do is remember the names of such brave young men. Your officers in the SAS are the same, no? Not exactly, Carter muttered. They swept through the doors and entered a high-ceilinged lobby, the polished marble floor emblazoned with the Ukrainian coat of arms of a trident laid over a shield. Dust motes danced in the shafts of sunlight pouring through the glass-domed rooftop. Important-looking men and women in suits sat on rows of fabric sofas to one side of the reception desk, visitor passes dangling from the lanyards around their necks. Another guard ushered the new arrivals past a bank of metal detectors and security turnstiles, and led them towards a set of lifts on the far side of the lobby. Carter, Logan, Koltrov and the others crammed into the next available lift and rode up to the third floor. The doors opened with a polite ping, and they found themselves in a long corridor that looked like it had been modelled on Versailles. Parquet flooring, gold-leafed cornicing, giltwood side tables and chairs that probably cost more than Carter's life earnings. Row of offices to the left, tall arched windows on the right overlooking the grounds of the ministry building. They continued until they hit the office at the end of the corridor. Koltrov wrapped his knuckles once, thrust the door open without waiting for a response, and stepped inside a richly furnished office. Oriental rugs covered much of the floor. There was a plush sofa to one side of the doorway, a built-in bookcase against one wall filled with leather-bound volumes. Framed pictures showed the minister pressing the flesh with various foreign dignitaries. To the right, a separate door led into an adjoining office, Andrei Butko's private quarters. A platinum blonde secretary in thick-rimmed glasses sat at a desk at the other end of the room, fielding a phone call on her headset while she tapped away on a keyboard. As the arrest party entered the outer office, the secretary stopped what she was doing and looked up, regarding them suspiciously, playing the role of gatekeeper like PAs the world over. She jabbered something at them in Ukrainian. What's she saying? Logan asked. She wants to know if we've got an appointment, Carter said. McVeigh laughed. We're door kickers, love. We don't need one. Although Carter had spent time in Ukraine, training up SF operators, several years had passed since then, and he could remember only a handful of words and phrases. He could issue commands to soldiers, order a pint in a bar, or ask a passerby for directions. Following the thread of the conversation between Koltrov and the secretary, however, was impossible. He recognised a few words in the general's response, and guessed he was telling the secretary, We are here to speak with the minister. Don't stand in our way. Or words to that effect. The rest was lost on him. The secretary started to argue, then closed her mouth again. Reconsidering her position, reality kicked in. She was up against a three-star general and four British soldiers packing rifles. No contest. She returned her gaze to her computer screen, pretending to busy herself while the drama unfolded around her. 
Koltrov nodded at Carter and said, I will go in with Makarenko to make the arrest. You shall wait here with your men and Zinchenko, okay? Yes, sir. This won't take long. The general started across the room to the second door, Makarenko following hard on his heels. The two IC stopped in front of the doorway and crashed the minister's office. From where he was standing, Carter had a direct line of sight to Butko himself. The guy was sitting on a throne-like chair, elbows propped on the leather blotter covering his desk. Sheaf of papers in front of him, a huge image of a golden lion and a Cossack on the wall at his back. A short, squat woman in a black trouser suit and heels sat in the chair to one side of the desk, the SDU chief. The minister and the chief instantly snapped their gazes towards Koltrov and Makarenko. The general stood just inside the threshold and addressed the SDU chief. You can leave us now, he was saying. She didn't need any further encouragement. She hastily gathered up her belongings and hurried out of the room, brushing past Sinchenko as she headed for the corridor. The secretary watched the scene with growing anxiety. In the inner office, Butko rose to his feet, a look of bewilderment on his face. The general announced himself in a calm, measured tone, asserting his authority, taking control of the situation. Makarenko stood next to his boss, his right hand resting on the butt of his holstered pistol. Butko stammered a reply and shook his head angrily. Koltrov remained zen calm. He spoke for maybe thirty seconds. Carter, unable to follow the conversation, leaned towards Zinchenko and said in a low voice, What's happening? The general is telling the minister that the game is up. He says he should come quietly, not to make a fuss. Zinchenko uttered something at the secretary and jabbed a finger at the door. Her meaning was clear enough. Leave. Now. The secretary glanced tearfully at her boss. Then she logged off her computer, removed the headset, slid out from behind her desk and snatched up her phone and bag and started for the corridor. She paused again in the doorway, looked back at the press officer and said something to her in a distressed voice before she turned on her heels and left. Why was she in a flap? Carter asked. The corners of Zinchenko's lips curved up into a thin smile. She said the minister is the most loyal person she has ever known. She says he would never betray his country. She says he is innocent. Maybe she's right. No, she has been fooled. We have evidence of him stealing money. Doesn't mean he's a traitor. Hostility flashed in Zinchenko's eyes. You don't understand. This is how these people work. They earn the trust of others by making a great display of their loyalty and affection for their country, so that no one will suspect them of betraying our cause. But in secret, they are selling information to the enemy. Information that kills our soldiers, so that they can buy themselves a luxury villa or a new yacht. Carter skimmed his gaze back to the inner office. Butko looked petrified. He backed away from the two officers and retreated towards the wall, putting physical distance between himself and his accusers. Koltrov took a step towards the minister and spoke softly, holding up his hands in a gesture of peace. He sounded like a guy talking an old friend out of driving home from the pub after one too many pints, playing the role of the nice cop. Makarenko stood alongside his boss, boxing the minister in. Koltrov took another half-step towards the man, still speaking in a measured tone of voice. He sounded rational, Carter thought, even if he couldn't understand what he was saying. Butko shouted at the general, repeating the same word over and over. Carter recognized it. Innocent. I'm innocent, Butko was saying. Then Makarenko sprang forward and threw a punch at him. The blow struck Butko squarely on the jaw. He let out a pained grunt and stumbled backwards, hands raised in a futile attempt to protect his face, as Makarenko lunged forward again, tearing into him with a flurry of vicious digs and jabs. Carter saw him unloading a low punch to the minister's midriff. The guy jackknifed and keeled over, gasping for air.
a moment before the colonel rugby tackled him to the floor. Both men crash-landed on the silk rug, trading blows. Makarenko managed to roll Butko onto his chest, pinning him down while he cinched his wrists behind his back with a pair of plastic cuffs. Butko kicked out wildly, writhing beneath the colonel's weight as he hurled a torrent of abuse at the general, cursing the man. Makarenko picked himself off the floor. Koltrov calmly approached the minister and swung a boot, kicking him in the ribs. Butko groaned in agony, begging for mercy. Shut up, dog, the general rasped. Traitor! Koltrov booted the man repeatedly, striking him in the face and chest, while the colonel filmed the action on his phone. Carter started towards the office, intent on putting a stop to the beating, but Logan grabbed hold of his arm and held him back. No, Jody, don't. Carter relented. In the office, the general gave Butko a final kick to the jaw before he stepped back, shoulders heaving up and down as he caught his breath. Butko lay whimpering at his feet, blood gushing out of his nose and mouth. Koltrov dabbed his sweat-glossed forehead with a handkerchief, while Makarenko whipped out a hood from his jacket pocket and slipped it over Butko's face, muffling his soft cries. The colonel hauled Butko to his feet and promptly marched him out of the office, into the outer room, where Carter, Zinchenko and the others stood waiting. Koltrov, breathing hard, nodded at Carter. Okay, it is done. Carter stared at him. What the fuck just happened? Suspect resisted arrest, Makarenko said coolly. We gave him the chance to surrender and come with us peacefully, but he refused, so we roughed him up, encouraged him to cooperate. He grinned. He did more than that. Jesus Christ, you fucking battered him. General Koltrov glowered at the Briton. This son of a bitch does not deserve your sympathy. Or have you forgotten what the Russians have done to us over the years? The bombs they have dropped, the civilians they have killed. Koltrov's cheeks were burning feverishly. Carter could almost feel the anger coming off him in waves. Carter remembered what Koltrov had told him in the car, the hatred he and his fellow Ukrainians had for the invaders, how they would rather lose their tongues than speak Russian again. These guys don't mess around, Carter thought. They must really despise the enemy. Logan gave the minister a quick pat-down, searching his pockets. He's clean, he said, rising to his feet. Not an on him. You'll have to delete that footage. Carter said, addressing himself to Colonel Makarenko. What for? You lose your phone, or send that video to someone, and that shite will end up online. Once that happens, you'll lose all credibility. Koltrov looked amused. He said, You don't know my people very well. They cannot get enough of my videos. They like to see me taking revenge on those who would destroy us. It's not the Ukrainians I'm worried about. It's the people back home. You could land us in a world of shit if this leaks. The general stared at him. Carter stared right back. Mexican standoff. Then Koltrov parted his lips into a curious smile. As you wish. I will make sure Anton deletes the footage. He flashed a strange smile. Then he said, We've wasted enough time here. Let's get this piece of shit to the station. Voices echoed down the corridor as workers from the surrounding offices wandered over to see what was going on. Webb ducked out of the doorway and shouted at them to stay back, while Carter got on the comms channel to pop off. He said, Arrest has been made, Captain. Repeat, we have the target. We're leaving the building in minutes one. Okay. All clear down there? Yes came the hesitant reply. Just lots of people who wish to meet the general before he leaves. Fuck's sake, McVeigh groused. Just what we need. Tell them to disperse, Carter said over the net. We need a clear path to them wagons when we step outside the building. Got that? Yes, uh, all clear. Carter cleared his throat and ordered the team to get moving. 
McVeigh and Zinchenko led the way out of the room, moving into the corridor, where Webb stood acting as a one-man barricade, blocking the view of the ministerial staff. General Koltrov walked just behind his press officer, Butko staggering along in his wake. His hooded head lowered, shoulders noticeably sagging, the look of a broken man. Then came Makarenko at his six o'clock, one hand resting on his side-holstered weapon, ready to plug the suspect if he tried to make a run for it. Carter and Logan started to follow the colonel, bringing up the rear of the crocodile. "'Let's hope we don't have another scrum on the steps,' Logan muttered as they paced back down the corridor towards the lift. "'I could do without a reunion with the general's fan club on the way out.' "'Same here.' Carter pursed his lips and said uneasily, "'Are you okay with this, mate?' Logan chortled. "'This is not Wait till you see the general's famous interrogation techniques.' Carter said quietly, we shouldn't be endorsing this. This is how these guys roll. Big boys rules. Logan flinched and raised his eyebrows in surprise. Jesus, don't tell me you actually feel sorry for that cunt, Geordie. Carter said nothing. Look, this is none of our business. Logan carried on as they neared the lift. We're here to protect the principal, that's all. What he does with the likes of Butko is down to him. It's wrong, Carter murmured. This could backfire on us. Roughing up a few enemies. Who's going to give a shit about that? Logan sighed and said, This is their show, mate, not ours. They're the ones fighting for their lives. You want my advice as a friend? Keep your mouth shut and look the other way. Just stay out of it. Fine. I mean it, Geordie. You're in the last chance saloon here, mate. Try not to fuck it up. Chapter 17 The police station was situated midway down a side street, in a shabby part of town, three kilometres southeast of the Ministry of Defence. The district was tattered and run down, exactly as McVeigh had described it. Grungy, well out of the way of the busiest areas. Steel grey apartment blocks rubbed shoulders with boarded up shop fronts and vacant buildings, the bare concrete walls covered with graffiti. A sad patch of overgrown grass and weeds enclosed within a chain link fence constituted the local greenery. As they neared the station, Carter remembered what Logan had told him on the drive across the border from Poland the fate of those guilty of working for Russia. Bullet in the back of the head, unmarked grave, he thought. If this is how the general and his men are prepared to act in front of us, what are they getting up to when no one is watching? He didn't feel any sympathy for the minister. The guy was a traitor to his own kind. He had it coming, pure and simple. But if Koltrov and his team were going rogue, torturing their own citizens and committing war crimes, that could cause problems for the regiment. Not for a while, perhaps not for years. But at some point, once the dust had settled on the conflict... Someone would inevitably start asking questions about the conduct of General Koltrov and his quest to eradicate fifth columnists inside Ukraine. His behaviour could become a liability to the Ukrainians and the wider war effort, which could lead to some awkward questions about his British bodyguards. There were two sides to any war Carter knew. There was the campaign on the ground, fought with bullets and drones and tanks, but there was also a shadow war, contested online, and in the media, a struggle for public opinion. The Ukrainians were winning that fight, but if they vacated the moral high ground, things might change, with the regiment as collateral damage. The SAS could easily get caught up in the scandal as a willing accomplice to politically sanctioned assassination and torture, tainted by association. There would be double-page reports in the papers. Legal experts interviewed on the evening news, giving their opinions, calling for a public inquiry or a criminal investigation. The head shed wouldn't be able to sweep the story under the rug. Not this time. The Suburbans arrived in front of a drab four-story building, opposite a seedy-looking bar. A few old bangers were parked in a rough gravel lot next to the establishment. Broken glass sprinkled the asphalt. Food wrappers tumbleweeded across the street. Mid-morning, 
and the neighborhood was practically deserted. Logan tailed the lead suburban as it rolled past the main entrance, before easing to a halt in front of a cantilevered gate at the side of the station building. Security cameras had been mounted on the posts either side of the access ramp. Barbed wire ran across the top of the brick wall. Signs warned off would-be trespassers. Makarenko made a quick call on his phone. They waited. Then the galvanized steel gate slid back on its tracks with a motorized whir, and the convoy steered through the opening and parked in a row of empty spaces next to the liveried cop cars. Boots thudded on the ground as the twelve bodyguards disembarked from their respective wagons. Koltrov emerged from the rear of the Suburban, shoving Butko ahead of him. He staggered out of the vehicle, stumbled on the blacktop, and almost fell over, before Makarenko grabbed hold of him. The colonel kept a firm hold of the minister, while Carter took Popov to one side. Carter said through his face covering, We'll accompany the principal inside the station. You and Sergeant Horbach will lead the way, he added, nodding at Popov's deputy. Me and the guys will follow behind. And the rest of my men? Tell them to wait here. Cordon duty. Same set up as before. There won't be any threat to the general, but it's better than having them standing around and getting bored out of their minds. Okay. Carter held the captain's gaze. What's the deal with the plod? Plod? Popov looked at him blankly. Police. Is the general likely to be mobbed once we get inside? I would say so, yes. The police love General Koltrov almost as much as his own soldiers. Popov dished out orders to his guys, then fell into step with Sergeant Horbach and Koltrov as they made for an unmarked metal door at the rear of the station. Makarenko slow walked the suspect in the same direction, with Carter, Logan, Webb, and McVeigh moving line abreast at the Colonel Six. They stopped in front of the entrance, waited, looked up at the security cameras mounted to the wall above. There was a brief pause, followed by a dull clanking noise from the other side as the door unbolted. The door swung outwards. A podgy cop with a belt-holstered pistol stood inside the doorway, grinning and staring admiringly at Koltrov. He ushered them inside a dully lit corridor, long and narrow, like a submarine, with a series of reinforced cell doors down either side. A rancid odour of piss, vomit and antiseptic greeted Carter as he followed the rest of the group into the station. Ahead of him, the beer-bellied cop led Koltrov down the corridor. Makarenko shoved Butko along, hissing at him in Ukrainian. They stopped in front of one of the cells on the right side of the corridor. The cop opened the door, and Makarenko bundled the minister into an interrogation room with a table in the middle, two rickety chairs arranged either side, harsh ceiling lights and metal bars on the window. By now, word of Koltrov's arrival had spread through the building. Uniformed cops and plainclothes staff approached the general, pumping his hand or applauding him. Others stood back from the melee content to take snaps on their phones. Koltrov took it all in his stride, patiently smiling and joking with the cops, making them feel like they were the most important people in the world. He was about to question a Russian collaborator, but he looked totally at ease, thought Carter, like a football star parading himself before the fans ahead of a cup final. He had that special mixture of charisma, authority and relatability that politicians spent their entire professional lives trying to learn, but few ever mastered. Fuck me, Carter said quietly as the general posed for a selfie with one of his supporters. This is mental. Logan chuckled. You should see him when he visits an army base on the front line. Never known anything like it. Everyone loves him, except the obvious. Who? Who do you think? The big man? Voloshin. They don't get on. That's putting it mildly. They can't stand one another. Worst kept secret in Kiev. Voloshin hates the idea of someone else hogging the limelight. This guy. Logan tipped his head at the general. This guy might be a razor sharp commander, but don't be fooled. He's media savvy. He's a potential rival, and the president knows it. You think he's the next leader? For sure. 
If Veloshin gets taken out, this guy is claiming the throne. I bet my mum's house on it. Can't be worth much, Carter joked. They sell houses for a quid up in Liverpool these days, don't they? Sod off, Geordie bastard. As he spoke, a senior officer marched over from the front of the building, bellowing at the assembled throng, and the cops swiftly returned to their duties. The general beckoned to Carter and said, You and your men will wait here with Captain Popov and Sergeant Horbach. I will question this treacherous snake myself. How long is this going to take? Depends on the minister. If he is prepared to cooperate, then it will be over quite soon. A few hours, maybe less. What if he refuses? Then we will have to persuade him to talk. But he will tell us what he knows. They always do, in the end. Even the ones who think they are brave end up screaming like children. At his side, Popov was grinning wickedly. Carter said, This guy should be tried in court. That's the right way to do this, sir. Koltrov laughed absurdly. We are fighting a war. The rule of law does not exist, not here, not anymore. For the Russians also this is true. They do not respect the right of our people to exist. Doesn't mean you have to be like them. A dark look crept across the general's face. Something hard glinted in his good eye, like the tip of a knife catching the light. That is easy for you to say, you English who live on an island. You do not have neighbors who wish to exterminate you. Men such as Butko have betrayed their own blood, their own people. The only law they understand is the one that comes from the business end of a gun. Do not lecture me on how to handle them. He glowered at Carter for a moment longer, barked at Popov in his native Ukrainian. Then he turned and ducked into the room. Through the opening, Carter caught a glimpse of the defence minister. He sat on the metal chair beneath the window, chest heaving up and down, while Makarenko watched over him, arms folded across his chest. Koltrov snapped an order. The colonel produced a box-cutter knife from his side pocket, sliced through the prisoner's plastic cuffs, and tore off his hood. Butko squinted under the stark glare of the lighting. He looked anxiously at his interrogators, his forehead glossed with sweat, his eyes wide with terror. He started babbling at Koltrov and Makarenko in a strained voice, talking rapidly. Carter couldn't understand what Butko was saying, but it sounded like he was pleading with them. Koltrov ignored the minister. He calmly removed his army jacket, draped it over the back of one of the empty chairs, and rolled his shirt sleeves up to his elbows, cracking his knuckles. Butko realized what was happening— his eyes darted frantically around the room, as if searching for a way to escape. The general started to close the door. Carter jammed his foot against the frame, stopping Koltrov from shutting it. The general's features tightened. What the fuck do you think you're doing? This door has to stay open, Carter said. Standard procedure, sir. Absolutely not. This is a private interview. Take your foot away this instant. No, sir. Koltrov stepped into his personal space, his face bristling with anger. Do you want these people to hear of our shame? He flapped a hand at a gaggle of cops further down the corridor, wandering in and out of offices. This man, Butko, is a disgrace to his fellow countrymen. Sorry, sir. I've got my orders to keep an eye on you at all times. I'm giving you an order, you fucking idiot. Koltrov looked round and dropped his voice so low it was practically crawling on the floor. This man is going to provide us with information, highly confidential information, related to my investigation. I cannot afford the risk of a leak. Do you understand? You don't trust us, sir. In my line of work, I trust no one. At least keep him in cuffs, then. Out of the question, I like the suspects to feel at ease during our... conversations. Make them relax. I find it helps to catch them off balance when we begin asking them the difficult questions. Now step back and let me do my fucking job. Carter hesitated for a moment, then he admitted defeat and withdrew his foot from the gap. 
Behind Koltrov, the minister continued to plead in desperation with Makarenko. The front of his shirt was drenched with sweat patches. Wait here, the general said, his voice eerily calm. This won't take long, I hope. The door slammed shut. Carter stepped away and took up a position with Logan to the side of the door. Horbach and Popov stood further away, chatting among themselves. Logan lowered his voice to a hiss. Are you fucking stupid, lad? Or are you deliberately trying to sabotage the op? Carter stood his ground. The guy is out of control. Him and his ass-kissing subordinate. So what? No one's going to be shedding tears over a few traitors getting clipped for fuck's sake. Not now, maybe. Not while the momentum is with the Ukrainians. But things can change. A few years from now, if this ever comes out, we could end up being charged with war crimes. They can't hang any of that shit on us, Logan protested. We're just in attendance, overseeing his security. What he gets up to is nothing to do with us. Try telling that to a judge at The Hague. Logan stared at him. Get away with you, you fucking paranoid man. Am I? What about them dinosaurs who operated in Northern Ireland? That was decades ago, and they're being dragged back now. This shit always comes back to haunt you. He's got a point, McVeigh admitted after a beat. Carter turned to him. How long has this shit been going on, Billy? Since day one? We think, Webb said. We don't know that for sure. He looked towards McVeigh, who said, The general and his team kept it on the down low in the beginning. Last few months they've upped the ante, getting more extreme. And careless, Webb added. So what? Logan said. How would anyone even find out what they're doing for fuck's sake? Loose tongues, Carter said. Or leaked footage. Could be any number of ways. He was thinking of Makarenko, filming the defence minister in his office, taking a beating from Koltrov. He wondered how many similar videos the colonel had taken in the past, how many had ended up online or on the phones of other officers. All it takes, he went on, is someone getting caught on camera, giving some suspect the crocodile clip treatment to the balls, and suddenly we're on the front pages for all the wrong reasons. It's not just the general either, said Webb. The others looked towards him. The giant Brummy glanced down the corridor, making sure the Ukrainians were out of earshot before he continued. The other day, I overheard Popov in the canteen with his mates, bragging about how they went to town on the last guy we arrested. Did all kinds of sick shit to him. Said he wished he'd filmed it as a memento. But we haven't done anything, Logan protested. Not personally. We're not even allowed in the room during the interrogations. Do you think the journalists will make that distinction, after all that shit blew up about Afghan? Carter had been thinking while he listened to the exchange, weighing up his options, trying to figure out how to preserve the regiment's reputation. He said, We'll have to send a report to the head shed, soon as we're back at camp. Give him the heads up. What difference would that make? Logan threw up his arms. It's not going to stop the general from getting medieval on the suspects, is it? Carter said slowly, I want it down on paper that we challenged the general and his team and made clear our opposition to his interrogation methods. I want our arses covered in case we get a knock on the door from the cops ten years from now wanting to have a quiet word with us. This is bollocks, Geordie. Nothing will happen. Maybe not, but I ain't taking chances. I don't know about you, but I could do without this grief. He eyeballed Logan. This is your fault. Me? What the fuck do you mean? You should have flagged this up the moment you realised something fishy was going on. Get off me back, Geordie. Logan swiped a hand, as if swatting away a wasp. I was just following orders. So were the Germans, eighty years ago. The rage swelled inside Carter's chest. It's bad enough having to deal with the system at Hereford. I don't need this hassle in my life as well. Logan stared at him. Carter thought the guy might get pissy with him, but then he moved away and took up his position to the right of the door, next to Webb. Carter stood next to McVeigh on the other side of the door, 
fuming through the material of his face covering. I'll be glad when this job is finally over. He was facing the prospect of months operating in the crucible of Ukraine, nurse-maiding a politically ambitious general with scant regard for his own life and a penchant for torture. It'll be a minor miracle if I get through this mission without giving the block a fucking slap. The station was stifling hot. Someone had cranked the heating up to furnace levels. Carter was sweating hard, entombed inside his ballistic helmet, body armour, face mask and gloves. The cloth material covering his mouth made it hard to breathe, irritating his lungs. He beckoned to Sergeant Horbach, asked him for a brew in clumsy Ukrainian. The bodyguard looked at him uncomprehendingly. Carter tried again and mimed drinking a mug of tea. Horbach got it on the second attempt, gave a big thumbs up and started down the corridor. See if you can get them to turn the temperature down too, Logan called out to him. We're sweating like scientists at an anti-vaxxer protest over here, like. Minutes passed. The four SAS soldiers hung around outside the room, listening to the muted voices coming from within. Popov stood at a distance, shooting the shit with a police officer. Horbach returned, clutching four plastic bottles of water. Not the refreshing brew he had been looking forward to, but better than nothing. He twisted the screw cap, lowered his face covering, and took a long pull, relieving his parched throat. One o'clock. Four hours since they had left the base at Novichanka. Three hours since they had made the arrest. Carter resigned himself to a long stretch of doing nothing but standing around and waiting, bodyguarding duties, the less glamorous side of SAS operations. Hours of boredom, the same daily routine, ferrying the principal from place to place, listening to their bullshit. Seven minutes later, Carter heard a distinct grating noise coming from the other side of the metal door, what sounded like the scraping of chair legs against the bare cement floor. The voices grew louder. There was a chorus of shouts, followed by a stifled cry of despair, and a loud crashing sound. Then, the bark of a gunshot. Chapter 18 Carter reacted in an instant. He lunged for the door, wrenched the stainless steel handle, and plunged headlong into the interrogation room, gripping his rifle at his side, eyes sweeping from left to right, McVeigh, Logan, Webb, and the two Ukrainians hard on his heels. Then he saw the body and stopped dead. Andre Butko lay sprawled on the floor, a hole in the middle of his forehead. Blood and bone fragments and brain matter slicked down the wall behind the lifeless defence minister. In his limp right hand was a compact PSM pistol, easily identifiable owing to its slender profile, stubby barrel and steel-sheathed frame. Chambered for the 545 by 18 millimeter Soviet round, Favoured handgun of high-ranking KGB officers because its small size made it easy to conceal. Koltrov and Makarenko were standing over the minister. The colonel held his glock in a two-handed grip, arms extended. Barrel trained at the suspect slumped on the floor. Shit, McVeigh said as he drew up next to Logan and Carter. Popov barged inside the cell after the regiment men. He halted inside the doorway eyes flitting quickly between Butko and the general. Carter lowered his M4. Are you okay? Sir. The general didn't appear to have heard him. He stared at Butko, unblinking, as if transfixed by the blood pulsing out of the exit wound in the back of his head. Sir, are you hurt? Koltrov snapped out of his stupor. Fine, he said hoarsely. I'm fine. In the corridor, the pounding of footsteps grew louder as the police officers rushed over to investigate the commotion. A burly cop hurried inside the interrogation room and dropped to a knee beside the minister. Someone else shouted for an ambulance. Above the gaggle of voices, Carter heard Sergeant Horbach's booming voice ordering the cops to stay back. At the same time, Webb was speaking into his radio mic, reporting to the Ukrainian BGs waiting outside the police station. Shots fired! Shots fired! He reported. Stay where you are. Repeat, stay in your positions. No one moves unless we tell you otherwise. 
What happened? Carter demanded. It seems, Koltrov said, without taking his gaze off Butko. It seems we underestimated the minister. Makarenko reholstered his Glock, he said coolly. Suspect had a weapon concealed on his person. He was going to shoot the general, so I engaged, neutralized the threat. Shit. Koltrov was still gazing at the corpse. It is fortunate that the colonel was in the room with me just now. He saved my life. Otherwise... His voice trailed. He turned towards Carter with barely suppressed rage. This was your fuck-up, he said. Carter jerked his head back. Fuck off. Koltrov stepped towards him and snorted through flared nostrils. Your men had the responsibility for searching the suspect. If they had been doing their jobs properly, they would have found the pistol. No way. Logan shook his head furiously. Geordie, I swear to God, I checked that guy twice over before we bugged out of his office. He didn't have fuck all on him. Then how do you explain this? Koltrov gestured to the PSM in Butko's hand. I don't... I don't know. Carter glared at the general. You can't pin this on us. You should have taken our advice. If you had listened to us, he wouldn't be lying there with a hole in his fucking head. And I expect my men to do their jobs instead of complaining like little bitches. Carter drew in a sharp breath. It took every fibre of his being to control his temper. Last chance saloon, Geordie. Don't do anything to piss him off. Koltrov closed his good eye for a beat and exhaled. It does not matter. What is done is done. Besides, the minister told us everything we needed to know. He sang like a canary. That is the expression, yes? He spilled his guts. Already. Koltrov smiled cruelly. Like I said, my interrogation techniques never fail. What did he tell you? asked McVeigh. Carter interrupted the general and said, There's no time for that. We'll discuss everything later. The priority is getting you back safe and sound to the camp, sir. What about him? asked Logan. He indicated the defence minister. The blood had formed a gleaming puddle beneath his body, oozing outwards like an oil spill. Carter said, Not our problem. The cops can deal with it. The well-built officer who had been inspecting Butko's wounds stood upright and addressed himself to Popov, firing off a machine-gun burst of Ukrainian. What did he say? McVeigh asked the captain. He says they will need statements, from the general and from everyone else present at the scene, including us. He says there will need to be a full investigation. Carter said, Tell him to arrange it with the general's people. We can return and make statements on another day. Popov translated again. He waited for the officer's response, then said to Carter, He is afraid he cannot let us leave. He says it is unfortunate, but they must follow procedure. I don't give a fuck. Someone just tried to execute the general. We're leaving now, unless this bloke wants to be accountable for putting his life at risk. Carter didn't wait for the officer's response. He wasn't about to let some jumped-up Ukrainian copper dictate SOPs to him. He turned and swept into the corridor, gesturing for Popov and Horbach to lead the way, Koltrov, Makarenko and Zinchenko at their backs, Carter and the SAS men to the rear. The same formation they had used when entering the station. Meanwhile, Logan got on the net to the team outside, letting them know that they were about to exit the station. Heading straight back to base, he said. Repeat, Principal is heading back to base en route, Charlie. Suspect is dead, but Principal is unharmed. A gaggle of policemen and women had gathered in the corridor. Captain Popov hollered at them in Ukrainian, ordering them to make way for the general. Doesn't make any sense, Logan muttered through his face covering. I searched him thoroughly. The minister. The guy wasn't packing, Geordie. I'm fucking sure of it. So how did he get hold of the gun? Carter asked. I don't know. Logan shook his head again. All I know is, this gig just got even tougher. Too fucking right, Carter exhaled bitterly.
He lowered his voice. Between you and me, I'm starting to think that keeping this guy out of harm's way is an impossible job. They returned to Novichanka Air Base at two o'clock in the afternoon. The three-vehicle convoy took a different route out of Kiev, winding this way and that. But the scenery remained broadly the same. Carter and Logan said little during the ride. Koltrov spent most of the journey in a private conference with Makarenko, while Zinchenko sat hunched over her phone, fingers speedily dashing off messages. Carter wondered if she ever went more than five minutes without checking her phone. They hit the sandbagged checkpoint outside of Novichanka and went through the same routine they had followed that morning, but in reverse. Showed their ID cards to the soldiers guarding the approach to the town, carried on through Novichanka, and stopped again at the gatehouse in front of the airbase. There was another cursory examination of their ID cards. The convoy rolled on down the access road for half a kilometre before hitting the brakes outside Koltrov's private quarters. Logan kept the motor running while the general, Makarenko and Zinchenko disgorged themselves from the back of the Suburban. Once they were safely inside the building, the convoy pulled away again. They carried on for 200 metres towards the tarmacked area fronting the main accommodation block and parked up under the camo nets. The soldiers on both bodyguard teams debussed from the Suburbans and trooped towards the DOS house. Carter tore off his face covering and said, Sort out your kit. I'll meet you in the canteen in twenty. He started down the corridor. Where are you going? Logan asked. I need to brief Hereford, update them on the situation. The others headed upstairs, while Carter made for the small locked room with the fridge-sized safe and the weapons locker. He snatched up the sat phone from the docking station, punched in the number for the ops room at camp, and filed a report with the head shed, gave them the lowdown on the arrest of the defence minister, the interrogation, the attempt on the general's life. He made a special point of detailing the treatment of the suspect. He told them about the stories of torture and extrajudicial treatment, an ass-covering exercise. Carter had 18 months left in the regiment. He didn't plan on anything coming back to bite him in his retirement. He dumped his kid upstairs, kept hold of his M4, and joined the rest of the team in the canteen. They sat at a separate table from the Ukrainians, tucking into portions of lukewarm sausages, eggs, chips, and sauerkraut. Logan wiped his plate clean, let out a satisfying belch, and slid out from behind the table, leaving his rifle propped against his chair. "'The fuck are you doing?' asked McVeigh. Second helping?' Logan replied. No point seeing all this grub go to waste. You're still hungry? Starving, son? Logan patted his stomach and grinned. I could eat a bloody horse. No change there, then, Webb cracked. He shared an easy laugh with McVeigh. Brummy bastard. Seriously, though, you should watch your diet. McVeigh popped a chunk of sausage into his mouth and pointed his fork at Logan. Particularly someone at your age. My age? Logan repeated. He wrinkled his face. Fuck off. I'm not that old, you cheeky bastard. Not on Civvy Street, perhaps, but this is the regiment. Different rules. Best days are behind you. Logan pointed his fork at the younger man. Are you angling for a fucking slap, son? Just saying, you're getting long in the tooth. Stands to reason you should take better care of yourself. Supplements, diet, all that stuff. Help to keep you sharp. I ain't taking advice from a mank. Rather peel me on fucking eyelids off with a rusty blade. Suit yourself. McVeigh returned to attacking his food. We've still got what it takes, Logan said after a pause of silence. Me and Geordie have been doing the business for years. We were cutting around Iraq while you were still in nappies. Yeah, but that was then. This is now, Grandad. You'll be doing ops in Zimmer frames at this rate. Webb burst into laughter. Logan stood up and left to reload his plate. Carter ate distractedly. He thought about Koltrov and Butko, and his younger brother. The attempts on the lives of the President and the General, the two most popular figures in the country, both the subject of assassination plots within the space of a few days, which could only mean one thing. 
the Russians were ramping up their efforts. Something else bothered him too, something that had been scratching at the base of his skull since they had departed the police station earlier that afternoon. He looked up from his food as Logan returned to the table, his plate loaded with carbs and meat. Carter said, Are you definitely sure the minister wasn't carrying, back when you searched him? Positive? Logan slathered butter over a thick slice of bread. Carter said, The PSM is small, easy to conceal. You might have missed it. Not a chance. Logan set down his knife and fork, stared hard at Carter. The guy had not on him in his office, honest to God. So how do you explain how he had the gun on him at the station? Webb stroked his chin thoughtfully. Maybe he got hold of the weapon after his arrest. How? He was in cuffs. We had eyes on him in the back of the car all the way to the station. McVeigh had stopped chewing. He looked intently at Carter. What are you getting at? Carter cast his mind back to the scene in the interrogation room. He thought about Koltrov removing the plastic cuffs, demanding that the cell door remain shut throughout the interview. Nothing, he replied after a pause. It's probably nothing. They polished off their grub and helped themselves to slices of apple sponge cake and bruise. Black coffee for Carter, tea and milk for McVeigh, water for Webb, who never seemed to drink anything stronger. Logan devoured another massive wedge of cake. He was contemplating a third helping when a podgy-faced officer in fatigues entered the canteen and made a beeline for the SAS men. He stopped in front of their table, cleared his throat. One of the general's flunkies, Carter supposed. Help you, mate? Carter asked. He said in smooth English, General Koltrov wants to see you. All of us? Yes. Where? The operations room, general's private quarters. Now? Right now? Yes, the flunky said. Why? asked McVeigh. What's this about? The flunky shrugged. Fucking talkative this one, ain't he? Logan quipped. He makes you look like a chatterbox, Patrick. Webb stared daggers at the Liverpudlian. Funny. Very funny. He deadpanned. You've got us all in stitches. Fucking do one. Carter necked the gritty dregs of his coffee and stood up. Lead the way, mate. Let's see what the general wants. They left the Doss house and followed the flunky across the base. Three o'clock in the afternoon, thick grey clouds pressed low in the sky, heavy with the threat of rain. A brutal wind cut knife-like across the base. Carter figured the temperature had to be in the low single digits, four or five degrees. He remembered what Logan had said about the coming winter. Sub-zero temperatures, no hot water, or electricity. People freezing to death in their unheated homes. The moment of truth for Ukraine and its ability to withstand the aggressors from the east. After 200 metres, they reached the dormitory block housing the general and his staff. The flunky nodded at the two guards on duty at the entrance, swiped a security card against the reader next to the main door, then led the four blades down a long corridor and up a flight of stairs. They hooked a right on the first floor and carried on until they stopped outside a room midway down the landing. They waited while the flunky fiddled with a set of keys. At the end of the corridor, Carter spied an open door leading to the general's sleeping quarters. Inside, a woman sat perched on the edge of an unmade bed. Carter recognized her at once, one of the general's girls, the brunette he'd seen leaving the building that morning. She sat with her long legs crossed, staring at her face in a pocket mirror while she fussed with her hair. They're in early today, McVeigh commented. Logan said admiringly, The big man must feel like celebrating. Good on him. I'd be doing the same if I was in his boots. The brunette raised her gaze from the mirror to the soldiers outside the room. Carter briefly locked eyes with her, before unseen hands slammed the door shut. The flunky unlocked the operations room door and showed them into a cramped space with the same Soviet prison decor as the main accommodation block. 
technically an ops room, in the same way that a Trabant was technically a car. There was a table, there were chairs, a barred window overlooked the row of crumbling admin buildings and derelict hangars. The walls were cracked, and in places the paint had peeled away, revealing exposed chunks of brickwork. In the corner, a bin overflowed with chocolate wrappers and coffee cups. Wait here. General Koltrov will join you in a minute, the flunky said before he left the room. Probably getting in a quickie first, Logan said, a trace of envy in his voice. Wouldn't say no to a bit of that myself. Curves in all the right places. My kind of woman. Who isn't? McVeigh asked rhetorically. You'd shag a lamppost if it gave you the eye. Logan looked hurt. Didn't your parents teach you to respect your elders? McVeigh laughed cynically. No chance. They were too busy getting hammered. They waited. Two minutes later, the door flung open again, and General Koltrov entered the room, Colonel Makarenko and Zinchenko dutifully following him inside. They took the seats on the other side of the table, from Carter and his colleagues. Zinchenko finished tapping out a message on her phone and put it to sleep. Logan winked at her and grinned slyly. Zinchenko didn't look impressed. Koltrov steepled his fingers on the table and said, There's been a development, something we need to share with you, but first we need certain assurances, Carter said. What assurances? Makarenko said carefully, What you're about to hear must not be repeated outside this room. This information is highly sensitive, a matter of grave importance to the state. Carter spread his hands. Fine, you've got our word. What's the crack? Crack? What is it you want to tell us? Koltrov exchanged a look with Makarenko and said, Before that piece of shit Budko pulled a gun on me, he confirmed something we had heard before, from other collaborators we had questioned. Tortured, you mean? It is the same thing, no? Your American friends share the same opinion, I believe. Given what I have heard about the techniques they have used against terrorists in the past. The Ukrainians laughed among themselves. Carter glared drearily at the general. He was tired after the journey into Kiev, the arrest, and the fallout from the shooting. Just tell us why we're here. Koltrov dropped his smile and looked steadily at him, said, There is a high-level traitor in Ukraine, someone at the very top of the pyramid. The identity of this person is known only to four people in the Kremlin, including the president himself. How high are we talking? Logan asked. Because I'd say defense minister is pretty fucking high up the food chain. Much higher, Koltrov smirked. Ministers, they come and go. Mouthpieces. The individual in question is one of the most powerful figures in the country. Who is he? Or she? Carter pointed out. I am afraid I cannot share that information. Makarenko cleared his throat and said, We have known of the existence of this person for some time, but we did not have a name, only suspicions. Now thanks to the traitorous dog Andriy Butko, we are certain of their identity. Why are you telling us this? asked Carter. We need to arrange a meeting with the president, face to face, as a matter of urgency. He must be told what is going on. Can't you just reach him on a secure line instead? No line is absolutely secure, Koltrov said. There is always the chance that the Russians might be listening in. It would give them the chance to spirit away the traitor before we could arrest him. No, this has to be done in person. It is the only way. But Voloshin's off the grid, McVeigh pointed out. We were told he wasn't planning on showing his face until them traitors had been flushed out. We have discussed this. He is prepared to make an exception on this occasion, given the stakes. You've spoken with him? asked Carter. Koltrov nodded. An hour ago, we had a productive conversation. The president understands the situation. He agrees that this is too sensitive to discuss over the phone. 
He has agreed to meet with us at short notice. Where is he now? At a residence somewhere in the countryside, Nikolai Oblast. The precise location is top secret. Logan inclined his head to one side. But that's not far from the front line. Your point? Why would your man Voloshin be hiding out there? If he's worried about getting bumped, surely he should be tucked up in Kiev where no fucker can get to him. Zinchenko had been silent so far. Now she said, The president is planning a surprise visit to the troops on the front line in the south. Bad idea, Webb said. That whole area is a meat grinder. The press officer said, That is why his visit is so important. As you must know, the South has become the focus of our counteroffensive operations. The Russians are holding on, for now, but if our troops succeed in pushing the enemy back across to the eastern side of the Dnieper River before the winter, it will represent a great victory. I love it when you talk dirty, Logan said. Zinchenko shot him a frosty glare. Carter glanced sideways at Webb. The man Mountain wore an anxious expression. That's why he's in the area, Carter asked. To boost morale. Zinchenko nodded slightly. The soldiers in the area have endured some of the worst fighting in the war. A visit from the president will help to keep up their spirits ahead of a renewed push for her son. Must be a big deal if Voloshin is prepared to risk showing his face, considering the threats against him. His staff are against the idea, Makarenko admitted. But the president is determined to make the visit. If he can make even one percent difference to the outcome, he believes it is worth the risk. This hideout, Carter said. How safe is it? Koltrov smiled slightly. You are worried about your brother. I'm not thinking about Luke. I'm just wondering why we can't meet the president at his gaff. Gotta be easier than sending in an advanced party to secure some other site. We have suggested this already. The president has refused. Why? Koltrov and Makarenko glanced askance at one another. The colonel said, Voloshin does not permit visitors to his residence. His advisors worry that the location might become public knowledge and expose him to a potential attack. Even we do not know where it is. This is also why we cannot disclose our intelligence over the phone. Kolchov said. We think the Russians have hidden direction-finding equipment along the front line. It's possible they might geolocate any call to the residents, send in rockets. Where and when is the meeting? asked McVeigh. Tomorrow, Kolchov replied. Somewhere in Mykolaiv Oblast, not far from the front line, at a rendezvous to be determined by your colleagues on Voloshin's bodyguard team. I leave the details to you to sort out. What's the plan, once we hit the RV? Carter said. I will meet with the president and tell him what we know. Then we shall make plans to arrest the individual in question, the traitor who has brought so much grief and shame to our nation. Can we trust the int? I believe so, yes. We are still verifying the details, but so far, Butko's information checks out. There is no reason to doubt his claims. Who's attending the meet from our side? Makarenko said. The usual arrangement. Everyone in this room, plus Captain Popov and his team. You'll have to brief them separately following this meeting. Webb had been silent throughout. Now he said. This is a bad fucking idea, sir. It's not safe. Nonsense. I will be well protected. I shall have my full bodyguard detail, and the president will have his... Or do you not have confidence in your own abilities? Webb ignored the question. Perhaps we should wait until the president is back in Kiev. No! Koltrov snapped. I must meet with him at once. This information is too important to wait for his return. It cannot wait. The general frowned at his watch. Any more questions? No, sir. Then I suggest you liaise with your friends. They're expecting your call. In the meantime, I have other business to attend to. Business my ass, Logan said, 
as they paced back down the stairs and headed for the main entrance. Having himself a party with Miss Ukraine, more like. Webb said guardedly, We've got bigger problems than the general's sex life. Carter looked round at him. What are you thinking, Patrick? Webb looked hesitant. He said, The Southern Front is meant to be hell on earth. Rockets, drones, artillery. We're going to be spitting distance from some of the heaviest fighting in the country. What's your point? asked McVeigh. This meeting is asking for trouble. We shouldn't be going ahead with it. Carter said, We can't worry about that now. All we can do is crack on and get the job done. In and out, fast as we can. Lightning visit. That's the way to do it. And hope for some good luck for the change, Logan added grimly, because we're sure as fuck gonna need it. They made the short walk back across the base to the Doss House, fixed more industrial strength brews, and regrouped in the office. Carter got on the antenna-rigged sat phone to Hereford, while the others checked their various items of kit, charged their phones, and studied maps of Mikolaev and Herson oblasts. Familiarising themselves with the main roads, cities, and other points of strategic interest. Carter dialed the number for the ops room at Hereford and asked the duty officer to patch him through to his brother's sat phone. Like an operating service, but with added military grade encryption. The officer put him on hold while the SIGS team connected him, and there was a short sequence of clicks before a voice said, Jimmy? Hello? Surprised to hear from me, mate. A familiar laugh travelled down the line. Not at all. Typical big brother behaviour, this. Stealing my thunder. Yeah, that's exactly why I came out to this shithole. To stop you from getting all the glory. Bastard. Carter smiled warmly to himself. It's good to hear your voice, Luke. Likewise. Who told you I was in country? Luke said. Head shed. Yesterday at evening prayers. Said you were looking after one of our friends in the army, BG duties. He paused, and Carter could almost see him grinning on the other end of the line. Copying me again, I see. Can't even come up with an original mission for yourself these days, can you? But doing a better job of it than you, obviously. Luke burst into laughter again. Several hundred kilometres away, but the distance between them melted into nothing. Carter said, I hear you've been making a name for yourself with the principal. Yes. Luke's tone became strained. Not that I'm happy about it, like... Fuck me. I'd prefer to keep a low profile if it meant the guy stopped taking stupid risks. That sounded just like his brother, Carter reflected. Luke had never had any interest in citations or gongs or praise from his superiors. He just stayed in the background and got on with the business of soldiering. Warrior to his core. Go in hard, do the best job possible, and forget about the noise. That was Luke's motto. Maybe I should have tried that approach myself. I know the feeling, Carter replied glumly. Our guy thinks he's channeling the spirit of Napoleon. Probably why he's so popular. He's even threatening to overshadow our man with his antics. You can imagine how that's gone down. Like a cup of cold sick, I bet. That's about right, Luke grunted. Between you and me, the President is worried that Koltrov is hogging the limelight. He wants to put himself out there again. It's going to be a ball ache keeping him safe, and that's without having to set up this meeting with your man. We're in the same boat, mate, dealing with a pair of alpha males, egos the size of solar systems. Luke was silent for a beat. Voloshin is wondering why the general won't discuss his findings over the phone, he said. I've asked myself the same question. They could chat on this line, Luke suggested, if he's worried about the Russians listening in. No use. He wants to do it face to face. He's insistent. We're on the doorstep of the Russian front line, mate. Is it that bad? Worse? Like a million times? The Russians have flooded the front line with drones and mobile anti-aircraft launches. Flying to the RV from our location is a no-go. We'll have to drive to the meet. You'll need to confirm with the ops desk, but I reckon you guys will have to do the same. Carter said. Where's the RV? Mayor's office in Zolodyansk. 
40 kilometres north of the front line. I'll send you the coordinates. We'll meet there tomorrow afternoon, four o'clock, 24 hours from now. Carter frowned. Is it safe? Luke said. Only safe place in the vicinity. The mayor's office doubles up as the town's air raid shelter. Loads of civilians are bunkered down in the basement at the moment. How many people are we talking about? 400 or so. Everyone who hasn't fled the town. Women and children. Old men not fit for military service. People with nowhere else to go. Guards. Local militia. Volunteers. They're honest lads as far as I know. But they're only kitted out with the basics. AK-74s and that shit. Let's hope we don't have to rely on them in a firefight then. One more thing, Luke said. He paused. We'll need to arrange a dummy RV. Carter considered. Dummy RVs were used by the regiment to avoid the chances of the meeting being compromised. BG teams identified and marked out a fake RV point several kilometres from the real location. Attendees were kept in the dark about the plan to prevent a security leak. Once they neared the fake site, the bodyguard teams would change direction and head for the actual RV. You think there's a risk the Russians might find out? I don't know, Luke replied. But they found out about the President's visit to Balanivka. They spent a long time on the mission planning. They discussed modes of transport, routes to and from the mayor's office, call-off signs in case one of the teams ran into an enemy ambush or one of the vehicles went technical en route. If either side encountered a problem and needed to abort the meeting, they would get on the channel to the other team, alert them to the call-off and abandon the RV. They also discussed the order of arrival. Whoever showed up first would sponsor the location, which meant throwing up a security cordon, checking the area for threats, and establishing a reception party ahead of the other side's approach. Carter said, We'll take charge of the sponsoring. I'll send one of our guys forward with the Ukrainians. Make sure the building is clear before we give you the green light. Negative. The president wants to be the first person on the ground. But that's against regiment protocol. The president is the number one priority. We should be the ones sponsoring the RV. It's not my decision, Luke said moodily. The president wants to meet with the mayor of Zolodyansk before the meeting with your man. They head straight back to the president's hideout. It's risky, Luke. Your man will be exposed for a long time. He should be meeting the mayor after our visit. Jamie, I've tried. It's no good. He won't listen. Fuck's sake. What difference does it make? Between you and me, I think it's an ego thing. He wants to establish dominance over Koltrov, like a king welcoming one of his barons to his court. Make a point. Carter chewed on a thought. There was obviously a lot of friction between Voloshin and Koltrov. They had seemed like best mates in public, slapping each other on the back and smiling for the cameras, but there was no doubt that the president saw the general as a genuine threat, which could be problematic. Bad decisions happened when people allowed their judgment to be clouded by personal agendas. That was how mistakes got made, how people ended up getting killed. Who were the other lads on your team? he asked. Luke said. Taff Hedges, Tyler Dunk, and Josh Borman. Borman? Carter kneaded his brow. I thought he was out of the regiment these days. He didn't mention the stories that had done the rounds at Credenhill, the ones implying that Bowman had a drug problem. Opioids, they had said. A couple of years ago, he had disappeared from the camp without explanation. Most of the lads had naturally assumed his departure had something to do with the drug rumours. He's been on rotation with the cell, Luke said. Two years. Came back a few months ago. You two were on ops together, weren't you? Iraq, Carter said. Feels like a lifetime ago. They spoke for a while longer, clarifying details, checking all the pre-mission boxes, the how, why and when. They agreed to speak again once Carter had briefed the Ukrainians and checked in with the regimental ops room. They talked briefly about the general's routine and the shooting at the police station. Listening to his voice, Carter suddenly realised how much he missed his brother. Listen, he said. We'll catch up after the meeting. Have a good chat. Like old times. 
you're on. And Luke? Yes? Be careful tomorrow. Luke chuckled. That's rich, coming from you. I seem to remember you were the one always getting into trouble when we was kids. I'm serious. If the General's int is accurate, we've got a high-ranking official spying for the Russians. Could be anyone. Could be one of the guys around your principal, for all we know. I doubt it. No one gets within ten kilometres of the President without being fully vetted. Just do me a favour and make sure you have eyes on Voloshin's aides from now on. Carter remembered the promise he'd made to their mother on her deathbed, how he'd taken her clammy hand in his and vowed to always look out for Luke, no matter what. I'm a big boy. I can take care of myself, believe it or not. The tone was friendly, casual, but there was an edge to it as well, that hint of sibling rivalry that had always bubbled beneath the surface between the two of them, even though they shared an unbreakable bond. I know, Luke. Don't worry about me. Just focus on keeping your man in check. If we stick to the plan, everything will be fine. I hope you're right. For both our sakes. Carter clicked off the sat phone and filled in Webb, Logan and McVeigh on the plan for the following day. He told them about the dummy RV, the call-off signs, the meeting point at the mayor's office in the small city of Zolodyansk, Mikolaev Oblast. Voloshin's stubborn insistence on having his side sponsor the RV in breach of regiment SOPs. He put another call into Hereford and asked the ops desk for an int report on the southern front. A short time later, they came back and confirmed what he'd already suspected. Flying to the RV was a no-go. GCHQ had been informed that the Americans had detected a Krug surface-to-air mobile missile launcher south of Zolodyansk. Effective range of up to 50 kilometres. They had been unable to pinpoint an exact location and suspected that there might be further enemy SAMs concealed in close proximity. Furthermore, drones armed with high-explosive warheads had carried out strikes on Ukrainian targets in several neighbouring districts, knocking out armoured vehicles and artillery batteries in an attempt to deny them air superiority. Until further notice, a no-fly order was in effect around the RV. At six o'clock, they sent for Popov and Horbach. Carter ordered more coffee and brought them up to date on the meeting with Voloshin. Then they studied the route in detail. Distance to the RV from our position is 500 kilometres, Carter said. Journey time of approximately seven hours. He scrutinised the map again. Zolodyansk a small conurbation of some 15,000 citizens set in a sparsely populated plain. Forty kilometres to the south was the front line, although the intelligence picture seemed to change every time Carter made a brew. Troops on both sides were moving back and forth, retaking obliterated villages, abandoning defensive positions. The Ukrainian counter-offensive in the south was in full swing, but the Russians were putting up a fierce fight as they desperately fought to maintain a toehold on the western bank of the Dnieper. They had even made gains in some places, recapturing villages previously liberated by the Ukrainians. Ten kilometres southeast of the RV was the nuclear power plant at Holovika. Still under Ukrainian control as far as the ops desk knew, although the Russians had been aggressively shelling the area in previous days. Carter said, We'll stop along the way at secure sites, refuel the wagons, grab a bite to eat, and stretch our legs. Why don't we just drive straight there? We need the brakes. Got a long journey ahead of us. It's important we're sharp when we hit Zolodyansk. If we're tired, there's a risk of someone making a mistake or getting sloppy. Where are the stopping points? Popov asked. Carter pointed out a pair of small urban enclaves circled on the map. First one is a militia camp in an old Soviet army base. Second post is a lager point, forward mounting base for Ukrainian forces. From there, it's a straight journey to the RV. We'll have to have eyes on the general when he's out of the vehicle, Logan mused, rubbing his chin, knowing how fond the guy is of meeting his diehard fans. Any Russian attacks in the area? Popov asked. 
We've got reports of shelling in the nearby towns, Russian howitzers, mainly targeting Ukrainian defensive positions and civilian infrastructure. Carter told them about the Russian SAM batteries and the no-fly order. Drones? Plenty of them along the front line, said Logan, hence the no-fly order. But the route itself should be safe enough by car, according to the Americans. Carter looked up from the map. We'll need to put together an advance party, four-man reception team. He nodded at Horbach. Sergeant, you're in charge of the team. You'll proceed along this route twenty kilometres ahead of the convoy, he added, tracing a finger over the route marked on the map. Your orders are to scope out the ground for threats and secure each stopping point ahead of our arrival. That means maintaining radio contact and having eyes in the backs of your heads at all times. If you spot anything dicey, anything at all, I want to hear about it. No problem, boss, Horbach said. Once we reach each stopping point, we'll take over responsibility for the security, and you'll frog leap onto the next point. Popov said, Tell me about this dummy RV. Fake site is here. Carter indicated a point on the map, northeast of the actual RV. Industrial estate on the outskirts of the town of Pokrozirka. There's a T-junction on the main road, 15 kilometres from the meeting point. East, the road runs straight to Pokrozirka. West takes us to Zolodyansk. Once we hit the T, we'll take the right turn and drive towards the actual RV. Does the general know about this plan? No, Logan said. Outside of this room, the only people aware of the true RV are the lads on Voloshin's BG team. Everyone else will find out only when we reach the T-junction. Popov made a pained face and clicked his tongue ruefully. He said, The general will not be happy about this. He does not like information being kept from him. Tough shit. This is how we're doing it. Carter stared firmly at the captain. You are not to tell anyone else about the real RV. Anyone at all. That information is for the BG teams only. Popov stiffened. I understand. Do you? Because we're taking a serious gamble here. We're going to be danger close to the front line. If there's a leak to the other side, if the Russians know about the real RV, we'll be driving into an ambush. Horbach held up his hands. Don't worry, we will keep this information secret. You can rely on us, boss. Carter eyed them for a moment longer, then resumed the briefing. Have you guys bring their DOS bags with them? Ration packs too, enough for 24 hours. We'll be stopping overnight at the lager point once the meeting is over. Safer than trying to drive back after curfew. They spent the next few hours fine-tuning the plan. Throughout the evening, more int flowed through from the regiment ops desk. Updates on enemy troop dispositions. Satellite imagery of Zolodyansk and the surrounding area. Architectural diagrams of the mayor's office on Radzensky Street. A network of underground passages ran from the basement level to other local government buildings. Standard requirements for local Communist Party chiefs, Popov explained. Most of the tunnels dated back to the days of the Cold War. The chiefs had built them in preparation for nuclear war. Relics of a bygone era, or so the world had thought. At around eight o'clock, Webb and McVeigh left to sort out the wagons, checking the tyres and oil levels and brake fluid, loading the boots with jerry cans of diesel fuel and blankets, bottles of water, high-calorie snacks, spare batteries. Nothing was left to chance. Carter called Makarenko, summoned him to the briefing room and brought him up to speed on the plan. Minus the stuff about the dummy RV. The colonel expressed his unhappiness at having to sit in a car for seven hours and pushed for a helicopter flight instead, but Carter stood firm and ordered Makarenko to be ready at eight o'clock the next morning. The guy wasn't pleased with that news either. Probably dreaded having to tell the general he'd have to cut short his time with his girls. A short time later... Makarenko left the DOS block. Carter and his colleagues decamped to the canteen for a quick bite to eat before tending to their kit. Weaponry, ammunition, ballistic helmets, armour. 
They entered the preset frequency for Luke's team into their personal radio systems so they could dial in and communicate with the other SAS lads during the journey south. Carter also saved his brother's encrypted phone number to his burner, made sure the battery was full. Worst case scenario stuff. If the comms proved unreliable, he needed a way of reaching the other BG team. But he hoped it wouldn't come to that. Using an unencrypted device in a hostile environment was seriously risky. At eleven o'clock, he signalled the end of the briefing. As they slid out from behind the table, he noticed Webb staring at the map with a look of concern. Let's hope the Russians aren't raining down artillery on the mayor's office tomorrow, he muttered. Ops desk reckons the area has been getting hammered for weeks now. If there's any heavy stuff coming in, Carter said, Hereford will let us know in advance, and we'll call off the meeting. They'll be keeping us posted throughout the road trip. Webb gave the slightest nod, and made a noise deep in his throat. Still, it would be better if it wasn't going ahead at all. What's your fucking problem? Logan responded irritably. It's a routine visit to the front line, fella. We've done this shit loads of times over the past six months. Not to anywhere as dicey as this place. Webb looked up. We've got two of the most wanted targets in the country in one location, pissing distance from the front line. Pair of sitting ducks. It'll be a miracle if we can get through this without anything going wrong. Cheer up, fella, McVeigh said. Look at it this way. If this thing does go tits up, at least you won't have to listen to any more of Logan's crap jokes. Logan stared at him. That's not even funny, mate. You're right. I've seen your tragic attempts to charm the local talent. That shite is hilarious. Carter stood up and said, Get some kip, lads. Clear heads for tomorrow. Meet here at seven o'clock sharp for a final briefing and hardware check. We leave at eight. Nine hours later, as the pale dawn sun lifted into the sky, the four soldiers from A Squadron, 22 SAS, emerged from the accommodation block and paced towards the row of Suburbans parked across the tarmac. Each man carried his M4 rifle, Glock 17 semi-automatic pistol, and a small day sack filled with provisions and essential kit for the long journey to the front line. In addition, Patrick Webb, the team's designated sniper specialist, carried the bolt-action L-115A4 rifle in a weapon sleeve, plus two ten-round magazines of 7.62 by 51 mm NATO brass. Captain Popov stood waiting for the regiment men beside the wagons, along with another guy from the Ukrainian BG team. Junior Sergeant Marco Sirota was a lanky streak of piss, acne-scarred and youthful-looking, but a competent soldier. Sergeant Horbach and the three other lads on the advance party had departed from the base fifteen minutes earlier in a soft-skinned Land Rover borrowed from the general staff. They would clear the ground ahead, reporting any potential threats and feeding back information to the rest of the convoy. The two Ukrainians bundled into one of the Suburbans. Carter and Logan made for the middle vehicle in the convoy. Webb and McVeigh took the rearmost wagon. They went through the same drill as the previous morning, drove south and stopped in front of the general's quarters, kept the engines ticking over and waited outside. Thirty seconds later, the two girls stepped outside as if on cue, clutching leopard print purses and fur coats. They climbed in the silver grey Tuareg and after a short time, General Koltrov came out of the building. Then came Makarenko, then Zinchenko. The press officer joined Makarenko and Koltrov in the middle wagon, taking the seats behind Carter and Logan. Carter gave the all-clear to Popov over the net, and the convoy set off again. Two minutes later, they left the base and motored south on the main thoroughfare, heading for the front line. Chapter 19 The route took them out of Novichanka on a southeastern trajectory roughly following the course of the Dnieper River. Soon they had left the town behind, and the depressing rows of housing blocks were replaced by tree-lined corridors of tarmac. Through the gaps in the woodland, Carter saw vast plains stretching towards the horizon, studded with power lines and the occasional huddle of farm buildings. 
General Kolchov was in a foul mood. He snapped irritably at Zinchenko when she tried to speak to him, and spent the thirty minutes or so glaring out of the tinted window. "'It makes no sense,' he said at last. "'Sir?' asked Carter. "'Driving to the meeting. Why couldn't we just take a helicopter? It would have taken a fraction of the time.' "'As I'm sure Captain Popov said, sir,' Carter said, restraining his voice. "'There's a no-fly order in place around the RV. Going in by car is the only safe option.' But I have always flown to the front line to see my boys. Sometimes the Russians were so close you could almost spit on them. I don't see why anything should be different now. We're just following the advice given to us by the Americans, sir. I'm a busy man. Tens of thousands of soldiers depend on me to help defeat the enemy. I cannot afford to spend my days rattling around the roads like some fucking delivery driver. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Carter didn't know what else to say. Kolchov frowned at the landscape blurring past. I don't understand. Why would Voloshin insist on meeting at an industrial estate? Maybe he wanted to stay away from any built-up environment, make it harder for anyone to set up an ambush. The general snorted angrily. How long will this journey take us? Seven hours, sir. Eight, including the stopovers. We'll arrive at four o'clock. Bang on time for the meeting. I would not be surprised if Voloshin is late to the meeting, so he can take pleasure for making me wait like some worthless idiot. It would not be the first time. My brother is in charge of the BG team, sir. He wouldn't let that happen. Kolchov sat back and resumed his staring contest with the bleak countryside. Probably pissed off he's not going to spend the night with his girls, Carter thought to himself. Makarenko kept checking his watch. He looked fidgety, impatient, like a businessman on a train, worried he might be late for a meeting with an important client. On they rolled through the featureless landscape, mile after mile of the same scenery, as if the terrain was on some sort of a loop. Carter saw oceans of sugar beet fields, the brilliant green rosettes arranged in neat rows. They skated past a sequence of dirt-poor settlements, scattered across the billiard-table flat countryside. Clusters of single-story homes, all exposed brickwork and corrugated tin roofs, screened by corroded metal gates and crumbling perimeter walls, linked by a network of unmetalled tracks. Once in a while, Horbach checked in with Carter, updating him on the advance team's progress. The guys were following their orders, maintaining a distance of twenty kilometres between themselves and the main convoy at all times. After two more hours, Horbach came back over the channel to report that they had reached the first watering hole, the militia camp. All clear here, he replied. No sign of trouble. Security cordon established, ready and waiting for you. Roger that, Carter said. We're fifteen mics out. Mikes? Minutes, Carter said. Clearly the Ukrainians hadn't yet picked up the lingo used by American SF operators. We're there in fifteen minutes. They linked up with the advance party at a tented encampment on the outskirts of a dilapidated town in Cherasky Oblast. Then Horbach and the other three Ukrainians formally handed over control of the post, remounted the Land Rover and took off again. The general and Zinchenko took the opportunity to stretch their legs and greet the local militia chief, watched over by Popov, junior sergeant Sirota, Webb and McVeigh. Carter checked in with the ops desk at Hereford, asking for an update on the situation in and around Zolodyansk. No news, came the reply. No sign of the hidden Sam, but we're still looking. Twenty minutes later, they were back on the road again. The three-vehicle convoy quickly picked up speed once more. The general and his staff had a furtive discussion in the back. Carter switched channels on his tactical radio and hopped onto the frequency reserved for his brother's team. Luke, you there? Here, mate, came the reply. What's his situation? We're en route now, Carter reported. He dropped his eyes to the dashboard clock. 10.59. Five hours out. Roger that. We'll be mounting up in an hour or so.
Any problems at your end? None, Carter said. It's all fine. So far. Good. We'll check in again once we're on site. See you soon, Luke. A reunion with your ugly ass. Just what I wanted for Christmas. Cheeky bastard. He clicked off the line, hopped back onto the channel for the General's BG team, and focused on the road again. Logan said in an undertone, Bet you didn't think you'd be heading into a war zone this time last week, Geordie. This time last week, I was wondering if I had a future in the regiment. Logan glanced at him. How long have you got left? Eighteen months. I'll finish this job, then I'm done. That's me. They were talking quietly. Their voices were almost lost to the machine drone of the suburban engine. The general and his two IC were arguing about something in the local tongue and paid no attention to the two blades up front. What will you do? Logan asked. Once this is over... Carter wondered why Logan was interested in his retirement plans. Figured he was just passing the time with small talk. Then he thought, We're the same age, part of the same intake into the regiment, past selection together. He'll be coming up to the end of his time at Creddon Hill too, probably wondering what the fuck he's going to do with the rest of his life. Same as me. The question every blade must confront sooner or later. Well, I ain't doing a master's, that's for sure. Not like Billy. You think he's wasting his time? Carter thought, then shook his head firmly. No, that's the future for them lads. My brother, Luke, he's got the same mindset. Keen as mustard to get himself enrolled on one of those management programs. Logan grunted disapprovingly. He needs his head examined. I'd sooner pull my teeth out than spend time in some classroom taking notes and shit. Fuck that. They don't have a choice, mate. You can't get ahead without this stuff nowadays. Bollocks. Certificates, qualifications. They're like gongs, Geordie. Just for show. Experience is what really matters. Always has when you get down to it. Knowing how to soldier. Carter smiled bitterly. It's not like that anymore. Employers, they want more than a reference from the head shed and a few battle scars to show off. World has gone mad, son. You might be right. Carter fell quiet for a few minutes. Then he said, What about you? Got big retirement plans? Logan nodded eagerly, his eyes lighting up. Gonna open up a boozer in Hereford with a couple of the other lads, spend my days behind the bar, listening to old war stories and eyeing up the local talent. Fucking paradise, boy. That's it. That's what you're gonna spend the rest of your days doing, pulling pints and breaking up fights. I don't need nothing else. I ain't interested in making a fortune or running a business like some of the guys. All I need is enough to keep me in women and beer. In that order. Carter grinned. You're a man of simple pleasures, Scott. That's because they're the best kind. A beautiful woman, a nice cold pint, money in your pocket. What more could you want? I'll drink to that, long as you're offering free rounds. Logan wrinkled up his nose. Bollocks to that. You come to my joint, you pay for your drinks. I ain't planning on running a charity, you tight-fisted bastard. They both laughed, but when Carter looked ahead again, he felt that familiar pang of unease in his guts. Time to face facts. He was on the downward slope of his life. Best days behind him, McVeigh had said caustically. But Carter knew there was a kernel of truth to that statement. The prospects for a veteran warrior with a handful of GCSEs and an honours degree from the University of Life were limited. The thought of seeing out his days in some corporate gig, bored out of his mind, filled him with dread. Soldiering had given him a purpose, injected meaning into his life. The regiment had been his calling. He had no desire to stay in Hereford in the long term. Too many bad memories, too many ghosts. That might work for a laid-back guy like Logan, but not for Carter. He had a vision of himself sitting in the corner of his local boozer, drinking alone, while the young bucks glanced in his direction and whispered to their muckers. That's Geordie Carter. Yeah, used to be a tough blade back in the day. Did that business in Marley. Hard to believe now, though, ain't it? Let himself go. Fucking tragic. No, 
Carter thought. Better to get as far away from Hereford as possible. Start over. And do what? He didn't know. Carter had a talent for killing. He found a way to put his skills to use in the regiment. But there was nothing left for men like him on Civvy Street. Not in the New World. He closed his mind to his dark thoughts and forced himself to concentrate as they shuttled southeast through the outskirts of Crevy Rig. A hundred and twenty kilometres to the RV, he reminded himself. Not far to go. They got the all clear from the advance party and halted at a lager point in one of the city's western districts. Carter repeated the handover process with Horbach, and the advance party moved on again towards their final destination. Logan, Webb and Sirota lugged the jerry cans out of the backs of the three Suburbans and topped up the depleted fuel tanks. McVeigh and Carter helped themselves to piss-weak brews from a makeshift tented canteen. Kolchov gave an impromptu speech to the soldiers, which drew a round of hearty cheers. Carter checked in again with the ops desk, 3,000 kilometres away. Unverified reports of gunfire and shelling, came the reply. South of the RV at Zolodyansk, vicinity of Holovika nuclear power station. Awaiting more details. Proceed as usual for now. He switched channels and reached out to his brother. Luke confirmed that the president and his BG team were on their way to the true RV at Zolodyansk, ETA 1500, he said, which would give them an hour to establish the cordon and assess the threat level prior to Kolchov's arrival. He promised to check in again once they had arrived at the mayor's office. They left the lager point shortly after two o'clock, carried on west out of Krivi Rig for forty kilometres, then cut south past fields of grazing cattle, coppiced woods and ramshackle barns strewn with rusted farming equipment. A hunchbacked old woman in a headscarf and thick winter coat shuffled down the street, carrying a sack of potatoes. Tough folk, Carter thought hardened by eighty years of war and famine and tyranny, but unbowed, going about their daily business, doing whatever it took to survive. His kind of people. Maybe more so than his own tribe, Carter reflected. He barely recognised the country of his birth these days. People talked of sensitivity and privilege and microaggressions, but here was macroaggression on a grand scale. Carnage and slaughter and mass graves. The bloodiest conflict in Europe since the Second World War. Not a culture war, but a real one. Men and women fighting and dying in their thousands to preserve an idea. The most important one of all, perhaps, that people had the right to determine their own future. At exactly three o'clock, his brother's voice crackled in his earpiece, letting him know that they had safely arrived at the mayor's office. A few kilometres further on, the convoy ran into traffic at the next small town. Long lines of battered cars and wagons were heading in the opposite direction. Dozens of people trudged along the roadside, weighed down with their worldly possessions. Where did this lot coming from? Logan asked. Beriansk, Koltrov said. Next village to the west. Everyone is leaving to escape the shelling. Russians must be hitting them hard, Carter said. Like you would not believe. Most of the areas close to the front line have been shelled non-stop for the past two weeks. Hardly anyone is left behind. Ghost towns. Let's hope they don't start dropping any stuff near the RV, otherwise we'll be seriously fucked. Koltrov smirked. There is no need to worry. We shall be quite safe. Carter glanced quizzically at the general in the rear view. We're entering an area dangerously exposed to attack from enemy artillery, he reminded himself. Drones, mobile SAM launchers, all kinds of potential threats. And yet the guy's face didn't betray the slightest flicker of concern. Then he recalled what Logan had told him on the drive across the border from Poland a couple of days earlier. Guy goes around acting like he's fucking bulletproof, like he doesn't believe he's in danger of getting plugged. At the time... Carter had assumed it was just a front, a performance, the general playing the role of the fearless warrior to inspire the troops to heroic efforts on the battlefield. But now, he was having to reconsider. Kolchov actually believes this shit.
As they neared the front line, Horbach came back over the net, reporting that the advance party had reached Zolodyansk and linked up with Luke and the others. Five minutes later, the convoy hit the T-junction, marked by a dented road sign. Left would take them east towards the dummy RV at Pokrezirka. Right would lead to the actual RV at Zolodyansk, 15 kilometers away, a 20-minute drive from their position. Carter glanced at the dash clock again. 15.39. The road was empty. Ahead of them, Popov and Sirota eased the front suburban down to a slow crawl at the T-junction, took the right turn towards Zolodyansk, and quickly picked up speed again. Logan took the same turn, sticking close to the guys in front, the speedometer clocking up towards the 70 kilometers per hour mark. Koltrov's expression went tight with rage. Idiot! he rasped. You're going the wrong way. Turn around. Logan said nothing. He stared dead ahead, concentrating on the road, following the front vehicle as it bombed west. At their six o'clock, Webb and McVeigh were bringing up the rear of the convoy in the third suburban. What the fuck are you doing? Koltrov thundered. He waved a hand at the rear windshield. Didn't you hear? Park Razirka is that way, you fool. Carter said. The RV isn't at Pokrazirka, sir. The general stared at the back of Carter's head, the look on his face alternating between shock and indignation. Where? he demanded icily. Zolodyansk, mayor's office, sir. Rydzensky Street, that's the real RV. Koltrov glowered at him in the rearview mirror, his cheeks shading crimson. His jaw was clenched so hard you'd need a crowbar to prise it open. You lied to me, he said. Protocol, sir. We had no choice, in light of the threat to yourself and the president. Koltrov started to say something in response. Then he sat back in silence, anger spreading like cancer across his face. Carter switched frequencies to update his brother on their progress, but the channel kept dropping. He gave it thirty seconds, tried again. This time he got nothing but dead noise. He jumped back onto his own team's channel and managed to raise Popov, but a few seconds later the net abruptly went silent again. He turned to Logan. Is your radio working? I'm having problems connecting to the lads. Same here, Logan shrugged. Maybe them other lads change frequencies. Carter shook his head. Car radio's not working either, he added, as he tested the entertainment system. Could be a signal jammer in the area, one of ours, to disrupt the Russians. No, can't be. The ops desk would have given us the heads up. Then what the fuck is it? Carter didn't answer. He turned off the radio and stared out of the side window. They were speeding through the village of Beryansk now. A scattering of half-ruined flats and abandoned buildings either side of a bumpy main thoroughfare, surrounded by stubbled fields, pocked with artillery craters and the rusted tails of Russian missiles. No signs of habitation, except for a few feral dogs and the occasional old man picking through rubbish. Ten kilometres to the RV, Carter reminded himself. Nearly there. 1549. To the south, several kilometres away, beyond the fields, loomed the concrete cooling towers of the nuclear power plant at Holovika. Giant grey cones churning out whitish columns of water vapour into the late afternoon sky. Koltrov pulled out his phone and stared at the screen for a long beat, anxiety registering on his face. Shit, he said. Carter uplifted his gaze to the rearview mirror. What's going on, sir? I have a message from the president. I must call him back at once. Now? Carter twisted round in his seat. But we're almost at the RV. He says it is urgent, critical situation. So call him back. He wasn't thrilled about the general using a poorly encrypted phone in an area vulnerable to Russian missile attacks, but it was too late to do anything about that now. Koltrov gestured towards his phone. I don't have a signal, no reception. Same here, Makarenko said. He cursed, 
and held his phone up towards the window, like a surveyor searching for damp with a moisture detector. I have nothing, not even one bar. Zero. Carter attempted to raise his colleagues once more. Comms were intermittent. He could hear fragments of the chatter for a few seconds before the channel abruptly cut out. He tried contacting Hereford to see if the signalers could tell him what was going on, but he ran into the same difficulties when he tried patching through to the ops desk. His radio was malfunctioning. So was Logan's. Shit. He was still puzzling over what to do when Koltrov leaned forward and pointed at the horizon. There! He indicated a garage on the other side of the road, the only building anywhere in sight. A workshop and reception office abutted the shop, fronting a petrol station forecourt. Stop there, Koltrov ordered. They will have a landline. I will use that. Logan glanced questioningly at Carter. Theoretically, an unauthorized stop was against regiment SOPs, but in reality, overruling a Ukrainian general, the second most powerful man in the country, was career suicide. So he gritted his teeth, made a heroic attempt to mask his frustration, and said to Logan, You heard the man. Pull over at the garage. But Jesus, Geordie! Do it, Carter muttered. Stop the car. The comms came back to life, briefly. Carter had just enough time to update the lads in the other two wagons before the line went dead once more. Logan came off the main road, tapped the brakes and parked up behind Popov and Sirota on the garage forecourt. McVeigh and Webb pulled up two metres to the rear. Both front and rear teams hurried to establish a defensive formation, Popov and McVeigh exiting their vehicles and hefting up their front-slung rifles as they took up firing positions to cover the main approaches, while Sirota and Webb remained behind the wheels, ready to make a swift escape if necessary. Place looks empty, Logan said, as he ran his eyes over the site. Carter nodded absently and looked round. The steel roller shutter had been lowered over the ramped vehicular entrance to the workshop. The garage reception and the shop front were both dark. Further away was a scrap metal yard. In the distance, fields of wheat swayed in the susurrant wind. Two hundred metres to the west, a separate road led south towards the nuclear plant. The faint grey stacks on the horizon broke up the otherwise dull landscape. Carter turned to Logan and said, Wait here. Keep the engine running. I'll accompany the general inside. If it looks clear, I'll steer close and cover the rear of the building. One of us should stay with the principal, Logan said, while he's inside the building. Absolutely not, Koltrov snarled. This is a private conversation, confidential. Carter said testily. We can't let you out of our sight, sir. That's non-negotiable. Koltrov gestured towards his subordinate. Anton will accompany me into the office. He is more than capable of dealing with any trouble. Carter weighed up the wisdom of arguing with a three-star general. Then he said, Keep it quick. We're in and out of here in five minutes. I will do my best. Koltrov and Makarenko clambered out of the wagon. Carter left Logan and Zinchenko in the suburban and caught up with the general and his two IC as they walked across the forecourt towards the garage building. A door on the right led into the station shop. Through the dirt-smeared glass, he spied a cash register behind an acrylic screen, refrigeration units, shelves of car-cleaning products and junk food. He made for the other door, to the left of the shop, the garage reception. Carter levered the handle, the door opened with a musical beep, and he stepped into a small office with a waiting area to one side. Ancient-looking computer on the desk, with a landline next to it, amid a clutter of paperwork and tools. Frayed posters of classic cars and swimwear models hung from the walls. To the left, a crude partition separated the office from the main workshop space. The glass screen had been blown inwards, scattering shards across the worn carpet. Carter approached the partition, glass crunching underfoot, and scanned the workshop area. There was a ramped vehicle bay in the centre of the space, with a subterranean inspection pit, six metres long and a metre wide, like a grave, 
waiting for a coffin to be lowered into it. Carter saw a load of tyre-changing equipment, wheel alignment systems, brake testers and headlamp testing kit, but no people, no mechanics or customers. Safe enough? Well, Koltrov asked impatiently. Carter said, Remember, make it quick. We can't hang around here for long. I'll be round the back watching the fire door, so we've got you covered from every side. Yes, yes, okay. The general barged past him, snatched the receiver, looked at Carter, waited for him to remove himself from earshot. Carter took the hint. He walked over to the fire door at the rear of the office, depressed the push bar, and stepped outside. Found himself at the edge of a wide parking lot built at the back of the garage, with a row of oil drums, a mound of spare bits of machinery, and several stacks of car tires worn down to the nub. Close by, flies buzzed around a dumpster, stuffed full of stinking rubbish. He visually swept the ground, found a brick next to the dumpster, and wedged it in the gap between the fire door and the frame. The stopwatch in his head began ticking as he surveyed the terrain from left to right. He was alert to the slightest hint of a threat, a passerby or the distant sound of an approaching drone or vehicle, but the area was utterly deserted. Gorse Town. From within the office, he heard General Koltrov talking on the phone in his familiar, gravelly voice. There was a clearly identifiable pattern to the conversation. From the sound of it, Koltrov was doing most of the talking. Carter was too far away to properly understand what he was saying, but he recognized the language in a heartbeat. Not Ukrainian, but Russian. Carter stepped closer to the door, pricking his ears. He had spent enough time on ops in Ukraine to distinguish between the two languages. A young officer he trained up in the local SF force had explained it to him over a few beers. Russian and Ukrainian were broadly similar in some ways, but also distinctive, a product of their shared cultural history and their differences too. Carter could understand maybe two-thirds of what Koltrov was saying, enough to grasp his meaning. The target isn't heading for Porkrazirka, the general said to the person on the other end of the line. Look for a two-vehicle convoy approaching Zolodyansk on the T-1508, heading for the mayor's office on Radzinski Street. Target is driving in that direction. Carter stood very still and felt a chill of cold dread trickle down his spine. For a moment, he wondered if he had misheard the general. But then Koltrov spoke again, repeating the same words in a slower, louder tone, spelling them out to the person on the other end of the call, and then Carter knew for sure. He hadn't been mistaken. I know what I just heard. The general is telling someone where to find the president. He's just blown the fucking up. He reacted at once. He tugged open the heavy fire door and moved briskly through the office, his gloved right hand clasped around the M4 rifle grip, the barrel pointing down at an angle. General Koltrov was standing behind the desk next to the partition screen, talking on the phone in quick-fire Russian. Makarenko stood close by, his arms folded across his chest. At the sound of Carter's approaching footsteps, both men drew sharply upright. Koltrov looked up at him with a startled expression. What are you doing? He hissed. I told you to wait outside. Don't you know a fucking order when you hear one? Carter ignored the question. Who are you talking to? He demanded. The president, I told you. Bullshit. Carter pointed at the phone. I just heard you speaking Russian. Koltrov stood very still. Makarenko dropped his arms to his side and took a half step towards the cluttered desk. Carter kept his gaze centred on the general. Tell me, he said. Tell me what the fuck is going on. Koltrov said nothing. He stole a quick glance at Makarenko. The two men traded a knowing look, and a sudden movement flashed in the tail of Carter's eye, coming from his three o'clock. He spun round. He saw the colonel seizing a heavy-duty pipe wrench from the desk. Carter started to bring up his rifle in response, but even as he lifted the weapon, 
He knew he had been too slow to react. The Ukrainian had time and speed and physics on his side. He had already drawn his right arm back. In the next beat, he brought the pipe wrench crashing down on Carter in a vicious chopping motion. The cast steel tool struck him on the jaw. A jarring pain flared in Carter's cheekbone and shot up into his skull, like a dentist drilling into all his teeth simultaneously. He sagged helplessly to the floor, the taste of blood in his mouth. Makarenko snatched the rifle away from him, yanking it from the three-point sling, and when he looked up, he saw the colonel standing over him, his right hand wrapped tightly around his deholstered glock. Black mouth of the muzzle, dead centred on a point between Carter's eyes. Chapter 20 Carter didn't move. Nobody said anything for several beats. Makarenko kept the Glock 9 milli trained on Carter, ready to decorate the office with his brains. Koltrov manoeuvred round to the side of the desk and slowly replaced the receiver on the corded telephone. On the desk, the blood-slicked pipe wrench gleamed beneath the anemic panel lights. Grogginess settled like a cloud behind Carter's pupils. He shook his head in a futile attempt to clear it and pulled himself up to his knees. Pain stabbed the sides of his skull with every movement. Something felt loose in the back of his mouth. He coughed and spat out a shard of broken tooth coated in slimy blood. His eyes drifted towards the M4 rifle a couple of meters away, out of arm's reach, but only just. Koltrov smiled. Don't, he said. Don't even think about it. He snapped an order at Makarenko. The colonel moved away from the desk and side-footed the rifle, kicking it away from Carter. He kept pointing his weapon at Carter while the general knelt down and tore the glock from his side holster. He slid back the receiver to eject the chambered round from the snout, released the clip, pocketed the full magazine and the empty piece. Then he straightened up and backed away from Carter until he was level with Makarenko. Carter hack coughed violently. He wiped the blood from his mouth, tried to gather his thoughts, which wasn't easy, not after getting clobbered in the face with a wrench. Slowly, the cloud lifted. Something clicked into place in his head. There is a high-level traitor in Ukraine, the general had told him back at Novachanka Air Base. Someone at the very top of the pyramid. You, he gasped between ragged draws of breath. You're working for... The Russians. Koltrov made a small laugh at the back of his throat. Yes, he said. The cold feeling spread through Carter's guts, turning his blood to ice. How long? Many years since my days as a young officer. Carter nodded groggily. The professional part of his mind was working at quantum speed, crunching data processing angles and distances, and a multitude of other factors. He couldn't disable Makarenko. As soon as he made his move, the colonel would open fire at point-blank range. A non-starter. He couldn't seize the M4 either. Out of reach. Even if he somehow managed to lunge for the rifle, it would take him two or three seconds to snatch it up, spin round, take aim at Makarenko, and fire. An epoch in firefight terms. The colonel would drill him before he could get a shot away. Snookered. You'd better think, the voice in the limbic part of his brain told him. Think of something fast, or you're going to die here. Why? he asked. You mean, why pledge myself to Moscow? Carter managed a weak nod. He thought, buy yourself some time, keep him talking, focus on surviving. One second to the next. Was it... money? Koltrov chuckled. Only an Englishman would ask such a question. Money had nothing to do with it. It was a patriotic decision. A question of doing what is right for my country. Some of us in the army, we did not like what was happening to Ukraine after the Cold War. We witnessed the protests in Kiev, the talk of friendship with the EU, with NATO. We became disillusioned. Some of us met in private, small groups of like-minded soldiers. 
That was when the Russians approached me through one of their agents, an officer in our security services. They knew of my sympathies. They told me of their plans for Ukraine. For me. They made me understand that the real threat was not from Russia, but from NATO. You're betraying your own tribe. The general smiled coldly. If you want to talk of traitors, you should start with Voloshin. He is the one who has betrayed our people by selling his soul to the parasites of the West. The veins pulsed savagely between Carter's temples. Bullshit. You're working for a fucking tyrant. Koltrov stared at him. It is not the Russian president who is leading us to destruction. That is Voloshin. He thinks the West has his back, but he is deluded. The fascists in NATO do not care about Ukraine. They seek to destabilize us with empty promises. Then they sell us weapons and encourage us to kill our brothers from the East. The Russians, at least, are our brother Slavs. We have a shared history, a shared culture. What do we have in common with your leaders in Britain and America? Nothing, that is what. The president thinks he has the support of all Ukrainians, but it is an illusion. There are those of us who still have our country's best interests at heart. Koltrov bragged. In the intelligence services, in the church, other places too. There are many more of us than Voloshin or anyone else would believe. And now the time has come for us to seize control, to save our nation from disaster. By working for the enemy. Koltrov shook his head. By restoring the land to Russia. The general caught sight of the incredulous look on Carter's face and tilted his head to one side. His unpatched eye narrowed to a slit. You doubt that we will win? Your mates are on the back foot, feeding conscripts into the meat grinder. They'll raise the white flag eventually. Koltrov smiled condescendingly. You are a good soldier, like that brother of yours. But you are killers, not strategists. You do not see the bigger picture. I do. The guy was boasting now. Carter could see the fire blazing in his good eye, like a preacher addressing a crowd of believers. He waited for the general to go on. Keep him talking. Keep buying time. Ukraine will lose this war. Not for a while, maybe, but in the end Russia will win, because your friends will lose the will to fight, just like they did in Afghanistan and Iraq. Carter said, You're wrong. Am I? Koltrov gave a cynical laugh. Look at the news. Already public opinion is turning. I have seen the stories. People angry about the cost of filling up their car or heating their home. Politicians across Europe protesting about the money spent on the war in Ukraine. In another year or two, they will grow tired of footing the bill, as they always do. The supply of weapons will dry up, and what will happen then? Our soldiers will be on their own against Russia. That is a fight Ukraine cannot win. The truth is, we are safer under Moscow's wing. Russia is our true friend, not NATO or the EU or anyone else. It is in our interest to join forces, to form a new alliance. A greater Russia, an empire of Slavs, opposed to the fascism and disorder and hypocrisy of the West. Then we shall be strong, stronger than we have ever been before. The rest of the world will tremble before the new Slavic empire. Fucking pipe dream, Carter said. La la land, you'll be under the boot of the Kremlin. It is preferable to being a puppet of America. That path leads to humiliation. But together, Ukraine and Russia will achieve great things, many great things. Won't happen. Not in a million fucking years. Voloshin would never agree to a deal. Of course not, said Koltrov. That is why we must get rid of him. Carter looked at him in disbelief. The phone call, he said. Koltrov broke into a chilling smile. His face glowed with triumph. He said, A few minutes from now, once our Russian friends have got a bead on the President's convoy, 
A pair of tornado rocket launchers will strike the vehicle before they arrive at the rendezvous, and Voloshin will die. Carter kept staring at the general. He hoped a fuck his face didn't betray the slightest flicker of emotion, because he suddenly understood. Koltrov had made a fatal miscalculation. He doesn't know, Carter told himself. He thinks the president is still en route to the mayor's office. He doesn't know that they're already at the RV. A logical assumption. Koltrov would naturally suppose that his team would arrive first to sponsor the RV. Normal procedure dictated that the more important target would arrive second to limit the time they were exposed to enemy attack. Koltrov smiled again. He said, Once the president's death has been announced, an emergency cabinet meeting will be convened. After an appropriate period of mourning, of course, I will be sworn in as the new president. A foregone conclusion, given my standing with the people. No one will dare to challenge me. The nation will look to me for guidance. Then, at last, we can begin the work of restoring Ukraine to Mother Russia. It'll never work, Carter said. The people will support you to begin with. Christ, they might even accept peace talks. But the moment you start getting chummy with Russia, they'll turn on you. Koltrov's smile widened. Perceptions can change. Do you think the German people universally loathed the Jews before the Nazis came to power? Carter made no reply. The Kremlin has a plan. To change popular opinion is not an easy thing, but it can be done. They will push stories in the media, discredit my opponents, launch smear campaigns, crush those who defy me. It will be done quietly at first, so quietly no one will even notice. But over time, we will turn Ukrainians against the West, and when I speak, the people will follow me, because they know I am a true patriot. As for my political enemies, Russia is already helping to eliminate those who might threaten me. Carter felt a terrible weight pressed down on him. He forgot about the dull, throbbing pain in his jaw, his shattered tooth. He said, The fifth columnists, the traitors you've been hunting. Loyalists, said Koltrov. People who could not be trusted to support the new regime. My handler supplied me with their names. They were innocent. Not all of them. Some were guilty of corruption, siphoning money from budgets, securing government contracts for family and friends, that kind of thing. What is the English saying? Uh, no smoke without fire. Carter thought about the defense minister. Gears turning in his head. He recalled Butko's despairing pleas of innocence at the time of his arrest. Koltrov's puzzling decision to remove the suspect's plastic cuffs moments before the interrogation. The PSM pistol. He wasn't armed, was he? Butko, when you arrested him, you fucking murdered him, then planted the piece on him to make it look like an act of self-defense. Yes. And the others? The ones we could blackmail or bribe into working for the Kremlin, they were released. As for the others, those who refused to serve Moscow's interests, we put them to death. You're fucking insane. No! A look of steely determination flashed in Koltrov's eye. I am merely doing what is necessary to ensure my country survives. If there are casualties, then so be it. Of course, I could not believe my good fortune when Voloshin asked me to personally lead the effort to root out dissidents in the establishment. It gave me an unbelievable opportunity. I could eliminate my enemies, kill anyone who might suspect me of disloyalty to the fascist regime. But then, as they say, fortune favors the brave. Carter glanced instinctively at Makarenko. Koltrov read his expression and made a playful grin. Yes, Anton is working for us too. He has been with us from the very beginning. I personally recruited him, in fact. The grin stretched across the general's weathered face. He added proudly, You are looking at Ukraine's next chief of staff. Who else? Carter asked. Who else is in on it? 
Keep him talking. A few others, high-ranking officers, you do not know them. And that is just in the military. There are many more, ready to serve once Voloshin has been taken out. We have a whole shadow government in waiting. The clock in Carter's head kept ticking. He figured five or six minutes had passed since Kolchov had alerted his Russian mates. He clung to the hope that one of the lads on the forecourt might start to get pissed off with the delay. Someone might wander over to the garage to see what was going on, interrupt them. Think. There has to be a way out. Has to be. But there are eyes on you constantly, Carter said. Round-the-clock protection. I'm betting the intelligence services have got you under surveillance as well. Them lot are watching everybody. This is true. So? How the fuck have you been contacting your Russian mates? Someone would have noticed by now, surely. I have an interlink, Koltrov said. A go-between. One of the girls, Irina. She supplies information back to Moscow. Something else clicked into place in Carter's head. The brunette. The general glanced at his watch. We have wasted too much time here. He snapped an order at Makarenko in Ukrainian. Do it. Getting his two IC to do the dirty work. Carter swallowed. Hard. Endgame. As the two men spoke, he edged a hand down towards the pressel switch on his webbing, desperately hoping that the comms might be working again so he could raise the other lads. Then the general read his intentions and smiled in amusement, sharing a laugh with Makarenko. I wouldn't bother, Koltrov said. It won't work. Electronic countermeasures, high-intensity warfare system, jams everything. Radio signals, satellites, GPS devices, even mobile phone masts. So, that's why the general wanted to stop here, he thought. Because he needed to alert the Russians to the real target location, and he had to find a landline. He knew his mobile phone wouldn't work. Makarenko's fingers tightened around the pistol grip. Time to die, he said. Carter tensed. Fear percolated into his bowels. Not the black terror of death, but something worse. He was afraid of losing. He stared levelly at the colonel, eyeballed the Glock. Don't look afraid, the voice in his head told him. Don't give the fucker the satisfaction. Carter waited. Then he heard a loud clattering noise at his nine o'clock, coming from beyond the office. His gaze skittered towards the partition window. Through the gap, he saw a pot-bellied mechanic in tattered overalls crawling out of the inspection pit. A few paces away, a rake-thin guy in matching clobber had frozen mid-stride next to a workbench. Toolbox at his feet, the contents scattered across the resin floor, spanners and screwdrivers and hammers. Koltrov and Makarenko simultaneously whipped round, directing their attention towards the disturbance in the workshop the colonel aiming his glock in the same direction. The skinny mechanic caught sight of the pistol and thrust his arms into the air in terror. His podgy mate had finished sneaking out of the pit and went statue rigid. Carter figured the mechanics had heard the entire conversation in the office, the general's confession, Russia's plan to kill Voloshin and install Koltrov as a puppet ruler. He guessed they had reached a collective decision, Sneak outside while their attention was on Carter. Sound the alarm. Then the thin guy had gotten clumsy, knocking over the box of tools, distracting Koltrov and Makarenko. Both men had turned away from Carter. They were laser-focused on the mechanics. Carter had a second to act, which was all he needed. He launched himself at Makarenko, slamming into the colonel a split second before he could loose off a shot. The Ukrainian gasped as he stumbled backwards, the impact driving the air from his lungs, the glock tumbling from his stunned grip. He crashed against the desk and sent the clutter crashing to the floor before he fell away. Carter landed on top of the colonel. The two men rolled on the carpet, trading blows. Makarenko fought wildly, his strength taking Carter by surprise. In the next moment, he kicked out, throwing Carter bodily off him. And suddenly, he was on top of his opponent, pinning him down, 
stinking hands clawing at his throat, strangling him. In the corner of his eye, Carter spotted the pipe wrench lying on the floor. He reached desperately for it, straining every sinew in his body. Failed. Makarenko squeezed harder. Carter couldn't breathe. He could feel the blood swelling inside his head, pressing behind his eyeballs. He tried for the wrench again. Fingertips brushed against the cold metal, dragged the wrench towards him. He summoned one last effort, closed his fist around the handle, and swung hard, striking Makarenko on the side of the head with a dull thunk. The colonel flopped to one side, groaning in pain. Carter instantly scrambled to his feet, tossed the wrench aside, and dived for the Glock. He swiped up the pistol, whipped round, saw the Ukrainian lunging at him again, drew the semi-automatic level with the man's central mass. Fired. The Glock was a marvel of human engineering. There was no safety switch on the side of the weapon. Instead, the operator simply disengaged the safety by applying deliberate pressure to the trigger mechanism, thereby saving valuable seconds in a firefight. All he had to do was take aim, pull the trigger all the way back, and let the gun do the work. Which Carter duly did. The muzzle flared. A round spat out of the snout and slammed into the colonel's midriff at extreme close range. An easy shot for a regiment man. At a distance of two metres, it would have been harder to miss. The discharge sounded deafening in the close confines of the office. Makarenko jerked and toppled backwards, his legs folding beneath him. He landed in a heap on the carpet, like a boxer hitting the canvas after a knockout punch. The pounding of boots on the ground reached Carter's ears. The reception door chimed, and then Logan burst into the office and looked round, taking in the scene. The smashed computer screen, the bloodied wrench, the Glock in Carter's right hand. Makarenko lying sprawled on the carpet, pawing at his gut wound, blood staining his army jacket. In the workshop, the two mechanics climbed to their feet and bolted for the rear exit. General Koltrov was nowhere to be seen. Webb, McVeigh and Popov joined Logan in the office, M4s raised, ready to engage. Webb dropped to a knee beside Makarenko, inspecting his injuries. Logan was blinking rapidly. What the fuck is going on? The general, Carter began. Where is he? Outside. He came running out of here in a flap, McVeigh said. Screaming for help, said something about an attack. Carter said. It's Koltrov. He's the traitor. He's... The bark of a pistol interrupted him. From outside the building, there was the throated rev of a car engine, the high-pitched screech of car tires skidding across asphalt. Carter climbed off the canvas and seized his M4. Stop him! The five soldiers raced for the entrance. Carter crashed through the door and snapped his attention towards the forecourt. Sirota lay slumped on the ground, his limbs twisted at unnatural angles, blood pooling beneath him. The lead suburban was missing. There! McVeigh yelled. A hundred metres away, the stolen vehicle raced west down the main road, rapidly picking up speed. Carter jerked up his M4, thumbed the fire selector to fully automatic, right hand clenched around the pistol grip, left hand clasping the vertical foregrip mounted on the underside of the handguard. He lined up the telescopic sights with the rear tyres and squeezed off a four-round burst. The round struck high, glancing off the boot and starring the rear windscreen. Logan and McVeigh had also brought up their rifles and took aim in the same direction, following Carter's lead as they peppered the back of the Suburban with bursts of hot lead. The brake lights glowed before the wagon slewed hard to the left, tyres squealing, burning rubber as it took the turn off the main road. Then it straightened out and careened south, shrinking from view, the engine roar growing ever fainter, heading away from Zolodyansk. Fuck is he going? Logan asked, between snatched draws of breath. Front line, McVeigh said. He cursed filthily. Fuckers making a run for it. Carter wheeled away from the road. His mind was spinning his heart beating frantically. 
Popov was kneeling beside Sirota. He looked up, gave a slight shake of his head. He's dead. Zinchenko? Carter glanced across the forecourt. Where is she? Webb flung open the doors on the other two wagons, checking the interiors. Not here, he called out. No sign of her. She's gone too. Must be with the general, Logan mused. Shit, Carter said. Hostage? McVeigh wondered. Maybe. He started back towards the office at a quick march. Logan was shouting after him, demanding to know what was going on. Carter gave no response. He was thinking about the president, his brother, the RV, the imminent threat to their lives. He barged back into the office, hastened over to the desk, set down his M4 and reached for the landline. In the corner, Makarenko made some sort of wet, sucking noise. Dark, oily blood pumped steadily out of his gut wound. The door chimed again. Logan stormed into the office, Popov, McVeigh and Webb hurrying after him. Carter fished out his burner, brought up the number for his brother's cell, picked up the receiver and stabbed the digits into the corded phone. Logan said, What the fuck is happening? Mate! Koltrov is working for the Russians, Carter said. They set the whole thing up. The meeting with Voloshin. It's a trap. Logan looked dumbfounded. He momentarily lost the power of speech. Are you sure? But how? I overheard him talking to the Russians on the phone, spilling the beans on the RV. The Russians are plotting to kill Voloshin today. Rocket attack. Replace him with Koltrov. I've got to warn the others. Shit. What about him? McVeigh nodded at the wounded colonel. The guy was writhing on the floor, clutching his guts. His breathing was shallow and wheezy, as if he was breathing through a straw. He's in on it too, Carter said. Jesus fuck. Carter finished punching in the number and prayed that the range on the enemy's electronic countermeasure systems didn't extend all the way to Zolodyansk. There was an agonizing wait while the line tried to establish a connection with Luke's mobile five kilometers away in Zolodyansk. Then came the familiar bleat of a ringing tone. Luke picked up on the third ring. Hello? Luke, listen to me, Carter said breathlessly. Jimmy? Luke asked. He sounded surprised. That you? The line crackled and hissed. A repetitive clicking noise travelled down the phone, faintly audible in the background. Carter figured the reception must be poor at the mayor's office. The RV has been blown, he said. You need to get the president out of that location right fucking now. What are you talking about? Where are you? There's no time to explain. You've just got to trust me. There are Russians in your area, actively scanning for your coordinates as we speak. Get Voloshin out of that location and head out of the city. Stay on radio silence if you can. Whatever you do, don't stay where you are. Before Carter could continue, he heard a strange noise on the line. It took him a few moments to recognise it as a muffled voice, rough and fuzzy, indistinct. He couldn't make out what they were saying, but it sounded like Russian. Who's there with you? he asked. Nobody. You're alone. I'm in the corridor outside the mayor's office. Principal is waiting with the mayor for you lot to show up. There's no one here, mate. The voice faded. Then the clicking sound came back again, louder this time. Carter said. Did you hear that? Hear what? That noise. Nothing at my end, it's all quiet here. But... Oh, fuck. Carter felt his pulse quickening, his bowels clenched with cold dread. On the other end of the call, Luke reached the same conclusion. Shit, he whispered. Jimmy, this is an open line. Jesus. The Russians, Carter realised. They've been listening in. They know the president is at the RV. Nausea rose in his throat, mingling with the taste of blood in his mouth. He knew a little of the Tornado S rocket system, the latest Russian technology, an upgrade on the old Red Army launchers, 
half a dozen launcher tubes per truck. Recently, the Russians had started using them to fire precision-guided rockets, hundreds of kilograms of high explosive per warhead, with a maximum effect range of 120 kilometers, packing enough of a punch to flatten a building and everyone inside it, including the president and his brother. He had been on the call for maybe 40 seconds. It would take another 40 to prepare the tornado launches, maybe less. The fire team wouldn't want to hang around a moment longer than necessary. Once they broke cover, they were going to flag their position to every Ukrainian asset in the immediate vicinity. Ten seconds after unleashing the rockets, they would have a ton of ordnance coming their way. Get out of there! He thundered. Luke, move it! Now! Chapter 21 There was a sudden eruption of noise on the other end of the line. Carter heard a clamour of panicked shouts and screams. Bedlam. Above the noise, his brother bellowed an order at someone. There was a muffled thump, what sounded like a chair scraping on the floor, and then the call abruptly cut out. In the reception office, Carter stood rooted to the spot, still holding the receiver, listening to the dead air. The pressure in his chest intensified. It became intolerable. He couldn't breathe, couldn't think. Logan stared at him. What? he asked. What is it, mate? What did he say? Carter shook his head. He felt sick. He thought about the civilians sheltered in the basement of the mayor's office, the makeshift bunker. Geordie? Four hundred people, Carter thought. Women, children, old men, people with nowhere else to go. He said, We need to warn the mayor. Get them people out of the basement immediately. Webb tapped his pressle switch, testing his tactical radio. Comms are still down. We don't have a phone number for the mayor's office either. No way of contacting them. Fuck's sake. What's going on? McVeigh asked. The Russians, Carter said. They've got a bead on the RV. And I'm the one who directed them. How? Popov asked. The call, they... They must have traced it. Open line. My God. In the next moment, a chorus of low, rumbling booms erupted in the distance, and something shifted inside Carter, bayonetting his guts. Because then, he knew. The rockets... They've struck the target. The colour plunged from Logan's face. Jesus. Jesus fucking Christ. Carter tried his brother again. No answer. Out of desperation, he tried Sergeant Horbach's mobile phone, fighting the rising sense of dread brewing in his chest. His hands were shaking as he dialed the number. The phone rang and rang. No answer. He clung desperately to the hope that the rockets had somehow missed their targets, but he knew it was unlikely. The tornadoes were far more accurate than the old Soviet machinery. They were kitted out with direction-correcting equipment, satellite guidance systems, all kinds of cutting-edge technology, accurate to within a few metres of the target. He tried to console himself with the thought that the air raid shelter might have shielded some of the occupants from the impact, some, perhaps but not all. Many more would have been killed, vaporised in the blast, or crushed to death beneath the rubble. His fault. Blood on his hands. Four hundred lives. He replaced the receiver. Carter tried to put himself in Koltrov's boots. You're on the run. You've been exposed as a traitor. What's your next move? A plan began to take shape. He nodded at Popov and said, how far to the front line from here? Fifty kilometres or so. No more than that. Logan stared at him. You think that's where the general is going? Wouldn't you? I agree, Popov said. He's blown. Nowhere else for him to go. Even if that's the case, McVeigh said, we'd never catch up with a fucker in time. There might be a way, Popov said tentatively. Carter turned back to the Ukrainian captain. How? South of the Holovika plant, back roads uh, through the countryside, faster than the motorway, 
No army checkpoints. None that I know of, anyway, he added. You know the route? I have relatives in Herson. I have taken that route many times. Will the general know? Then back roads. Popov shook his head. He is a Kiev man, born and raised, an outsider. Only locals know the way. He won't be able to rely on GPS either, Webb pointed out. Systems are down. Carter grabbed his M4, clipped it to his weapon sling. He snatched up the burner, stuffed it into one of the pouches on the side of his webbing, and said, Come on, we're leaving. What do you want to do with this one? Webb asked, pointing with his eyes at Makarenko. Carter stepped towards the colonel, drew the M4 level with his head. No, Makarenko croaked. Yes. The colonel bared his blood-smeared teeth in a look of defiance. You're all dead. You're all going to... The rifle double barked. Two rounds erupted out of the M4, drilling a pair of holes in his forehead, painting the carpet with his brains. His mouth went slack. His eyes rolled back, like someone had disconnected him from the mains. What did he mean? Logan asked warily. Fuck knows, Carter said. Let's go. He sprinted outside. The clock ticking in his head told him that Kolchov had a four-minute head start on the team. He figured an hour's drive to the front line, but there would be delays, military checkpoints, shelled vehicles obstructing the roads. Carter felt certain that the general's progress wouldn't be smooth, not in the middle of a war zone. It's going to be fucking close. We'll have to floor it all the way, and hope the shortcuts aren't closed off. Carter jogged towards the nearest suburban. Take the other wagon, he ordered Webb and McVeigh. Steer right behind us. We'll lead the way. He stopped next to the driver's side door, glanced at Popov and Logan in turn. You two, ride with me. Webb and McVeigh dashed over to the second vehicle, while Carter tugged on the driver's side handle and deposited himself behind the wheel. Popov swung into the front passenger seat. Logan jumped into the back. Both men buckled up as Carter tapped the stop-start button and kick-started the Chevrolet's V8 engine. He pulled out of the forecourt, blatted west for a couple of hundred metres, then steered hard to the left. The Suburban shuddered as it skidded into the turn at speed. Carter's hands vice-clamped around the wheel as he fought to maintain control. The wagon made the turn, fishtailed for a fifty-metre stretch, before straightening out, and then Carter mashed the accelerator. Behind them, McVeigh and Webb took the same turn at speed, staying bumper close to their colleagues. You sure about this, Geordie? Logan asked as they roared south. Can't stay in this area. Compromised. Can't head to the RV. Not now. And we've got no way of alerting the ops desk. Russians have been flooding the area with ECM. Everything's fried. It's up to us. Logan said hesitantly. We'll be danger close to the enemy. I ain't getting myself killed because you've got a fucking death wish. Carter said. That bastard knows the name of every fifth columnist in the country. I'm not letting that int slip through our fingers. They drove on. Carter told them about the sham investigations into traitors in the government. Koltrov's ruthless elimination of anyone who suspected him or who might prove disloyal to the new regime. The ECM jammers, the tornado rocket launchers, the Kremlin's plan to lean on his popularity to turn Ukraine eastwards again. Fucking hell, Logan said. Bastards thought of everything, Popov said bitterly. Must have been planning this for many months. Wasted effort. The general's shafted now. His big secret is out. Best he can hope for is to live out his days in some dacha in Moscow. Not necessarily, Carter said. Logan frowned. What do you mean by that? The guy's got a talent for spin and bullshit. You've seen how people react when they see him. He's got millions of supporters in the army. He could denounce the allegations as lies, turn himself into a martyr, undermine the president. Assuming he is still alive, Popov reminded them. Yes, 
Carter said grimly. They raced on. Logan kept trying Luke's burner phone, without success. He guesstimated eighty or ninety seconds had passed, from the time he'd ended the call to his brother, to the rocket strikes. Enough time to exit the building? He didn't know. But as they raced south, he felt a compulsive desire for revenge flaring in his veins, burning like hot coals in his chest. Koltrov is going to suffer for this. I'm going to make sure of it. After a few kilometres, Popov suddenly leaned forward and pointed out a Ukrainian military camp situated at the side of the road, in a small clearing, shielded by a copse of pine trees. A loose throng of soldiers hung around a huddle of makeshift tents. A handful of guys poked at a smouldering log fire in a futile attempt to fend off the damp cold. Others puffed cigarettes or cleaned their weaponry. There was a stack of RPG-7 grenade launchers next to a dilapidated shack, Carter noticed, along with several canvas backpacks, each one containing three rockets. Close by, a pair of guys checked over a quadcopter drone with an optical camera attached to the airframe. At the sight of the approaching vehicles, two of the soldiers stepped into the road and started waving energetically, making the universal sign for them to stop. Carter pulled over and dropped out of the Suburban with Logan and Popov. McVeigh and Webb parked up behind them and joined their muckers, while the Ukrainian soldiers trudged over, boots squelching on the thickly muddied ground. The men were in a rag-order state, Carter noted. Their uniforms were torn and frayed. Their faces were caked in layers of dirt. One of the guys had a blood-stained field dressing swathed around his head. His mucker was six or seven inches taller, thin and gaunt-faced, with a thick moustache. Neither man looked like they'd had a wash or eaten a hot meal in months. Popov addressed the soldiers in his mother tongue. At some point, they must have realised that they were talking to a superior officer, and both men pulled themselves up straight and puffed out their chests. The moustached guy gave a long reply and thrust an arm towards the power station. As he spoke... A grim look crept across Popov's face. "'What did he say?' asked Carter, when the two men had finished talking. Popov licked his lips. He said falteringly, "'The Russian pig dogs have attacked the front line. Surprise offensive. Our forces have been forced to pull back from their positions.' "'Fuck,' McVeigh said. "'When?' Carter asked. "'Several hours ago. This morning.' Popov said. Explains them updates we got from the ops desk, Logan said. On the way down here. Carter nodded. Unconfirmed reports of gunfire and shelling, Hereford had warned them. Vicinity of Holovika nuclear power station. He said. How far are the Russians from here? Popov relayed the question to Moustache. Two kilometres, the captain said, translating the man's reply. This is the last friendly position before the front line. That is why these men have stopped us. They say it is too dangerous to proceed. As if to emphasize his point, Moustache traced a finger across his neck in a throat-slitting gesture. Two clicks, McVeigh frowned heavily. That means the Russians must be at the plant. Yes, Popov grimaced. His face went pale. They captured Holovika some hours ago. Heavy shelling. The defenders had orders to fall back to this post. Most escaped. A few of their brothers did not. The Russians hit them very hard, these men say. They even knocked out the power lines. There's no juice to the plant? Carter asked. Popov shook his head. There are backup diesel generators on the site. Should be capable of keeping the reactors running safely until a team can be sent out to restore the electricity. He added, by way of explanation, This is not the first time this has happened. We are familiar with such incidents. The Russians, they are animals. They don't give a shit. The moustached soldier spoke again. Popov questioned the man, then addressed his wounded colleague. Carter listened to their exchange with growing impatience. Every second they wasted at the camp gave Koltrov more time to pull clear of his pursuers. What? Carter demanded. What did he say? Popov translated. 
He says they saw another car coming this way a short time ago. Same model as this one, same color. Koltrov? Logan said, slapping a hand against his thigh. Has to be. Popov shifted warily. What is it? Carter asked. Captain? Popov looked him dead in the eye. They say he was driving towards Holovika. They're sure? Yes. They saw the car approaching and tried to warn the driver not to go any further, but he did not listen. Popov indicated a right turn, two hundred meters downwind of the camp. They headed that way, the man says. Where does that lead? It is the access road. It goes directly to the plant. Does it lead anywhere else? Anywhere at all? No, only the plant. They are certain of this. What's beyond it? Anything? Popov gave a quick shake of his head. Alavika is in the middle of nowhere. Around it only fields and the river. There is nowhere else to go from there. It is, um, what is the saying in your language? Dead end? Yes. Popov snapped his fingers. Dead end. The general is at Holovika. No doubt about it. What the fuck would he be doing there? Logan asked. Nearest safe location, maybe? Popov said. If he drives towards the front line, the Russians could mistake him for an enemy, kill him before he had a chance to identify himself. Carter said, Do we know how many Russians are at the plant? What hardware they've got? Ask them. Carter waited while the captain quizzed the soldiers. They think only a scratch force, Popov said. Enough to hold the plant until reinforcements arrive. Any other enemy assets in the area? Anti-aircraft defences? Tanks? No, they do not think so. All the Russian heavy firepower is needed elsewhere. If the place is so poorly defended, why haven't these lads retaken it? Logan wondered. They don't have the vehicles for an assault. They had to send their armoured carriers and tanks across to a village to the east. Their comrades are in danger of being encircled and need fire support. These men have been told to hold their position and watch the enemy until they have the capability to retake the plant. Carter looked at the soldiers, checking the drone. Looked back at Popov. He said, Get them to stick a drone over the plant. We need eyes on the Russian positions. If we're going in, we've got to know exactly what we're up against. Popov stared at him with bulging eyes. You want to push on? Are you crazy? We're no more than two clicks from the plant. We've got a responsibility to capture the general, if possible. He dead-eyed Popov. Give the fucking order, Captain. He addressed the soldiers. The guy with the field dressing gave a big thumbs up and grinned. Popov said, Okay, they will put the drone over. Tell them to hand over a few of their RPGs too, Carter said. Couple of them should do the trick. As many rockets as they can spare. Okay. The order was relayed to the soldiers. One of the guys on the drone team readied the craft for takeoff while his mucker operated a touchscreen tablet, working the control pads with his thumbs. The four propellers on the drone buzzed. The unit lifted into the sky, rising above the canopy of the pine trees. It hovered there for several seconds, buffeted by the slight wind, then pitched forward and glided smoothly in the direction of the plant, then disappeared from sight. While they waited for news from the drone, McVeigh and Webb hustled over to the stack of RPGs next to the shack and carted the two tube launchers and ammo backpacks over to the front vehicle. The Ukrainians seemed happy to hand over their spare equipment. Although they had orders not to abandon their post, they were clearly frustrated at having to pull back from the plant and the prospect of contributing to the deaths of Russian soldiers outweighed any discomfort about donating their weaponry to the SAS men. Carter noticed the guy with the moustache chatting away on his personal radio. He looked towards Popov and said, Have these lads got comms? The captain translated the question. Then he said, Yes, they say everything was down for a while. Signals returned a few minutes ago. Russians must have dropped the ECM systems once they loosed off them rockets, Logan speculated. Carter hastily fumbled for the pressel switch and tried raising his brother on the tactical radio. 
Still no response. Just a long stretch of dead air. He started to fear the worst. A shout went up from the drone team. Carter hurried over with Logan and Popov, and the three men crowded around the operator, staring at the high-res video feed on the tablet screen. There was no need for a translation this time. Carter instantly knew what he was looking at. An aerial shot of the nuclear power plant, a sprawling complex of cooling towers, electricity pylons, spent fuel dumps, substations and warehouses, bordered on the western side by a winding river and hemmed in behind a security fence topped with razor wire. Half a dozen reactor buildings dominated the center of the facility, each one housed inside a giant concrete can. A metal road ran in a straight line from east to west, leading to the front gate. There was a guardhouse to the side of the gate, manned by a pair of Russian soldiers. Carter noted a building site on the left side of the road, 600 meters due east of the gate, filled with heavy-duty machinery and mountains of gravel and sand. Beyond the gate, a large car park fronted a four-story office block, a distance of perhaps 500 meters from the gate to the entrance. A cluster of civilian motors were parked close to the building. Employees, Carter deduced, working to keep the plant running in the midst of a war. He spotted two armoured mobility vehicles to the south of the block. On the northern side stood a row of maintenance units and storage sheds. Three sangers, constructed from sandbags, had been positioned in a defensive line a hundred metres or so in front of the main building. A dozen Russian soldiers were milling about the area, warming their hands over the flames from an oil drum fire, smoking cigarettes, drinking brews, or staring at their phones. One look at them told Carter that these guys were poor quality, the dregs of the Russian military, a consequence of the crippling losses their commanders had suffered in the past few months. Now they were having to replenish their depleted units with raw recruits and prisoners. Any more enemy positions around the plant? he asked. Popov put the question to the drone operator. The soldier wiggled the joysticks, and the view on the tablet shifted as the quadcopter dipped forward and circled over the plant, like a plane in a holding pattern, waiting for permission to land. No, Popov said. There is no one else. Like I said, scratch force. Until the reinforcements rock up, Logan reminded him. Popov shrugged. This is true. Twelve enemies, thought Carter, plus the two soldiers at the guardhouse. Assume a few more inside the buildings, in the control room, and other critical infrastructure, guarding the employees. Four to six guys, perhaps. We might be looking at anything up to twenty defenders. Not the best odds in the world, but not the worst, either. Any sign of the general among those guards? Logan asked. Carter leaned in closer, squinting at the camera as the drone completed another low sweep of the facility. Negative. Popov said. He's not in sight. We don't have visual confirmation. Only soldiers in Russian uniform. No officers. So, where is he? Carter's eye was drawn to a one-story structure shaped like a shipping container, southeast of the office block. A car had parked up a couple of meters from the structure. A black SUV. The stolen Suburban. There, Carter said pointing it out to the others. That's your proof. The general is definitely there. Must be in that building, Logan observed. Door on the side appears open. He's inside. Why? What's in there? Fuck knows, Jordy. Your guess is as good as mine. At least we know he's there. That's something. Carter made a mental note of the enemy positions, the layout of the plant, protected areas, Blind spots? Obstructions? He looked at the gate, the car park, lines of sight, hastily sketching out a plan in his head. Not a sophisticated one. It wouldn't win any prizes for originality, but there wasn't time for anything elaborate. They needed to move in, fast, before the Russians could boost their defences. We're on the clock. He said to Popov, Tell your mates we're going in to take the plant right now. They need to get on their comms and alert any friendlies in the area. Let them know we're moving forward.
Keep that surveillance drone airborne, too. Watch out for any possible incoming Russian forces. Popov switched languages and outlined the plan to the soldiers. Then Carter briefed his team. This is what we're going to do, he told them. We'll approach the plant entrance in both wagons. Patrick, Billy, you'll stop on the access road here. He pointed to the building site downwind of the front gate. Start putting down rounds on the sentries with the sniper rifle, while we go forward and ram the front gate. You'll be 600 metres from the gate, so you're well out of range of the guards. Once we've broken through, we'll set up a firing position on the left side of the car park, using the wagon as cover. Should give us a direct line of sight to the enemy targets. Then you'll move forward to join us, while we hit the fuckers with RPGs and scatter them. Mop up any survivors. Logan said, Maybe it will be better if we call it in, Geordie. Wait until the Ukrainians are up to strength and ready to hit the plant. Carter shook his head. It'll take a while to run the request up the chain of command, by which time the Russians will have bolstered their defences and the general will be tucked up safely behind enemy lines. We've got to go in now. What about rules of engagement? We're not supposed to get involved. Fuck that, Carter snapped. We're too close now. We've still got a chance to nab the prick. He gave Logan a flinty look. The general's up to something shifty at that plant. He continued. I'm going to find out what. Unless you've got a better idea. Fuck it then, said Logan. Let's do this. Chapter 22 They piled back into the wagons, in the same order as before. Carter, Logan and Popov in the lead Suburban, McVeigh and Webb in the second vehicle. Webb had his sniper rifle assembled, loaded and ready to engage as soon as they neared the target. Then the two SUVs pulled away from the Ukrainian camp and bombed down the road, making the right turn the moustached guy had indicated. Following in Koltrov's footsteps as they raced towards the power station two kilometres away. While Popov and Logan checked their weapons, Carter jumped frequencies, tapped the pressel switch, and tested his brother's channel again. He waited and prayed. There was the world's longest pause. Then a hoarse voice in his ear said, Jimmy, you there? An indescribable wave of relief swept through Carter. The appalling tension he had been feeling in his muscles began to relax slightly. Luke! Thank Christ, are you okay? I, I'm fine, mate. The President? He's right here. Is he hurt? A few nicks and cuts, but otherwise he's unharmed. The other lads are here too, your guys and mine. Fucking close, but we made it out in the nick of time. Carter said. How? Tunnel, in the basement, leads to an admin block across the street. Luke broke off and coughed violently. Carter heard a faint chorus of distressed voices in the background. People were spluttering and screaming, calling out to one another. He heard something else, too. The shriek of ambulance sirens. Luke, the civilians in the basement, are they... He couldn't bring himself to finish the sentence. Don't, Jamie. Just leave it. Tell me. His brother sighed. There was no time. Luke's voice was choked with emotion. We had to get the principal to safety. Priority number one. You understand. We planned to go back and get the others out before the rockets hit, but then... I'm sorry, mate. Carter swallowed thickly. How bad is it? Emergency services are here, Luke said, sidestepping the question doing what they can. It wasn't your fault. Nobody's to blame. Luke, how fucking bad. There was a pause of numb silence. It doesn't look good. Building was flattened. Fires everywhere. Rubble. There was no time. Luke repeated, like a mantra. Something inside Carter cracked. The relief he'd felt instantly vanished, replaced by a sick feeling of guilt that lodged like a hard lump in the back of his throat. The grim thought played over and over in his head, like a track on loop. 
My fault. I'm culpable. People had died. Hundreds, maybe. He fought back against the voice, tried to counter it with cold logic. You had to make that call, he told himself. Had to warn your brother about the compromised location. Which was true, on one level. Protecting the life of Ukraine's leader outweighed every other consideration. An ugly truth, perhaps, but they were fighting an ugly war. Voloshin's loss would have been an incalculable blow to national morale. But the argument founded against the rocks of his overwhelming guilt. He had flagged the president's location to the Russians. Now hundreds of civilians were dead. Because of me. There was nothing in his mental locker to help him process what he had done. He felt consumed by a bottomless pit of guilt, one he knew even then he would never escape from, no matter how hard he fought. Life in the regiment prepared you for hardship and danger and the stress of combat and a million other things, but there was no selection course on how to deal with having innocent blood on your hands. You're responsible, the voice in his head said. You're responsible for the deaths of maybe hundreds of people. There's no coming back from that. Jamie? his brother asked. You there? Yes, Carter managed. His mouth was dry. I'm um, here. Where are you now? We're pursuing the general. He gave us the slip, but we've got a bead on his location. Heading there now. Are you close by? I could send some of the lads your way. Get them to RV with you en route. No time. Just focus on keeping the president safe. I'll let you know once we've apprehended the general. Roger that. Can you do something for me, Luke? Yes. Tell the families I'm sorry. Tell them... I hope they can forgive me. A long silence played out on the channel. For a moment... Carter wondered if the Russian ECMs were back and up and running again. Then his brother's voice sounded in his ear. Jamie, it wasn't your fault. You know that, right? I know. Carter paused. Watch yourself, Luke. Yeah, you too. Carter ended the chat and refocused on the road. They were closing in on the plant now, less than two kilometres to go. Popov stayed on the net, communicating with the Ukrainians back at the camp. The drone would stay airborne throughout the attack, watching for any reinforcements heading in their direction. No sign yet of any more targets, the captain reported. No further defensive positions around the complex. Let's hope it fucking stays that way, Logan said. They travelled on for half a click past the shattered remnants of a Ukrainian column caught up in the recent artillery bombardment around Holovika. Discarded army equipment, tourniquets and canteens, rucksacks and weaponry and helmets, spent rounds and the shattered remains of a pair of infantry mobility vehicles. In among them, the tangled corpses of four dead Ukrainian soldiers. Carter looked round, but there was no sign of any Russian forces lingering in the area. Directly ahead stood the nuclear power plant at Holovika. Carter slowed the wagon to sub-30 kilometres per hour, moving cautiously towards the target, eyes flicking left and right, alert to any potential threats that might be lurking in the vicinity. But the coast seemed clear. The nuclear plant itself was massive, bigger than it had appeared from the drone camera. A hundred hectares, perhaps the size of a large out-of-town shopping complex, bordered to the north and south by a patchwork of uncultivated fields. Potentially twenty defenders, Carter reminded himself. Poor odds on paper. But skill was a great force leveller. Against the SAS, a group of poorly trained recruits stood no chance. Once the round started flying, they would quickly turn and run for their lives. He hoped. One kilometre to the target now, Carter said over the comms to Webb and McVeigh. Making final approach to the target. Get ready to pull over on my signal. Ready when you are, McVeigh responded. Just say the fucking word. As they rolled down the road, Carter wondered again why the general had fled to Holovika. 
The guy could have easily continued south. The nearest Russian encampment couldn't be very far from here, fifteen or twenty kilometers at most. Instead, Kolchov had deliberately detoured to a poorly defended nuclear plant, surrounded by Ukrainian forces and guarded by a handful of crap quality Russians. But why? And what was Zinchenko doing in all of this? Had she been taken hostage, or was she conspiring with Koltrov? I don't know, Carter thought. But one thing's for sure, I'm going to get some fucking answers. 700 metres to the target. At the guardhouse, the two Russian soldiers spotted the Suburbans speeding down the access road and turned towards them. Two targets in sight at the front gate. Carter confirmed to McVeigh and Webb over the comms. Roger, McVeigh said. The guards were equipped with AK-74 assault rifles, standard-issue kit for Russian grunts, decent weapons, but useless at anything beyond 500 metres, whereas the L-115A4 carried by Webb could nail a target at more than twice that distance. Carter kept rolling forward, lining up the front bumper with the gate. Pulling over now, McVeigh said. Carter lifted his eyes to the rearview mirror. Behind them, the second wagon swerved off the road towards the construction site and skidded to a halt side-on to the road, next to a backhoe, the driver's side door facing the distant guardhouse. In the next moment, the side doors flipped open. McVeigh and Webb jumped down to the asphalt, the Brummy lugging the sniper rifle. Both men knelt down behind the front fender, putting the wheelbase between themselves and any stray incoming. Webb propped the rifle legs on top of the bonnet, head resting against the cheek guard. McVeigh had the spotter's roll, peering through the Trigicon scope mounted on his M4 and directing his colleague to targets. If Webb's initial shot missed, McVeigh would look for the fall of the bullet and instruct Webb to adjust his aim accordingly to compensate for the wind or other factors. Carter kept driving. 500 metres from the entrance now. The two Russians stepped forward from the gate. AK-74s raised at the vehicle, hurtling towards them. At 400 metres, flames spewed out of their muzzles. Get down! Carter shouted as he dropped his head. Logan and Popov both ducked down, assuming the brace position as a volley of bullets hailstoned against the bonnet. One round struck the windscreen and winged past Carter, several inches above his head. Another slapped into the headrest. Carter kept his head below the wheel, almost driving blind. He didn't hear the report of the suppressed L-115A4 as Webb cracked off his first shot at the Russians, but he saw the impact. 300 metres due west, the guard on the left tumbled away, dropping to the ground like a sack of hot bricks. His mate gave up spraying bullets and started running for cover inside the guardhouse. The right decision, but taken too late. He had made it halfway when Webb took his head clean off. Carter glimpsed the mist of blood spurting out of his head a moment before the Russian belly flopped to the ground. Two hundred metres from the gate now. Across the car park, the gunshots had alerted the Russians scattered around the Sangas. They were slow to react to the threat, retrieving helmets and weapons, running around like headless chickens. Slack soldiers, thrown into the fighting after a few weeks of basic training. They were about to pay for their lack of professionalism. Carter stamped hard on the accelerator. The wagon shot forward, speedometer clocking up towards 90 per. A hundred metres to go. Carter put the distance between the gate and the Sangas at 400 metres. The Sangas were 60 or 70 metres or so from the main admin block. The south side of the car park was empty. From that position, Carter and his muckers would have an unobstructed line of sight to all three Sangas, ranged across the front of the admin building. But which also meant they would be sitting ducks once they crashed through the gate. They would have to get themselves behind the wagon and let rip with their RPGs before the enemy could put the drop on them. His mind registered these details a second before the Suburban bounced and shuddered over the slotted Russians, then rammed into the gate. The front bumper struck the entrance. Sparks flew. 
The shriek of metal scraping against metal split the air. More rounds glanced off the Chevrolet, hammering off the grill and spider-webbing the windscreen, as a couple of the more organized Russian defenders started putting down rounds on the vehicle rushing towards them. Carter held on tightly to the wheel, and suddenly they were through the gate and bolting across the tarmac. He angled towards a point fifty meters southwest of the gate, then stomped the brakes, rested the wheel in the other direction, and skidded to a halt. Another bullet punched through the driver's side window, narrowly missing him before it embedded itself in the car roof. Out! he bellowed at the others. Move! Popov and Logan dived out of the back seat. Carter circled round to join them behind the SUV, staying in a low crouch, while another volley of 545 by 39 millimeter gunfire clanged against the opposite side of the SUV, piercing holes in the bonnet and bursting one of the tires. Logan handed him one of the RPGs and a backpack, took the other for himself, and scurried over to the rear wheelbase. Carter took up his position behind the bonnet, Popov to his right, the Ukrainian captain resting his weapon on the bonnet, ready to brass up any Russian targets once they popped into view. Their vantage point gave the three soldiers an unimpeded view of the Sangers. A high-explosive anti-tank grenade had been preloaded into the launcher. Carter set down the backpack, flipped up the iron sights on top of the barrel, removed the safety cap from the breech end of the steel tube, tore off the safety pin and the fuse cover, and took up a kneeling, firing stance. He rested the wooden section of the barrel on his shoulder, his left hand clasped around the shorter rear grip, his right wrapped around the pistol grip located further forward. Carter cocked the hammer on the side of the receiver, curled his index finger around the trigger, lined up the leftmost Sanger. Fired. The grenade hissed out of the launcher. Smoke swept over Carter, suffocating him. The acrid odour of gunpowder choked his throat. His eyes began to sting. 350 metres away, the Sanger disappeared behind a belching swirl of orange flame as the grenade found its target, shredding the sandbags. The explosion didn't wipe out the soldiers, but it had the intended effect. It got them moving. The four Russians broke to their right and sprinted towards the armoured vehicles to the south. They didn't get far. Popov had already zeroed in on the figures. He unleashed a couple of three-round bursts, killing one of them, while Carter chucked aside the spent RPG launcher and hefted up his front-slung M4 rifle, giving the other two Russians the good news with aimed shots. Popov plugged the last guy through the neck. He crumpled to a heap a few meters from his slotted mates, his left leg twitching erratically. Carter looked round as Logan fired a grenade at the rightmost Sanger and scored a direct hit. A cloud of smoke spewed upwards, flinging a ton of flaming material into the air. The smoke drifted skyward, the veil cleared, and Carter saw two of the Russians scrambling for cover behind the maintenance units, thirty metres to the north. A third man staggered senselessly away from the Sanger, his guts hanging out of his stomach. Carter put him out of his misery with a quick burst to the head, then shrank behind the Suburban as one of the Russians in the middle Sanger opened fire. Bullets scarred the ground to the left and right of the vehicle. Another flurry of rounds blew out one of the side windows, showering Carter in tiny shards of broken glass. As the firefight progressed, he kept a running tally of enemy kills in his head. Seven defenders had been dropped in the initial onslaught, which left six Russians to deal with four in the middle Sanger, two behind the maintenance sheds, plus any soldiers guarding the workforce inside the buildings. He glanced over his shoulder, looked beyond the gap where the front gate had been. Next to the building site, 700 metres away, Webb and McVeigh hurried into the suburban and pulled clear of the backhoe, remounting the access road as they raced to catch up with their mates. Logan eased out another heat grenade from the pouch, he inserted the booster end into the front end of the launcher tube, screwed it into place, shouldered the RPG, and centered the sights on the middle Sanger. Squeezed the trigger. Flames hissed out of the breech end of the RPG. The grenade whizzed across the car park. Exploded.
A ball of fiery smoke engulfed the Sangha. Men screamed and fled in every direction. A maimed Russian crawled away from the carnage, half his face hanging off. Carter plugged him in the head, turning his skull into red pulp. By now, Webb and McVeigh had pulled up next to the three attackers in the second suburban. They positioned themselves behind the engine block and started putting down rounds on the three fleeing Russians, picking them off as they ditched their weapons and bolted for safety, determination giving way to outright panic. One of them went down, nailed in the gut by a burst from McVeigh's rifle. A second Russian ran in the opposite direction from the firefight. Carter nailing the guy three times in the spinal region. The man fell forward as if he tripped and landed on his front. Carter emptied another two rounds at him for good measure. The third Russian threw himself behind one of the armoured vehicles, the ground sparking up behind him as Popov narrowly missed his target. A moment later, a pair of soldiers stormed out of the front of the building, spraying wild bursts at the Suburbans. Two men decked out in work